Audiobook title, Matt, 038, 000-91, by Matt Chu 07 Part 04. This work belongs to author, Matt Chu 07. Source, Wattpad.com. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 68 Slip Space Battle. Location captured Covenant Dropship, near Flagship Ascendant Justice, in Anomalous Slip Space Bubble. Date Time Record Anomaly Error. Date Unknown. Time Unknown. The faintly blue luminous walls of the Covenant Dropship pressed in, which made Matt feel slightly claustrophobic. It was ironic when he stopped to think about it because he was always inside his skin tight armor. His fellow Spartan sat in the bay beside him, motionless. John, Blue 2 for this mission, was Matt's second in command. He was a better leader than Matt ever would be. However, John had told him otherwise despite what had happened the previous times Matt had been in command. Fred, designated Blue 3 on this mission, was Matt's third in command. He had fought in more than 120 campaigns, was a great leader and a quick thinker. Sometimes he took the responsibility of his command too seriously, though, empathizing too deeply with any wounded member of his team. Lee, Blue 4, was the team's zero-g combat specialist. He had trained extensively with microgravity equipment and martial arts at the UNSC's Extreme Conditions facility on Chiron in orbit about Mars. He was as much at home in free fall as the rest of them were on solid land, and Matt was glad to have him on this mission. Anton, Blue 5, had Matt worried. He spent most of his life with his feet firmly planted on the ground. He'd cross-strained in tracking, camouflage, and stealth, and had been used almost exclusively on ground-based operations. More than once he had expressed discomfort in zero-g situations. Will, Blue 6, was quiet but had never failed to complete his mission. He wasn't always that way, though. When he was younger he was the one with the jokes and riddles that kept the team's spirits high. Something had hardened in him over the years, as it had in them all. But with Will, something special had been lost. Grace, Blue 7, had a knack for explosives. She could shape a charge to cut through a single steel bolt with only a whisper sound or rig a hundred thousand liters of kerosene to blow into a firestorm from hell. Ironically her temper was non-existent. Matt opened a comm channel. Give me a systems check, blue team. Six acknowledgement lights winked on. This reminds me of the underwater mission Chief Mendez sent us on at Emerald Cove, Fred whispered, when he sabotaged half our air tanks. And we ended up stealing his. And after, Anton said, laughing, we ditched him and camped on that island. It was a week with nothing to do but light bonfires, bake clams, and surf. M. Grace added, Calamari. Matt wondered if Emerald Cove even existed anymore. The UNSC had abandoned that colony a decade ago. The Covenant had most likely glassed that world. Blue Team. Pulaski's voice broke over the calm. Local conditions are as calm as they're going to get. Exiting in 3, 2, 1. Matt felt the acceleration in the pit of his stomach. He rose, moved to the hatch, and popped it open. Outside, Ascendant Justice's hull moved past them. Almost every square centimeter of the flagship's polished alloy skin had been scarred by heat and micrometers. Tendrils of metal vapor snaked and shimmered in the vacuum. On Ascendant Justice's upper deck he saw the looming shadow of the inverted UNSC frigate Gettysburg still miraculously attached. It was on fire, pockmarked with craters, and venting atmosphere, but it was remarkably intact. If not for the thousands of dead naval personnel undoubtedly on board, he might have christened the ship Lucky. The dropship slowed and Pulaski drifted, turned, and descended onto the surface of the ship. Latch engaged, she said over the comm. All yours, Commander. Fred, Grace, and I will reconnoiter, he told Blue Team. John, Anton, Will, and Lee, get ready to move the arc welder and hull plates we scavenged from the Gettysburg when we give the all-clear signal. John eased his boots onto the hull. Their magnetic saws clamped onto the metal with a satisfying click. Pulaski had landed the Covenant dropship so that its mandibles cradled the hole and gave them some shelter. Overhead, slip space was on fire. It looked as if someone had doused the night with jet fuel and ignited it. Bloody, boiling streaks of flame tore across a midnight blue sky. Meteors flashed past and sprayed molten metal in trails of glittering stardust. A fist-sized projectile blurred past Matt and rammed into the ship's starboard side. Sparks and liquefied alloy spattered into space. His shields flickered as debris ricocheted from the armor's protective field. They had to move fast. The admiral was right this was a shooting gallery. The quicker they sealed that hole and got out of here, the better. 
Matt turned and swept his rifle over the terrain. There were bumpy sensor nodes, kilometers of conduits, and a dozen gaping canyons in the hull. A legion of Covenant warriors could hide in this mess. No enemy contact. Nothing on his motion sensors, either. He stepped close to the main drive conduit and examined the hole. The pipe was five meters across and still red hot, even though Cortana had shut it down three minutes ago. The hole was round, a three-meter wide gap, with ragged edges that all pointed inward. If that was from a plasma strike, Grace said, the metal would have been boiled away. If it was from an impact, the edges would be scraped on one side, compacted on the other. This hole was deliberately made. Eyes sharp, John said. We have company. My guess is camouflaged elites. Maybe some of the original crew still alive. Blue 2, 4, 5, and 6, move out. Roger, John replied. Roger that, Wool said. Affirmative, Lee and Anton said. Anton emerged from the dropship hefting an arc welder, while John, Will, and Lee maneuvered the 3 by 3 meter hull plates. Fred and Grace, you're on the welders, Matt ordered. Anton, post on top of the dropship. John, cover Fred and Grace. Lee, you're at 3 o'clock. Will at 9. I'll take the 6. Blue acknowledgement lights winked on. John helped Fred and Grace set the plates in position. Grace and Fred fired up the arc welder and pinpoints of metal liquefied beneath their tips. A shower of sparks swirled around them in the evacuated environment like a swarm of fireflies. We're in position, Admiral, Matt reported. ETA for repairs is two minutes. Roger, Commander Admiral Whitcomb replied. Ionization made the channel flood with static. When you're done, give the word and get secure, we'll be accelerating immediately. Yes, sir. So far, so good, Matt thought. Just another minute or two. A streamer of plasma appeared from nowhere. The tangled, crisscrossed slip space around them dropped the bolt of boiling fire 50 meters overhead, it moved port to starboard, and vanished back into the void. The comm shattered into white noise, and the motion sensors blurred, as did the active camouflage shielding of the six elites who had been slowly, and until a moment ago imperceptibly, crawling toward their position. Enemy contacts Matt shouted. He crouched behind the dome of a sensor node and opened fire. A hail of bullets caught the closest elite dead center in its chest. The gunfire punched through its shielding and then tore into its armor. It tumbled backward and spun off the hull. In his peripheral vision, Matt saw the silent muzzle flashes from his team. He glanced back. Fred and Grace hadn't moved. They stared at the beads of molten alloy under their arc welder's tip. As if Fred could read his mind, he said, I need another 20 seconds, Commander. A volley of crystalline needles fired from one of the elites peppered the sensor node. Matt returned fire, but the elite's camouflage kicked in and it faded from view. Another plasma bolt sizzled close to the hull, this one 30 meters to port. It was a river of fire that lit the surface of Ascendant Justice like a dozen suns. Matt's shields drained to a quarter. Okay, Commander Fred told him, I'm. Incoming Pulaski cried over the comm. Matt turned to the dropship and saw a third plasma projectile materialize from the folds of tangled slip space. This one skimmed a mere three meters over the hull, straight toward them. Will dived into the crux where the dropship met the hull. John, Fred, and Grace hit the deck. Lee stood his ground and fired at the elites, muzzle flash reflected in his helmet's faceplate. Anton rose from his limited cover on top of the dropship but instinctively ducked again as an elite took a shot at him. Matt crouched, jumped, and propelled himself into the sheltered area between the dropship's mandibles. The plasma blasted over the dropship like a tidal wave of fire. Pulaski screamed, and her channel went silent. Blue-white light filled Matt's vision, and electrical discharges jolted his flesh and buzzed through his muscles and ligaments. Temperature warnings blared. Boiling hydrostatic gel vented through his Mjolnir armor's emergency ducts. Through blurry eyes, John saw the Covenant Elite's flash vaporize. Downship, Ascendant Justice's hull heated to a glowing yellow and softened. Then the light and heat vanished, and the torrent of fire trailed aft like the tail of a comet. Matt craned his neck up, every muscle in his body screaming in pain. There was no trace of Lee or Anton. The dropship's hull was melted and distorted like a wax candle caught in a blowtorch's blast. The cockpit and Pulaski were gone. His biosign warning blared. John, Will, Grace, and Fred lay next to him. Dead or unconscious, he couldn't tell. He quickly attached their tethers to the deck, then clipped his own in place. Matt keyed the comm. Admiral, conduit breach is sealed, sir. Hang on, son, Admiral Whitcomb replied. 
This might be a rough ride. Matt slumped to the deck unconscious. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 69 Awake and Alive. Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 69 Awake and Alive. Location captured Covenant Flagship Ascendant Justice in Anomalous Slip Space Bubble. Date Time Record Anomaly Error. Date Unknown. Time Unknown. Matt Woke. Consciousness, however, was a slight overestimation of his condition. His blurry vision came into focus slowly, but there was nothing to see except the interior of his visor. Amber status lights winked on. Pain washed over his feet, his right thigh, and his hand. Good. He was alive. He knew from previous experience that this was the tail end of shock, and the stunning, numbing effects of that state were wearing off. He felt the familiar weight and reactive circuits of his Mjolnir armor surrounding him. The coppery-tinged flavor of biofoam coated his mouth, so he also surmised that his injuries had been recently treated. And there was gravity. The press against his back was a great comfort to Matt. The next time someone wanted him to go on a zero-g op, he'd welcome back, Crystal said, interrupting his thoughts. A faint light flickered onto his left. He turned onto his side. The burns on his extremities protested and shot lances of pain up his hand and feet. He was in a med bay. The lights were turned down low, and he saw that he was the only person occupying a recovery bed. Biomonitors pulsed along one wall, displaying his vital signs and MRI snapshots. A holographic projection pad stood next to his bed. Crystal's tiny figure, strobing with symbolic logic code, waved to him, and when he didn't immediately respond she crossed her arms impatiently. MRIs show no concussion, no subdural or epidural hematomas. You must have a thicker skull than I thought. Where am I? Deck 32 on the UNSC frigate Gettysburg, Crystal told him. Or what's left of it, anyway. What happened? Crystal sighed. Are you referring to what happened since I left you on reach? Or the outcome of the slip space battle? Or do you mean what happened since the battle? The battle, first, he said and struggled to get up. I presume we won. Standing was too painful, though, and the strength seemed to have been drained from his muscles. He eased himself back to his original horizontal position. Crystal's pale blue light dimmed and her gaze dropped to the deck. Blue team successfully repaired the main engine conduit. I remember, Matt murmured. The repair part of it, at least. There was an explosion. A plasma bolt, Cortana corrected. She sighed. I'm sorry, Commander, but only you and Spartans 117, 093, 043, and 104 survived that blast. John. Grace, Will, and Fred were alive, but Lee, Anton, and Warrant Officer Pulaski had been killed in action. Matt remembered Pulaski's scream, then Anton's outline as the flash of white-hot fire swept over the hull. Acknowledged, he said as graciously as he could muster, but he heard bitterness give an edge to his voice. It struck him as odd that Pulaski's death affected him as well. He'd seen thousands of UNSC soldiers die. She hadn't hesitated to transport Blue Team on a mission that was insanely dangerous. She had survived the Battle of Reach, the crash landing on Halo, the Flood, and everything else, then she had bravely volunteered for this mission, too, and perhaps saved all their lives. She might have made a good Spartan. There were worse eulogies. Matt sighed, called up his team roster on his heads-up display, and marked Anton and Leah's missing in action. He paused to view all the others on that list, one of best friends, Sam, was there, and he hadn't even realized a dozen more had been listed as MIA. He saved the changes to the roster and closed the file. What about Kelly and Linda? He asked Crystal. Crystal looked up and flipped the hair from her luminous eyes. She paced a small circle on the holographic pad and then said, Spartan 087, Kelly, is recovering from second-degree burns on 7 tightwo percent of her body. Dr. Halsey has accelerated tissue regrowth with dermocortic steroids. She should be fully healed in a matter of days, although her mobility will be severely hampered until then. And Linda. Accessing status. Cortana paused for a full second. Dr. Halsey has Spartan 058 currently in medical facility Alpha, three decks above us. She still has her in a cryogenic state and is presently performing exploratory surgery. She has given Cortana and me several orders to prepare the flash clone banks for replacement organs pending transplant. So she's alive. 
Matt asked. Technically, Cortana replied, no. For a moment there was a look of genuine concern on her face, but it quickly vanished. The doctor and Admiral Whitcomb have debated the risk of attempting to revive Spartan 058 before we reach a major medical facility. Dr. Halsey, I'm sure, will brief you when she has all the facts, Commander. Matt frowned at this lack of detail. He made a mental note to ask Dr. Halsey about Linda later. All other hands on board are accounted for, Matt asked. Yes, Commander. They are all engaged in repairs to the conjoined ships. We took tremendous damage in the expanded slip space from plasma bombardments and mass impacts. Both ships' superstructures, however, remain intact. The Gettysburg's reactor is online and operating at 67% capacity. Ascendant Justice's reactor is offline undergoing repairs. Five of our seven plasma turrets require refit. And worst, Ascendant Justice's engines are crippled. We have less than 3% operational thrust. Can the ship still jump to slip space? Are we stranded out here? A jump is possible according to Cortana, Crystal said. She shook her head the way an older sister might when her baby brother asked a naive question. It wouldn't do us any good, though. The alien artifact in Dr. Halsey's possession emits high levels of radiation in slip space. This unknown radiation even penetrates your suit's shields. I estimate lethal exposure in just under seven tightwo hours. Also, that radiation would serve as a beacon for any Covenant ships prowling slip space, searching for us. So we're stuck between systems. Negative, Crystal replied, and her voice took on a new chill. Admiral Whitcomb is quite adamant that we risk another slip space transition, regardless of the cost in human life. Otherwise, it would be weeks before we would be able to contact UNSC High Command. HICOM. Two facts suddenly clicked into place the Admiral's need to contact the rest of the Admiralty no matter the price, and Dr. Halsey's attempts to revive Linda. What's compelling the Admiral's tactics, Crystal? Crystal's holographic outline softened. I told you this before, Commander, but apparently it did not stick in your semiconscious state. She then came into sharp focus and crossed her arms over her chest. The Covenant have discovered the location of Earth. Matt stood, suddenly wide awake and alert. He set aside his pain and fatigue. Explain, he demanded. Crystal outlined her and Cortana's discovery of the encoded subchannel within normal Covenant communique. She explained how the Covenant's military orders were disseminated with startling efficiently, and she then showed him symbols that represented the coordinates for Seoul and Earth. He stood mute and listened. The UNSC had worked so hard, for so long, to preserve this secret. It was only a matter of time. He had always known that the Covenant had to find Earth sooner or later. He had, however... Always thought it would be later, but not now. Matt stared at the tiny triangles, squares, dots, and bars that made up the spatial coordinates. We've seen these before, on Côte d'Azur. Yes. And according to Dr. Halsey, her team on Reach found similar markings in the underground vaults. What's the connection? Unknown. Matt put these facts aside for the moment, the greater meaning of the symbols and translation he'd leave up to Crystal, Cortana, and O&I. The only insight that mattered to him was that the Covenant were going to attack Earth. Was there a timetable or any other data encoded on the subchannel? He asked. Affirmative. There's a coordinated series of orders to Covenant warships scattered across the galaxy to rendezvous with a mobile commandant control base they call the Unyielding Hierophant. When they have sufficient force, they will collectively make the jump to Earth. Matt moved toward the medical bay's doors. They automatically parted. Where is Admiral Whitcomb? The Admiral is currently on the bridge, Crystal replied, but Dr. Halsey gave me and Cortana strict orders that you are not to. I don't take orders from civilians, he snapped. Not even her. Matt passed out of the medical bay and marched down the corridor. You know, Crystal said, her voice now coming from his helmet speaker, your attitude has degraded since we started this mission, even before the battle for reach. Noted, he replied. The dim white light flooding the Gettysburg's passages was a welcome change from the blue illumination the Covenant used on their ships. Matt was glad to have his feet once more firmly planted on the raw steel decks of a human vessel, even if the walls of this passage were soot-stained. He entered the command elevator and punched the button for the bridge. The gentle acceleration made new pain flare along his arms, and ligaments popped in his chest, but he gritted his teeth and banished the pain from his awareness. When the doors parted, Matt paused taking in the sad state of the Gettysburg's bridge. The front viewports had been blown out and recently replaced with welded plates of hull armor. A trio of monitors had been hastily bolted in place over them. 
Crystallized freeze-edried blood covered the navigation and ops consoles. Only three control stations were lit engineering, computer status, and Mac ops. But most disconcerting was that only Admiral Whitcomb and Lieutenant Haberson were present on a bridge that usually needed a staff of 30 officers. The room was as still and empty as a tomb. Commander, Admiral Whitcomb said, slightly surprised. Sir. He stood at attention and snapped off a crisp salute. Permission to enter the bridge. Granted. Son, the Admiral said. What's your status, Commander? Haverson asked. Dr. Halsey told us it would be days before you recovered. I'm 100%, sir, he said. As if she had heard this statement, Dr. Halsey opened a comm channel, and a tiny video feed popped onto his heads-up display. Her glasses reflected ambient orange light from wherever she was, and he could not see her eyes. Matt, I need to speak with you. I'm with Admiral Whitcomb and Lieutenant Haverson, ma'am. When I'm done I can speak with you. She was silent a moment, then said, very well. The calm winked off. Matt felt a pang of regret for being so terse with her. Get over here, son, the admiral said. He returned his attention to the clear plastic wall dotted with stars and the diamond symbols that represented UNSC military outposts in this region of space. We're in something of a tough spot. He marched to the admiral and Haverson and studied the chart with them. Crystals briefed me, sir. The Covenant know Earth's location and are on the move, most likely preparing a massive attack. That's the gist of it, I'm afraid, Haverson said, and Matt noticed deep circles of fatigue ringing the younger man's eyes. To complicate matters, we can barely navigate. We've been working around the clock to restore our ships, but we'd need an engineering crew of a hundred and a space dock to get these wrecks into fighting shape. Admiral Whitcomb frowned at the lieutenant's star assessment and added, Another trick is that the crystal we picked up on reach emits radiation in slip space. Enough to kill everyone after only a few more hours of exposure. The admiral paused for a second then continued. But we're hanging on to the alien device. It changes the properties of slip space, as you already saw, but with one more twist. In the few minutes we were in that tangled version of slip space, we traveled here. He drew a tiny circle on the map, centered on their position, which under normal circumstances should have taken us days. We attempted to briefly jump again, Haverson added, but nothing extraordinary occurred. This unusually long jump may have been caused by the energy added to slip space by our battle with the Covenant. In any case, Admiral Whitcomb said, if we learn what makes this crystal tick, it'd give us a hell of an edge on the Covenant. I see, sir. Matt scrutinized their location, not quite the definition of the middle of nowhere, but close. He noted that there were three star systems within the circle. Haverson also peered at the chart. He touched one of the star symbols within their range, and statistics scrolled alongside the object. He sighed. This system was glassed in 2530, so there's no chance there would be anyone to help us there. And the other two systems. He shook his head. Uninhabited. Hell, Admiral Whitcomb said and tugged on his mustache, we pulled out of this region of space almost as soon as the war started. The Covenant came in, burned Eridanus and the other outer colonies, and then moved on without batting an eye. Eridanus. Matt stepped closer and touched the data scrolling next to the tiny star. I know this place. He turned to the Admiral. And there is a human colony there, sir, just not one that the UNSC cares about anymore. If I had to guess, I'd bet that the Covenant never found it, either. We might be able to expedite repairs there. The Admiral stared thoughtfully at him. You sure? Sure enough to bet our lives and Earth on that hunch, Commander. Matt looked again at the tiny dot on the map. It wasn't Eridanus he was thinking of. It was the surrounding asteroid belt, and a mission he and his team had executed 20 years ago. Yes, sir. I'm sure. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 70 Difficult Decision Authors note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 70 Difficult Decision Location Captured Covenant Flagship Ascendant Justice, in Slip Space, en route to Eridanus System. Revised Date Time Stamp Anomaly Error. Estimated Date September 12, 2552. Estimated Time 0450 Hours. Dr. Halsey buzzed the door open, and Matt entered the clean room. You wanted to see me, doctor. He quickly looked the room over, taking in the adjoining surgical suites, 
and the strange orange sterile field lamp set every meter into reflective recessions in the tiled walls. Dr. Halsey had clamped five displays onto the arm of one of the contoured examination chairs in this room. She sat cross-legged in the chair and balanced a large alphanumeric symbolic keyboard on her lap. Perched precariously on the side tray were styrofoam cups of half-drunk coffee. She waved Matt forward. I see you are ignoring sound medical advice by moving before you have fully healed. I'm fine, ma'am, he replied. She snorted in disbelief. Matt, I've never known you to tell an outright lie. I'm picking up telemetry from your armor, right now. She swiveled one of the monitors on her chair so he could see erratic biosigns pulsing on the screen. What with the burns, contusions, fractures, and internal bleeding, you should be in shock. The only sleep you've gotten in a week was unconsciousness brought on by your wounds. And you say you're fine. He stood and said nothing. Very well. I suppose you know your limitations better than anyone else. She turned the display back around. I wanted to speak about yours and John's report on the alien construct, Halo. I've pieced together a bit of the story based on Admiral Whitcomb's recounting of your adventures, Cortana and Crystal's debriefing, and the mission logs of Locklear, Johnson, and the curious partial mission log of 1PFC Wallace Jenkins. Matt shifted uneasily. There are inconsistencies that I must resolve before we get back to Earth. She pushed her glasses higher onto the bridge of her nose. One of them is Sergeant Johnson. She tapped in commands on her keyboard. Please step closer, Matt. I want you to see this with me. Matt moved alongside her chair. His massive weight thudded through the thick deck plating. Two meters tall and half a ton of metal and somehow Dr. Halsey couldn't help thinking of him occasionally as the same little boy who had lost his parents at such a young age and stolen him from that hospital bed on earth. No. Matt had changed. She hadn't. She was the one who still carried the three decade old festering guilt. She took a deep breath and refocused her attention on the video records before her. On screen played mission logs that showed Covenant and Marines in firefights, the odd forerunner architecture in the interior of the Halo construct, and the terrifying omniparasitic life form known as the Flood. She replayed the mission record of Private Jenkins and the first Flood attack. Matt stiffened as Captain Keys appeared on screen and as the Flood consumed the captain and his squad. Sergeant Johnson was there, too, fighting and cursing, until the hordes of tiny, pod-like infection forms swarmed over him. The sergeant survived, she said, the only human to have direct exposure to the flood metaorganism and walk away. I know, Matt whispered. I'm not sure how he survived. How could anyone live through that? That's the simple part, Dr. Halsey told him without looking up from her displays. She tapped a key, and the sergeant's medical records flashed on screen. See. Here, she touched a file dated three years before. He was diagnosed with Boren syndrome. I haven't heard of it, Matt said. I'm not surprised. It's caused by exposure to high-yield plasma. Like the burst released by a Covenant plasma grenade. We don't see many cases. People usually die from the direct effects of those weapons long before these secondary symptoms manifest. Dr. Halsey paused for a second and continued. Apparently, the sergeant captured a crate of plasma grenades from the Covenant during the Siege of Paris for he used them all, received a commendation for bravery, and a 1200-rad cumulative dose of radiation as an unanticipated bonus. Matt was silent for several minutes. Dr. Halsey wasn't sure if he was reading the computer files, contemplating her words, or trying to confirm all this on a private comm channel with Crystal. His impenetrable armor made discussions with normal social conventions nearly impossible. It irritated her, yet without that armor with its constant hydrostatic pressure and automated biofoam injectors, Matt would have literally fallen apart by now. For a fleeting moment she remembered when she had first read Alexander Dumas's Men in the Iron Mask. She had felt terror when the noble prisoner had been encased within that metal shell. How did Matt cope with the constant suffocating enclosure? Matt finally said, I don't see the connection between the sergeant's sickness and his surviving the flood. Boren's syndrome, Dr. Halsey explained is characterized by migraines, amnesia, and brain tumors, and without the proper treatment, death. It disrupts the electrical signals in a person's nervous system. Is it treatable? Yes, but it requires 30 weeks of intensive chemotherapy. Which brings me to this. She hit the next page key and an official refusal of treatment document appeared on screen. The sergeant did not wait 30 weeks to get back and fight. Matt nodded, understanding the heroic, futile gesture. How did this disruption of his nervous system save him? I've deconvolute the biosigns of the soldiers overtaken by the flood. 
The parasite interfaces with a host by forcing a resonant frequency match to each host's neural system. And the sergeant's nervous system is so jumbled that the flood couldn't force a match. Correct, she said. Further blood tests show his system bearing traces of flood DNA, very much dead and non-infectious, but some gene fragments are intact. I believe this is proof of a failed attempt to possess him. It also appears to have imparted him with some curious regenerative abilities, although I cannot yet fully confirm this side effect. Matt seemed to relax a notch from his usual ramrod stiff at attention stature. This new information seemed to put him at ease. I think I see. No, Dr. Halsey told him, and she removed her glasses. You don't, doctor. Matt questioned. Discovering how he survived is not what I wanted to discuss. It's what happens next to Sergeant Avery Johnson. She shut off her monitors and eased back into the chair. I've prepared two separate reports on this for ONI Section 3. The first has all relevant data on my analysis and the possible technology to counter an initial flood infestation. The second includes the source material Private Jenkins's and Sergeant Johnson's mission logs and the sergeant's medical files. She downloaded the reports onto two data crystals and ejected them from the port on the chair's arm. She set the clear cubes on the tray and gestured for Matt to take them. I leave it up to you which to deliver to Lieutenant Haberson. Why would I withhold any data, doctor? Matt asked and glanced at the crystals. Her eyes focused past him as she struggled to find the words to match her conflicting emotions. For a long time I had thought that we had to sacrifice a few for the good of the entire human race. She took a deep breath and let it go with a heavy sigh. I have killed and maimed and caused a great deal of suffering to many people, all in the name of self-preservation. Her steely blue gaze found him. But now I'm not sure that philosophy has worked out too well. I should have been trying to save every single human life, no matter what it cost. Dr. Halsey pushed the tray bearing the data crystals toward Matt. If you give ONI the first report, they may be able to find a countermeasure for the flood. Maybe. They would have a slightly better chance, however, if you give them the second report. Then I'll give them the second report. He picked up the crystal. Which will murder Sergeant Johnson, she said with a chill in her voice. ONI will not be satisfied to take a sample of blood. They will dissect him to find out how he resisted the flood. It will be a billion tune shot that they'll ever replicate his unique medical conditions, but they'll do it anyway. They will kill him because the trade-off is worth it to them. Matt picked up the other crystal and then stared at them both lying in his gauntlet hand. Is it worth it to you, Matt? She asked. He curled his hand in a fist and held it close to his chest. Why do you want me to make this choice? Why not have John make this decision? Dr. Halsey took a deep breath. I would have chosen him to make this decision, but he's still unconscious. You were my second choice. I don't think I understand, Matt said. One last lesson. I'm trying to teach you something it's taken me all my life to realize. She cleared her throat of the lump thickening there. I'm giving you the chance to make the decision that I thought I couldn't make. She glanced at the clock on her display. I'm sorry. Linda is almost prepped for surgery, and I have several things I must accomplish before then. You should go. Matt obediently turned and strode toward the exit, but halted in the doorway. Doctor, please don't let her die again. He then left the room. Dr. Halsey watched until he rounded the corridor and was gone. She detected something in Matt's voice that told her that he more than just wanted Linda to be revived. She made a mental note to look at Matt's file to see if anything had changed in relation to his hormone levels. She hoped she saw Matt again before she did what she had to do, but she might not. Would the thought she had planted within him take hold? The gesture might be the only thing she could do to atone for what she'd done to him and the other Spartans. Such thoughts were luxuries when there were only three hours before Ascendant Justice exited slip space. There was too much to do before then. She turned all the monitors to face her and typed in the command to unsquelch Cortana. Lock the door, Dr. Halsey ordered Cortana. Boost counterintrusion measures to level 7. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 71 Eridanus. Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 71 Eridanus. Location captured Covenant Flagship Ascendant Justice, in slip space, en route to Eridanus system. September 12, 2552, 1930 hours. Black space churned with pinpricks of light, it split, and the Gettysburg Ascendant Justice appeared in the Eridanus system. 
Matt stood on the Gettysburg's bridge. He'd wanted to be on the medical deck when Dr. Halsey had finished with Linda, be there when she woke up, or be there in case she never woke up. But he had to be here, this was his idea, and he was the closest thing they had to an expert on this place. Systems check, Admiral Whitcomb ordered. Lieutenant Haverson leaned over the ops console and flicked through several screens. Residual radiation fading, he said. Navigation systems and scanners coming back online. Fred stood at the engineering station and reported, reactors at 60%. Slight hysteresis leak in coil 10. Compensating. Plasma. The admiral asked as he settled into the captain's chair. Cortana's ghostly image flickered onto the holographic pad next to the star chart. We can fire only one turret, she replied, and a wash of red flashed across her image then cooled to its normal deep blue. The other two functional turrets are offline, their magnetic coils refuse to align. It might be a side effect of the artifact's radiation. One shot, the admiral muttered. He tugged on the end of his mustache and sighed. Then we'll just have to make it count. He turned to Matt. Lead the way, son. Matt stared at the three large monitors that had replaced the bridge's observation windows. Iridinus blazed in the center of one display, stars shone with a steady brilliance. Move us 1.5 astronomical units relative to the sun, he said. Heading Zirinanezero by 045. Destination 1.5 AU, Haverson said. Heading confirmed. Coming about. Plot an elliptical course parallel to the plane of the asteroid belt, Matt added. Cortana, scan for asteroids approximately 2 kilometers in diameter. Scanning, she said. This might take some time. There are more than a billion moving objects, some of them in deep shadow. Tell me again about your old mission, Admiral Whitcomb said. You and the other Spartans were here before. Yes, sir, Matt replied. Myself, John, Fred, Linda, Kelly, and Sam. It was the Spartans' first real mission and infiltration into a rebel base. We captured their leader and got him to ONI for debriefing. I didn't even know the Spartans were around in 2525, Lieutenant Haverson said. Yes, sir, Fred answered. We just didn't have Mjolnir armor or the advanced weaponry we have today. We looked like any other NAVSPEC war team. I very much doubt that, Haverson said under his breath. The Admiral raised one bushy eyebrow. You mean six people made a zero-g vacuum infiltration into this space station, and then exfiltrated with a prisoner who happened to be the guy in charge of the place? Yes, sir. That was the basic plan. I suppose it went off without a hitch. Matt was silent for a moment as he remembered the dozens of dead people they had left behind on that base, and he felt a pang of regret. At the time he hadn't thought twice about removing any obstacle that would have compromised his mission, human or otherwise. Now, after fighting for humanity for two decades, he wondered if he could shoot another human without a good reason. No, sir, Matt finally replied. There were enemy casualties, and we had to blow their cargo bay to escape. So, the admiral said, tapping his fingers on the arm of the captain's chair, they're not going to be happy to see a UNSC ship knocking on their front door. I wouldn't expect so, sir. Faint emissions on the band detected, Cortana said. Come about to new heading 330. Aye, Haverson said. 330. It's gone, now, she said, but I definitely heard something. Keep on this course, Admiral Whitcomb ordered. We'll run it down. There's one thing I don't understand, Haverson said as he squinted at the forward displays. Why are these people even here? Pirates and insurgents, the Admiral answered. They hijack UNSC ships, sell arms, and trade black market commodities. You're probably too young to remember, Lieutenant, but before the Covenant War not everyone wanted to be part of an Earth-ruled government. Rebels, Haverson said. I've read about them. But why continue to stay separated from UNSC forces when the Covenant War started? Surely their chances of survival would be better with us. The Admiral snorted a derisive laugh. Some people didn't want to fight, son. Some just wanted to hide, in this case, literally under a rock. Maybe they think the Covenant won't bother with them. A smile flickered across his face. Well, we're about to change all that for them. The elevator doors parted, and Dr. Halsey stepped onto the bridge. She removed her glasses and rubbed her eyes. She looked to Matt as if she had just retired from an intense fight, fatigued and shocked. He noticed a single drop of blood on the lapel of her wrinkled white lab coat. She's fine, Dr. Halsey whispered. Linda will make it. The flash cloned organs took. Also, I wanted to inform you that John is still unconscious, but he'll make a full recovery. 
Matt exhaled the breath he had been unconsciously holding and calmed his racing heart. He glanced over to Fred, who nodded to him. Matt nodded back. There were no words to express how he felt. One of his closest teammates, his friend. No, not a friend, the woman he loved. Someone he had thought dead, was alive again. Thank you, Dr. Halsey, he said. She waved her hand dismissively, and there was a strange look in her eyes, almost as if she had regretted the success of her operation. Damn good news, Admiral Whitcomb said. We could use another hand on deck. Hardly, Dr. Halsey replied, suddenly looking much more alert. She'll need at least a week to recover, even with the biofoam and steroid accelerants, I have her on. Then she'll barely be able to get on her feet. She won't be combat ready. Hopefully, the chief will wake up soon to help out. I gave him some meds to help speed up his recovery. Gettysburg Ascendant Justice moved into the plane of the asteroid belt, and three rocks appeared on the screens. This region is the source of the band signal, Cortana told them. There are three possible candidates based on the size parameters you gave me, Commander. Which one is it? The Admiral asked. Only one is rotating fast enough to generate a three-quarter gravity internal environment, Cortana replied. That's it, Matt replied and nodded toward the central display. The rock hadn't changed much in the last 20 years. Was it possible the place had been abandoned? The band transmission that Cortana detected could have been an automated signal, weak from years of drain on a single battery, or the lure for a trap. Admiral, I know, Commander, he said. They've baited the hook and we're taking it, at least that's what it's supposed to look like. He chuckled. Cortana, power up every turret on our Covenant flagship. Her holographic body flushed blue-green and she crossed her arms. Let me remind you, sir, that of the three working turrets, two are offline. I have no way to aim the plasma. The magnetic, I know, Cortana. But they, the admiral stabbed a finger at the displays, don't know that. Yes, sir, she said, heating them up now. Power dropping, Fred warned the admiral as he peered at the engineering screens. Down to 44%. Lieutenant Haverson, the admiral barked, open a channel on the band. It's time we introduced ourselves. I, sir. Frequency matched and channel open. The admiral stood. This is the UNSC frigate Gettysburg, he barked, his voice full of authority and colored with his Texas accent. Respond. And then he reluctantly added, please. Static filled the comm. The admiral waited patiently for 10 seconds, and then his boots started to tap on the deck. No need to play possum, boys. We're not here for a fight. We want to. He made a sudden throat-slitting motion toward Haberson, and the lieutenant snapped off the comm. Tiny doors appeared in the 12-kilometer-wide rock. From this distance, they looked no larger than the pores on an orange. A fleet of ships launched, using the asteroid's rotational motion to give their velocities a boost. There were approximately 50 craft pelicans modified with extra armor and chain guns mounted on their hulls, sleek civilian pleasure craft carrying missiles as large as themselves. Singly men engineering pods that sputtered with arc cutters, and one ship that was 50 meters long with oddly angled black stealth surfaces. That's a Coroptera class vessel, Haverson said, odd. It's an antique. ONI decommissioned them all 40 years ago and sold them for scrap. Is it a threat? The Admiral asked. Lieutenant Haverson's forehead wrinkled as he considered. No, sir. They were decommissioned because they broke down every other mission. They had far too many sensitive components without a central controlling AI. The only reason I recall them at all is that they had the smallest operational Shafujikawa translite engine ever produced. No weapon systems, sir. Like I said, it's not a threat, it's a museum piece. But it has slip space capability, Dr. Halsey asked. Maybe we can use it to get to Earth. Unlikely, Haverson replied. All Coroptera class vessels were decommissioned by ONI. Critical components removed and the ship's operating systems locked down so tight I doubt even Cortana could reactivate them. I wouldn't bet on it, Cortana muttered. No weapons, the admiral said and stared at the blocky geometry of the black ship. That's all I need to know. Their fleet, Fred interjected, is deploying and taking up positions around us in a wide arc. Classic formation. They'll flank us. There's no real threat from these ships, the admiral said to himself. They have to know we know that. So why bother with this show? He scowled at the displays, and his eyes widened. Cortana, scan the nearby rocks for radioactive emissions. Receiving video feed, Fred announced. The image of a man flickered on forward screen 3. 
He was clearly a civilian, with long black hair drawn back into a ponytail and a pointed beard extending a full ten centimeters from his chin. He smiled and made an elegant bow. The chief, for some reason he could not understand, took an instant dislike to him. Captain, the men said in a smooth, resonant tenor voice, I am Governor Jacob Giles, leader of this port. What can we do for you? First, Admiral Whitcomb said, I am not a captain, I am a vice admiral, the deputy chief of naval operations. Second, you will order your fleet to reverse course and get out of my gun sights before I forget my manners. And third, we insist that you make ready to let us dock on that rock of yours for emergency repairs and refit. Giles considered these requests and then threw his head back and laughed. Admiral, my sincere apologies for the confusion in your rank. He said this with a mocking grin. As for your other requests, I'm afraid I can't accommodate you today. And I respectfully suggest you reconsider, Mr. Giles, the Admiral said in a deadpan tone. It would be unfortunate for all of us if I have to insist. You're in no position to insist on anything. Giles nodded to someone off-screen. Emissions detected Cortana said. Neutron radiation spikes at 7 by 3 o'clock. 1 by 3 o'clock. Picking up 5 more. They've got nukes. Hidden in the asteroid field, Admiral Whitcomb muttered. Very good. At least we're not dealing with fools. Indeed. We are not fools, Giles replied. We have survived the long arm of Imperial Earth and Covenant intrusions. Someone off-camera handed Giles a datapad with a radar silhouette of Gettysburg Ascendant Justice, numbers and symbols crawled alongside the picture. He hesitated and crinkled his nose, appearing confused at the odd configuration of mated craft. We are also not foolish enough to use overwhelming force when it isn't required. Your ship is ready to fall apart on its own. I hardly think we need to waste one of our precious and expensive nuclear devices to stop you. Whitcomb set his hands on his hips. You need to rethink the tactical situation, Governor, he growled. Cortana, find me a target, a rock the same size as this gentleman's base. Done, she replied. Burn it, he ordered. I, sir. A lance of plasma appeared on the starboard side of Ascendant Justice, cut through space, and blasted the surface of a three-kilometer-long stone tumbling through the asteroid belt. Its surface heated to orange, yellow, and then white, sputtering blobs of molten iron and jets of vapor that caused the massive stone to spin faster. The plasma cut through the rock in a wide arc, punched through the opposite side. The uneven internal heat caused the rock to fracture and explode into fragments. The debris pinwheeled away, leaving helical trails of cooling iron and glittering metallic gas in its wake. Keep number two and three turrets hot, the admiral said, and target their base. Done, sir. The mocking smile had vanished from Giles's face and the color had drained from his golden skin. Perhaps I was too hasty, he said. Where are my manners? Please come aboard and join me as my honored guest. Bring your staff, too. He made a quick motion to his crew off camera. The ships surrounding the Gettysburg turned and maneuvered back toward the rotating asteroid. Join me for dinner and we can discuss what you need. You have my word that no one will be harmed. Admiral Whitcomb chuckled. I have no doubt about that. Mr. Giles, he turned to Cortana. If we're not back in 30 minutes, blast them all to hell. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 72 Governor Giles. Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again. I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 72 Governor Giles Location Eridanus System, Aboard Rebel Base September 12, 2552, 1945 hours Matt linked mission telemetry with Crystal as Giles's men met them in the landing bay, six men dressed in black coveralls with old MA-3 rifles slung over their shoulders. They hesitated, then took tentative steps toward the Covenant dropship. Matt didn't blame them, he'd have been careful, too, if he were moving toward an armed enemy vessel. One fear-induced pull of the trigger from any one of them, however, and this greeting would turn into a bloody firefight. He closed off his external speakers and asked, Crystal Tactical Analysis. Crystal replied the asteroid is a typical ferric oxide composite. It's reinforced with a layer of titanium A armor. The armor is well camouflaged, but I spotted it with the Gettysburg's deep radar. They have a few sections with ablative undercoats as well. Radars bouncing off those sections, so would Covenant sensors. Impressive. Governor Giles strolled across the deck, 
flipped his black fur cap over one shoulder, and shook Admiral Whitcomb's hand. Giles nodded to Haverson. His smile vanished, however, when he looked at Matt and Fred in their Mjolnir armor. Giles recovered his grin and bowed low to Dr. Halsey. There are half a dozen guards armed with old MA-3 rifles and concealed plasma pistols, Crystal whispered. I'm also picking up a fire team often in the side passages, watching. I saw them, Matt muttered. They're overwatch and backup, just in case. No problem. This way, please, Giles said, and with a flourish, he led them through a narrow corridor. Matt took one last look at the docking bay. It seemed smaller than he remembered it. Twenty years ago he and his team had blown off the external doors, stolen a pelican, escaped, and left a dozen men dead on the deck. His team had accomplished that mission without Mjolnir armor. It hadn't been developed yet, so there was no way anyone here could have known that Matt and Fred were part of the team that had extracted the last governor of the base, the traitor Colonel Watts. Yet Giles's guards glared at Matt as if they knew everything. As Matt stepped into the corridor, Crystal informed him this passage is from a UNSC cargo vessel, ripped out and reinforced with a bulkhead every 10 meters. Airtight and tough. This place can take a lot of damage before buckling. Good place for an ambush, too, Matt said and kept one eye on his motion tracker. They were being followed. Three contacts behind them, and three ahead, keeping pace. Matt had an urge to step in front of the Admiral and Dr. Halsey and clear the passage with a burst of fire. But this situation required diplomacy, something Matt was ill-suited for. He wished the Admiral had taken Matt's suggestion to bring more Spartans with him, or at least to have two of them infiltrate while the Admiral and this Giles spoke. They were led to a circular room. Half the far wall retracted, revealing thick red velvet curtains, which also slowly pulled away and exposed the half meter thick windows that overlooked the asteroid field. Beyond was a gentle ballet of rocks tumbling, rotating, and bouncing off one another in slow motion. Men carried in a long table, threw a white silk cloth over it, and smoothed it down. Then a succession of women carried in silver trays heavy with fruit, steaming meats, and chocolates, and a dozen decanters sloshing with amber, ruby, and clear liquors. Padded chairs were brought in for them all. Please. Giles motioned toward Dr. Halsey and he pulled out a chair for her. Relax and sit down. Matt took up a position by the door where he had a clear view of the entire room. Fred made sure the corridor was empty and then sealed the door. Matt checked behind the curtains for hidden men, surveillance devices, or false passages. Crystal, he whispered. Looks clear, she said. I'm not detecting anything. Walls are half a meter of titanium A. We're clear, Matt told the Admiral. Dr. Halsey finally sat in the proffered chair, smoothed her skirt, and Giles gently slid the chair under her. He offered her a plate of plump strawberries, which she graciously declined. Haverson took one of the strawberries, however, and bit into it. Delicious, he remarked. Giles inclined his head. Our hydroponics facility. With respect, Governor, there's no time for chit-chat, Admiral Whitcomb said. The clock's ticking. In more ways than you might realize. Giles sighed and sat in a chair covered in gold leaf and black velvet. He threw his legs over one of the chair's arms and laced his hands behind his head. You have my complete and full attention, Admiral. Good, Whitcomb said, frowning at Giles's disregard for the seriousness of their predicament. Admiral Whitcomb laid it out for him in short, easy to understand sentences the fall of reach, the Covenant's search for alien technology, the chase, and battle in slip space, and the unclassifiable radiation that would lead the Covenant through slip space, to here. As he spoke, Governor Giles set his feet onto the floor, and his relaxed position solidified. He leaned forward and set his elbows on the table. His congenial smile slowly tightened into a scowl. Bloody Elisa, he shouted, jumped to his feet, and swept a decanter off the table. The glass shattered and ruby-colored brandy spattered across the hardwood. Matt and Fred had Giles instantly in their gun sights, but the admiral held up his hand. Bloody Elisa. Matt asked Crystal. The patron saint of vacuum, the AI replied. She's popular among civilian pilots. I'd guess, the admiral told Giles, that we have less than a day before they find us. And what, Giles said slowly, controlling his anger, do you suggest you do about it? That's the simple part of all this, governor. You can help us, or you can try to kill me and my crew, and sell our ships for whatever the black market will bear. They should yield quite a profit, provided the covenant let you live long enough to cash in. The admiral grabbed a decanter, poured a glass of wine, took a sip, and nodded appreciatively. Now, assuming you manage to outweed our ship's AI, 
which I very much doubt, and assuming further you somehow disable our ship's weapons before our AI blows your base to atoms, which I also doubt, then you'll have a Covenant fleet to contend with, and I don't think they're going to be sociable, sit down, drink your wine, and discuss this like gentlemen. Giles placed his face into his hand and rubbed his temples. Maybe you're thinking, the Admiral said, that you've kept this operation of yours hidden this long. From the UNSC. From the Covenant. Why should this be any different? Well, we found you easily enough. I don't think the Covenant will blink at overturning every rock in this asteroid belt to find you. Governor Giles picked up a new bottle and filled a glass to the brim. He downed the drink in one gulp. And the other option. He asked coldly. I help you. And together we fight the Covenant. If they come in the force you claim, what difference will it make? If you help us, the Admiral said, get my ship repaired so we can make the jump to Earth, I'll evacuate all your people. I promise you and your crew amnesty. Giles laughed. His cordial smile returned, and he asked, do you have any proof of any of this? That the mighty reach is gone? That you have new alien technology? Or that the Covenant are on their way here? Commander Cortana cried in alarm. On his helmet's heads-up display, a schematic of the Eridanus system appeared. A NAV marker flashed near the third planet. It expanded into the familiar curved radar silhouette of a Covenant cruiser. We have company, Matt said. He strode to the window and pointed. There. The blue glow of Covenant engines flared as the ship came about and accelerated toward the asteroid belt. There's your proof, Governor, Admiral Whitcomb growled. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 73 Battle Stations Authors note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 73 Battle Stations Location aboard hybrid vessel Gettysburg Ascendant Justice, station keeping in Eridanus system. September 12, 2552, 2000 hours. Admiral Whitcomb, Matt, Fred, and Lieutenant Haverson bounded off the elevator and onto the bridge of the Gettysburg. Cortana's image nickered on the holographic pad near the star map. Covenant cruiser is only 200,000 kilometers away, she reported. Closing fast on an intercept course, the Admiral barked orders Fred, Take the engineering station, Haverson on NAV, and Commander, you're on weapons station 1. Get it up and running and see if there are any systems we overlooked. Lieutenant, move us away from the enemy on course 180 by Tusavenzero. 180 by Tusavenzero, I, Haverson replied. He strapped himself into the NAV station, and his fingers danced over the controls. Coming about, Admiral. Gettysburg Ascendant Justice turned and moved deeper into the asteroid field. Matt stepped up to Weapons Station 1. He was cross-strained on the weapons ops system of every class of UNSC warship, but he'd never actually fired any shipborne weapon before. The Mac gun on this frigate was one of the largest weapons in the human arsenal. He wished they had rounds for it, he would have given anything to launch one of the 600 and depleted uranium projectiles at that Covenant cruiser. He carefully tapped commands on the keyboard, and the darkened screen came to life. Matt scrutinized the Gettysburg's weapons inventory. Governor Giles appeared on the number three forward display, his face placid except his lips, which pressed together so tightly that they were only a thin white line of concentration. Governor, the Admiral said. His voice was smooth and resonated with the absolute authority of command. I'll maneuver the Gettysburg and take a shot at extreme range with our plasma turret. That will blow down the cruiser's shields. I want you to coordinate with our AI and fire one of your nukes while their shields are down, blast them to bits. A brilliant tactic, Giles said, and his lips parted in a mocking smile. Except for one problem. We have no nuclear weapons. The ones you detected in the asteroid field were only neutron radiation emitters. He shrugged. We bluffed. Admiral Whitcomb cursed quietly. Very smart, Giles. You'll just have to use the seven plasma turrets on your ship, Admiral. Governor Giles remarked, that should be more than enough to, the Admiral chuckled, and he smiled in the same mocking fashion as Giles, we bluffed, too, we only have one turret, and it's not working so well, it appears we have both overestimated the other, Giles said, under different circumstances, this might be amusing, indeed, Whitcomb addressed Cortana, try and hail that Covenant cruiser, maybe we can bluff them, too, they're responding, Cortana replied, religious rhetoric aside, 
They're demanding that we stand down and hand over the artifact or they will open fire. Give them our answer, Admiral Whitcomb said. Fire when ready, Cortana. The turret on Ascendant Justice warmed, and plasma collected and focused into a thin ruby line that lanced forward, and unraveled into a wide spiral that coursed over the bow of the Gettysburg. The superheated gases boiled away patches of remaining titanium A armor and revealed the ship's skeletal superstructure. What the hell happened? The admiral shouted. Analyzing now, Cortana replied. Plasma turret offline. Stand by, sir. I can move my fleet to engage the enemy, Giles said uncertainty. Admiral Whitcomb surveyed the forward screens Giles, the approaching Covenant cruiser, and the asteroid field full of rocks floating on invisible currents. He narrowed his eyes, then said they'd blast you out of space before you could sneeze, Governor. And you don't have a weapon that'll get through their shields. No, I'll draw them off. Evac your people. Understood, Admiral. One of Giles's eyebrows gracefully arched, and he bowed. Thank you. Fred, move us at best speed. Haverson, come to course Zirinanezero. Get us closer to that moon's eyes chuck of stone, 20,000 kilometers to port. Flank speed, Fred said. Aye, sir. Course change, aye, Haverson replied. The Gettysburg Ascendant Justice glided toward the large rock, and the Covenant cruiser rapidly closed on them. The enemy ship vanished on the displays as they rounded to the dark side of the asteroid. New course. Come about to 180, the Admiral ordered. Full emergency power to the engines and answer all stop. Thrusters spun the ship around, and vibrations rumbled through the weakened hull as it slowed and came to a stop, hidden behind the rock. Answering all stop, Fred announced. Sir, we are dead in space, Lieutenant Haverson said and nervously ran his fingers through his slick back red hair. Traditional tactics advocate speed and maneuverability in ship-to-ship -ship combat. Not in this asteroid field, Admiral Whitcomb replied but you make a good point about staying maneuverable. Align our nose toward the center of mass of the planetoid, and back us up, one half reverse. Keep us out of the enemy's gun sights as long as you can. Firing ministers. Answering one half reverse, Fred said. The ship slowly angled toward the center of the large asteroid and backed away. Cortana, the admiral asked, do we have a weapons turret or not? Yes, sir, Cortana said but the turret's magnetic coils that shape and aim the plasma charge have overloaded. The admiral inhaled and sighed explosively. Commander, you got anything on weapon station one? Archer missile pods depleted, Matt answered. He scanned the display, hoping he had missed something. No rounds for the MAC gun. All Shiva nuclear missiles fired as well, sir. The only things left in the tubes are three clarion spy drones. No plasma and no missiles, Admiral Whitcomb said. We might as well open an airlock and throw rocks at them. Throw rocks. Matt wondered if they could fashion a slug to shoot from the Mac cannon. Let its magnetic coils propel the mass to supersonic velocities and magnetic coils. Sir, Matt said. We may have a way to fire the plasma turret after all. The Gettysburg's Mac gun has 17 superconducting coils. Cortana might be able to use them to shape and aim the plasma. Yes, the Admiral said, nodding. Maybe. Cortana amended and stared off into space, thinking. Calculating field strength drop off now. The mathematic symbol scrolling across her body increased threefold. She frowned. This would be easier if the Gettysburg was oriented bottom to Ascendant Justice's top. I'll have to guess at the interference from the intervening hulls, but it still might work. Commander, power it up. I'll need to recalibrate the pulse generation to match the plasma output. Mac gun magnetic fields coming online, Matt said as he tapped in commands. Rerouting power from Ascendant Justice's reactor. We won't have enough power to move fast if we have to, Fred remarked, watching the energy fed to the Gettysburg's engines drop to nothing. That's okay. The Admiral absentmindedly tugged at the end of his mustache. We wouldn't be able to outrun that Covenant cruiser even if we had full power. Our only chance is to take them out before they take us out. Launch those Clarion spy drones, Commander. Target the region abeam that planetoid, so we can see around the corner. Matt kept one eye on the fluctuating magnetic field strengths of the superconducting coils as he programmed a course for the spy drones. Set to either side of the large asteroid, they'd effectively give them another set of eyes to see past the obstructing rock. Drones away, Matt said and launched them, their feathery propellant trails vanished into the distance. Cortana, Admiral Whitcomb said, Slave your targeting system to the feed from those drones. 
I want a clean shot fired before the cruiser crosses that rock's shadow and shoots at us. Working, she replied. Getting magnetic field variations from the Ascendant just to Cito Gettysburg energy transfer. Drones in position and images online, the Master Chief said and pushed the video feed to the forward screen. Doubled images of the Covenant cruiser appeared. Along its three bulbous sections, lateral plasma conduits glowed and every turret bristled with energy, ready to fire. Their laser batteries obliterated the large asteroids in their path, while the smaller ones simply bounced off their shields. The warship accelerated as it entered the gravitational influence of the planetoid between them. They're going to slingshot around, the admiral said. Cortana, give me your best targeting solution and fire at will. Cortana narrowed her eyes and calculations flashed across her body. Extrapolating their course and speed, she breathed. I got them. On weapons station one Matt saw the acceleration coils of the Gettysburg's Mac pulse, then redline with power. Magnetic field lines ballooned, overlapped, and distorted asymmetrically. Static washed across his Mjolnir armor shields, and every electrically conducting surface on the bridge sparked as the magnetic lines of force penetrated through the ship end. Toward the turret on Ascendant Justice, their only working turret heated, and plasma gathered at its tip, streamers looped upon themselves like tiny solar flares, vibrated, intensified to orange and then blue-white. Almost there, Cortana cried. Hang on. The ball of squeezed plasma imploded. It instantly boiled away a 30-meter section of armor and hull from Ascendant Justice. The plasma vanished for a split second, then a bolt of coiled energy corkscrewed toward the edge of the planetoid. The Covenant cruiser rounded the planetoid, targeted the Gettysburg, and fired. Cortana's single shot impacted on the nose of the enemy craft first. The cruiser's shield flashed solid silver for a moment and was gone. The super-compressed plasma tore into the hull of the warship, exploding the metal where it touched. The plasma forked and detonated outward as it chained through the vessel. Secondary explosions rippled through the alien ship's hull. Edges of its shattered hull glowed red and then white hot as their superheated atmosphere vented. The bolt ripped through the engineering compartment, shattered their reactors, and the entire warship blossomed into fire and ejected trails of golden sparks and dying flickers of static electricity. The five plasma bolts that the Covenant cruiser fired at the Gettysburg dispersed into a red haze. There was no longer any magnetic force to shape and guide them to their intended target. The bridge crew watched the explosions fade from the forward screens. The admiral said, status. Fred tapped the screen of the engineering station and reported engines and reactor offline. That magnetic pulse did something to them. Static washed over weapons station 1 as Matt looked up and said, Mac accelerating coils intact. Drone 1 destroyed. Retrieving drone 2, sir. Cortana's holographic presence was missing, but her voice sounded triumphantly through the bridge speaker's turret number three destroyed. But if we ever get any of the other six turrets in working order, we'll have a formidable arsenal. We may not get that chance, Lieutenant Haverson remarked as he bent over the NAV station. Contacts inbound. Small ships. Dozens of them. Transferring to the forward screens. Armored pelicans, exoskeleton welders, a handful of longsword single ships, and the odd stealth Chervtura-class vessel appeared on screen. Giles's fleet, Haverson stated, and he has us exactly where he wants us, dead in the water. Incoming transmission, Cortana said, piping it through. Admiral Whitcomb, Giles's rich and resonant voice flooded the bridge. Can I be of some assistance? A tow, perhaps, back to our base so we can expedite repairs to your ships. That would be most kind of you, the admiral said and eased back into the captain's chair. Two laden-class cargo ships came alongside the Gettysburg and attached. Their engines rumbled. I don't understand, Haverson whispered. He had us. No, he didn't, Admiral Whitcomb replied. He scowled and added, Governor Giles may not like it, but he needs us now. The Covenant isn't going to send just one ship. After this one goes missing for a while, there'll be more. A lot more. This is only the start of the battle, son. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 74 First Strike. Authors note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 74 First Strike. Location aboard hybrid vessel Gettysburg Ascendant Justice, station keeping in Eridanus system, September 13, 2552, 
0, 400 hours. Matt and his seven remaining teammates sat in the Gettysburg's machine shop. The room was large enough to fit a long sword inside, and the walls, ceilings, and deck had robotic arms tipped with welders, multi-tools, and hydraulic presses. Three of the arms had high-intensity spotlights directed onto the walls and provided a clear, cool, indirect illumination that Matt found soothing after having one too many plasma blasts etch his retinas. They were here because Admiral Whitcomb had ordered the Spartans to repair their equipment and get at least six hours of sleep. The machine shop was a solid room, reinforced, and unlikely to breach in case they were attacked again. John was awake and was currently cleaning his weapons. Linda sat in the corner with her helmet, back torso, and shoulder Mjolnir armor sections removed. Fred and Will used two robotic arms to hold her armor in place. They swapped out damaged plates and components with the spare parts they'd found in ONI's castle facility on Reach. Angry red scars crisscrossed Linda's pale body, the only external trace of her double transplant operation. Against Dr. Halsey's advice for strict bed rest, Linda had hobbled down here with her team. She sat cross-legged before a disassembled SRS-99C sniper rifle and selected Euro compensators, optics, and adaptive texture barrel sheaths. Linda proceeded to reassemble the precision-made weapon with the care of a loving mother caressing her newborn child. Without looking up from her rifle she said, Now I know what you have to do to get a couple of days Randar in this outfit. I heard, Fred remarked, that you spent the whole time sleeping, too. That's why she likes to snipe, Will replied. I caught her snoring last time she posted in that tower on Europa. Matt was glad they could joke about her return from the dead. He couldn't bring himself to join in, though. He had accepted the mantle of command, and CPO Mendez had taught him to repress his external emotional reactions to preserve his authority. Right now, he resented that. Kelly rolled over and woke up. She nudged Grace, and they sat up, shaking their helmets. Zero four hundred. Kelly told them. That was six hours. Felt like a fifteen-minute nap, Grace muttered. I just closed my eyes. You're kidding, right? Kelly looked over to Linda and drew her two fingers across her helmet in the smile gesture. Linda returned a rare, bare smile to her. The smile looked out to Matt. He wanted to smile, too, but nothing much, apart from Linda, in a long time had given him cause not the hordes of rebels crawling over and through the Gettysburg whom Admiral Whitcomb trusted too much, nor the imminent return of Covenant forces before their engines and weapons could be repaired, and certainly not the hundreds of dead crew members aboard the Gettysburg, whom they had collected and placed in Cargo Bay 7. The slight click of metal on metal alerted every Spartan in the room. Pistols drew in a blur of motion and rifles leveled at the side hatch as it eased open with a squeak. Sergeant Johnson and Corporal Locklear stood in the doorway, frozen. No one told me this was target practice, Locklear muttered else I would have painted a bullseye on my chest. Commander, the sergeant said, reporting as you requested. Matt nodded and lowered his gun, as did the other Spartans. Come in, Marines. As he holstered his weapon, Matt's hand brushed against the belt compartment that held Dr. Halsey's data crystals. He hadn't decided which to give to Lieutenant Haberson. Did he sacrifice the sergeant to save billions from potential flood infestation? Did it even matter? He had every reason to believe that the flood had been destroyed with Halo, but what if he was wrong? I wanted you both down here to help us discuss our tactical options, Matt told them. The calm pulse to life, Dr. Halsey said, Commander. Yes, Doctor. I need Kelly to report to Medical 4, she said. She requires one last injection of dermocortic steroids, and I could use her assistance on another matter. Matt nodded to Kelly. Kelly slowly stretched, stood, sighed and marched out of the room. I'll be right back, she said, flexing her burned hands. Don't plan the overthrow of the Covenant Empire without me. She on her way, doctor. The calm snapped off. Matt turned to his Spartans and the Marines. Let's go over what we know and see if we've missed anything, any way to exploit the enemy's plan. He set down a datapad with a star map glittering upon its surface. The Covenant are on their way to Earth, he told them. They are gathering at a battle station and then jumping en masse to the soul system. What happens then? Fred asked. Assuming we get to Earth first, Linda answered, our fleet will be waiting for them, and, she pulled back the bolt on her rifle with a clack, they'll give them a warm reception. But what chance will our forces have? Will asked. There was no fear in his voice, just cool logic. You saw Cortana's report. There will be hundreds of Covenant warships. I don't think our fleet or even Earth's orbital Mac platforms can repel a force that powerful. 
No, John quietly said, they can't win, they'll try, but the Covenant will eventually take down one of the orbital max, slip through, and pick off the ground-based generators. Just like on Reach, Fred visibly flinched. Locklear twisted the red bandana he had tied on his biceps. So we get to watch another fight in space, he hissed. His fists trembled with barely checked rage. There has to be a way to get to those bastards first, on the ground where we can win. Hell, I'd even take my chances in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Anything but floating in zero-g and watching Earth get burned. What about our original mission? Linda asked. Find the Covenant homeworld. Our priority has to be to warn Earth, Matt answered. Admiral Whitcomb would insist, and he has the authority to scrub our mission. And there's no ground between here and Earth where we can take the fight to them, Locklear said. He unclenched his fist and dropped his gaze to the deck. Sometimes, he whispered, I really hate this war. Sergeant Johnson worked his mouth but said nothing. He set his hand on Locklear's wide shoulder and whispered, Stand tall, Marine. Try to. The sergeant's gaze fell on the data pad and the star map. Hang on a second. What was it you said about no ground to fight on between here and there? He grinned and picked up the data pad. What's this? He tapped a dot on the map, squinted, and read the tiny words. This. Uneven elephant. Unyielding hierophant, Matt corrected. According to Cortana, it's a commandant control center, a mobile space platform where the Covenant fleet will rendezvous before their final jump to Earth. Well, there's your ground, Sergeant Johnson said. On this elephant thing, we'll got up and walked over to the data pad. It fits with the timetable. This station is on the way to Earth. Fred offered, we can drop out of slip space in a smaller craft. Go in an, and do what you Spartans do best, Locklear said. Infiltrate, kill, and blow shit up. If there's room in this operation for an ODSD, pencil me in. Matt looked to the data pad, then to his team, Locklear, and the sergeant. They were right for the first time, they'd know when and where the Covenant would be. If they hit the enemy hard enough, they could stop them before the Covenant hit Earth, and delay Armageddon. Matt gave rapid-fire orders Fred, we'll get Linda's suit back together ASAP. Locklear, you're on weapons detail again. Scrounge every pistol, rifle, ammo bag, and scrap of explosives on this vessel and haul it to Ascendant Justice's launch bay. Matt addressed the remainder of his team. Grace, John, Linda, and Sergeant Johnson get that Covenant dropship ready for its last flight. Reinforce the hull for a slip Spacito normal space transition. And what are you going to do? John asked. I'll take this plan to Admiral Whitcomb, make him see that it's the only way, Matt replied. We're going to take this fight to the Covenant. We're going to launch a first strike. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 75 The Right Thing Authors note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 75 The Right Thing Location aboard hybrid vessel Gettysburg Ascendant Justice, Station Keeping in Iridanus System, September 13, 2552, 0440 hours. Matt stepped off the elevator and onto the bridge of the Gettysburg. Lieutenant Haverson and Admiral Whitcomb stared at the displays at Weapons Station 1 and Engineering. Sirs, Matt said. The Admiral waved him forward without bothering to look up. Matt had two tasks. First, he would inform the Admiral of his first strike mission plan. He had to convince him there was no risk to their primary goal of returning to Earth, and a huge payoff if they succeeded. The only thing Admiral Whitcomb might object to was the high risk to his team. Matt's second task would be more difficult. He touched the belt pouch containing Dr. Halsey's data crystals. One was her analysis of the flood infection mechanism and a possible way to block it. The second data crystal contained the source files of that discovery, and according to Dr. Halsey, it would lead to Sergeant Johnson's undignified and unnecessary death. And yet, if it gave Section 3 a better chance to stop the floods, if indeed that threat had any meaning after the destruction of Halo, maybe it was worth one man's life. Maybe if Sergeant Johnson knew, he'd volunteer. Matt's duty was clear he had to hand over all files to the lieutenant, but deep down, he had to admit that it didn't feel right. Cortana. Admiral Whitcomb crossed his arms over his barrel chest. Give me an update on our power. Cortana's tiny image flickered to life on the holopad near the NAV station. 
She crossed her arms over her chest much as he had, and minute red symbols raced over her glowing lavender skin. Status is nearly identical to my last report five minutes ago, Admiral. Tests on Ascendant Justice's reactor and the Gettysburg's engines are in sync and will be completed in 40 minutes. Hurry, the Admiral growled. I don't want to get stuck without power when unfriendlies show up. I want to get underway to Earth. Weapon status. I, sir, Cortana said. Plasma turret 1 is obliterated, no possibility of repair. Plasma turrets 2, 3, and 4 are repaired, and although I'm waiting for power to test them, I have run 312 virtual test firings without incident. Turrets 5, 6, and 7, however, require parts Governor Giles does not have in his inventory. Two Archer missile pods on the Gettysburg have been refilled. That gives us 16 missiles hot and ready to go, sir. I'd like to know where Giles got those missiles, Lieutenant Haverson muttered. They're UNSC military contraband. He is a pirate, Lieutenant, Cortana said. Good work, the Admiral told Cortana. Keep me posted. He turned toward Matt. You had something, Commander. Before Matt could speak his mind, Haverson said, Admiral. He pointed at the forward screens and at the Coroptera-class ship accelerating away from the Gettysburg's launch bay. I thought Giles was staying on board to oversee repairs. So did I, the Admiral said. Cortana, did you catch Giles leaving on surveillance? No, sir, but you might be interested in this. On the screen, a grainy video appeared of Locklear, Dr. Halsey, and a Spartan on a gurney boarding the ship. Locklear left them at the ship, sir. Dr. Halsey and Spartan 087 departed. Cortana, the Admiral barked. Hail that ship. Now. Hailing. Governor Giles appeared on forward screen number one. Admiral, he said with a nervous smile. I just saw my ship leave the launch bay. Perhaps you can explain why you commandeered my personal property when I have shown nothing but good faith in this. Hold on to your shirt tail, Governor, Admiral Whitcomb snapped. I'm in the middle of finding out who took your ship and what precisely is going on. Cortana, any response to our hail? An automated code, sir, she said. Her mouth opened in astonishment. UNSC code 392. 392, the Admiral asked. He stared into space, trying to recall the obscure code. Matt cleared his throat and told him, Admiral, that is an official, non-response code, sir. Special warfare teams use it to ignore hails, due to a higher priority mission. God damn it. The Admiral's face flushed, and he ground his teeth. You mean the good doctor just told me to go to hell? On the forward screen the Corruptora, its bat-like wings nearly invisible against the black of space, accelerated in a sudden burst. Pinpoints of light appeared around the craft that elongated and smeared. The ship vanished. A slipspace transition, Cortana said. I thought you told me, the Admiral said, slowly turning on Haverson, that that ship was locked down. That vital components were removed when it was decommissioned. That there was no way it could make a slipspace jump. Yes, sir, I did. And would you care to explain why that ship just disappeared, Lieutenant? Yes, Admiral. I was wrong, Haverson replied without meeting the Admiral's eyes. Dr. Halsey apparently found a way to circumvent the ONI lockout on the ship's systems. On screen, Giles said, This is most unfortunate, Admiral. I expect to be compensated. You bet it's unfortunate, Admiral Whitcomb said. If I'd known there was a chance we could have used that ship to jump to Earth, I would have done it an hour ago. Cortana, what was her trajectory? Not Earth, Cortana said. Dr. Halsey's course points to no known system in my database. The Admiral scrutinized the forward screen Giles's face, the empty starfield, and the frozen video of Dr. Halsey and Locklear in the launch bay. I want Corporal Locklear on the bridge ten minutes ago. Lieutenant Haverson, have Cortana locate him. Then I want you personally to escort that ODSD up here. Haverson swallowed. Yes, sir. He marched to the elevator, and Cortana told him, he's on B-deck, Lieutenant, medical storage. He's not answering my comm page. The elevator shut. Commander, you're on the engineering console, the admiral said. Cover the NAV station, too. Yes, sir. He moved to the engineering station's monitors. There were 35 minutes to go on the shakedown cycle of the reactors and engines. Contact, Cortana said. Bearing 030 on the solar plane. 1. Correction. 2. Covenant cruisers. They're not moving. Maybe they haven't spotted us. It never rains when it can monsoon, the admiral declared. 
They can't help but see us, Cortana, with all the radio chatter, ships, and leaking radiation. I bet they're just figuring out how best to kill us. Governor Giles turned to someone off screen, and then said, Admiral Whitcomb, given this new development I would like to evacuate my people off the Gettysburg and out of harm's way. Of course, Governor. Do what you have to. The number three screen snapped off, and the stars reappeared. And I'll do what I have to, too, Admiral Whitcomb said. Cortana, halt the reactor and engine shakedown. Sir, there are risks. I want them online now. Don't tell me what the risks are. Just do it. Yes, sir, she said. Commander, get this crate ready to move and stay on your toes. We'll need every trick in the book to outmaneuver two cruisers. Affirmative, Admiral, Matt observed the shakedown cycle halt and ascendant justice's reactors restart. Radiation indicators redlined, and then dropped to a hairbreadth, which was technically considered safe. The Gettysburg's engines shuddered to life. Matt felt the vibration through the deck half a kilometer away. Reactors are hot, sir, he reported. The Admiral watched as Giles's fleet of single ships and technicians in jetpacks abandoned the Gettysburg, swarming across the dark of space back to the safety of their asteroid. Rats leaving a sinking ship, he wondered aloud. Matt wasn't sure if that was a question directed at him, but he decided to reply anyway. They're just men who want to live, sir. The Admiral nodded. Covenant cruiser accelerating, Cortana announced. Bearing on a vector out of the system. It's transitioning to slip space. Commander, get this tub moving. Now bring us up to half maximum speed. Aye, sir. He tapped in commands. Answering one half forward. The radiation warning on Ascendant Justice's reactor flickered but stabilized and subsided. The combined mass of the two attached ships groaned as their recently repaired superstructures overcame their inertia. Heat up our plasma turrets, Cortana. I.S., her translucent lavender hologram faded to ice blue. Sir, additional contacts at system's edge. 3. No, additional transitions from slip space, counting 18, now 30 Covenant ships of various classes. Positions 030-091-180. Sir, they have us enveloped. The star chart vanished in a wink, and a map of the Eridanus system appeared with tiny triangles representing Covenant ships now encircling the perimeter. The map turned to a side profile and revealed half a dozen additional ships scattered along the nadir and zenith of the system. Admiral Whitcomb stared at the map and shook his head. You know the story of the Alamo, Commander? Yes, sir. A famous siege with a handful of defenders holding off overwhelming forces. The Admiral smiled. Texan defenders, Commander, there's a big difference. Colonel William Barrett Travis with 155 men held off more than 2,000 Mexican invaders. They hunkered down inside a tiny fort and fought like wildcats. Travis got a handful of reinforcements later, 32 men. The Admiral's smile faded. You know there were 15 civilians inside that fort, too. He looked at the map again. Well, when the fighting was over, Travis and his men were dead, but it cost the enemy 600 lives. Like the Battle of Thermopylae, Matt remarked. But there were survivors at the Alamo. They let the civilians live. He turned to Matt. You think anyone's going to survive this fight? You think there's any way to win? Matt tried to think of a way to fight and to win. Thirty Covenant ships against their damaged hybrid vessel. Add to that the need to defend Governor Giles's crew. Could he board one of the Covenant craft? Get Cortana or Crystal to infiltrate their systems and broadcast falsified orders. They would see him approaching. Or was there a blind spot he could approach from? How could he hide from the rest of the ships in their fleet, though? And by the time he could implement such a plan, the Gettysburg would be molten slag. It was a rhetorical question, Commander, the Admiral said. Yes, sir, Matt replied. Given our situation, resources, and our enemy's determination, then, no, I see no way to win or survive. Neither do I. Admiral Whitcomb stood straight. Cortana, get ready to jump. Commander, accelerate to flank speed course 055 by Tunanezero. Prepare to transition out of normal space on my mark. Aye, sir, Matt and Cortana answered in unison. We're leaving Governor Giles and his people, Cortana asked. Admiral Whitcomb was silent a long moment, and then he replied, We are. This isn't the Alamo and I'm not Colonel William Barrett Travis, although I dearly wish I were. No, we're running. We're trading hundreds of lives for billions. Matt absent-mindedly reached for his belt pouch, and Dr. Halsey's data crystals clinked. Is this the right thing to do, sir? The right thing. Admiral Whitcomb sighed. 
Hell, son, it probably isn't. Personally, I'd prefer to fight, and die fighting, and take every one of those covenant bastards with me. But I do not have the liberty to make that choice. My duty is clear to protect the men and women of Earth, not a pack of privateers and outlaws. He closed his eyes and said, the logic of the situation is also too damned clear. Even if we stay and fight, they'll all be just as dead. Capacitors at full charge, Cortana announced. Preparing to enter slipspace. Waiting for your order, sir. Matt saw the energy from Ascendant Justice's reactor drain to 5%. Motes of blue-green light appeared on the forward screen, and the stars stretched and smeared like watercolors. But something was wrong the shields of Matt's Mjolnir armor rippled. The radiation monitors spiked. Where was it coming from? Hundreds for billions, the Admiral whispered. Duty be damned. I'm still going to burn in hell for this. Admiral Whitcomb inhaled deeply and closed his eyes. Go, Cortana. Get us out of here. And God forgive me. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 76 Mission Approved Authors note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 76 Mission Approved Location aboard hybrid vessel Gettysburg Ascendant Justice, in slip space. September 13, 2552, 0510 hours. Matt and his team, which now consisted of John, Grace, Linda, Will, and Fred, had been ordered to report to the officers' club, normally forbidden territory to NCOs. Of course, nothing about their circumstances had been normal for a long, long time. The Gettysburg's Oak Club had a massive table of oak, scored with numerous gouges and scorches from a hundred cigars casually set upon its surface. There was a bar stocked with bottles containing a rainbow collection of liquors, dusted with shattered crystal. The room's walnut-paneled walls were polished to a rich glow. Hung along those walls was the UNSC gold-fringed blue flag. There were also gold and silver citation plaques for meritorious gallantry. There were photos of officers and past captains of the Gettysburg. And most interesting to the mat were the Civil War daguerreotypes that displayed battlefields full of charging men and cavalry and cannons belching flash and thunder. Admiral Whitcomb and Sergeant Johnson entered the room. The Spartans snapped to rigid attention. Officer on deck Matt shouted, and they all saluted. At ease, Admiral Whitcomb said. Please sit down. Matt stepped forward. With respect, these chairs will not support the weight of our gear, Admiral. Of course, the Admiral said. Well, make yourselves as comfortable as you can. This is an informal meeting. He snorted. I just wanted to see who was left on board and alive. He looked past the open doors to the officer's club. Lieutenant Haverson will join us shortly. He's investigating the site of Corporal Locklear's accident. A holographic projector pad upon the bar flickered to life, and Cortana's slender body appeared. Chunks of broken crystal on the pad refracted the light and distorted her image so she appeared half-melted and cast prismed arcs of light onto the walls. Sergeant Johnson stepped over to the bar and swept the pad clean. Thank you, Sergeant, Cortana said looking over her resorted figure. My pleasure, he replied with a grin. Cortana faced the admiral. Sir, she said, you'll be happy to hear that I'm detecting no signals, residual radiation, or any transient contacts, which is precisely what you would expect from a normal slipspace journey. Admiral Whitcomb nodded, sighed, and eased into one of the leatherback chairs at the table's head. Well, that's one small blessing. And here's evidence that Dr. Halsey's crystal was indeed destroyed, Lieutenant Haverson said as he entered the room. He paused to seal the door behind him. Haverson sat next to the admiral and set a small plastic bag flat on the table. I found Locklear exactly where Cortana said he would be B-deck, the medical storage room. Overloaded electronics at the site are consistent with a high-energy radiation burst, as are the burns on the corporal's body. He grimaced and added, if it means anything, his death was quick. And these, he tapped the plastic bag on the table, are crystalline fragments that I found at the site. At first glance, they appear to be a match to the shard found on Reach. He shook his head. But what I found is not sufficient mass to account for the entire crystal. So unless it was atomized and left no trace, a fact inconsistent with the presence of these larger pieces, then the rest of that crystal has to be somewhere else. Cortana tapped her foot, and one of her eyebrows arched. 
If the radiation burst detected before our jump correlates with the destruction of Dr. Halsey's crystal, she said, then there is an alternative explanation. The timing between that explosion and the radiation flare was only 47 milliseconds. Since the crystal had unusual space and time bending properties, the missing fragments may have been squeezed out of the ship and into slip space. Haverson asked incredulously, you mean pieces of the greatest scientific discovery in human history are, he nodded past the walls of the Gettysburg, lost in slip space. Yes, Cortana replied. She shrugged. I'm sorry, Lieutenant. At least the Covenant can't get to it anymore, Admiral Whitcomb said. He flicked the plastic bag with his thick finger. Or if they do, they're only going to find a bunch of busted fragments. I just wish I knew why Locklear did it, Haverson said. Everyone was quiet. Matt and the other Spartans shifted uneasily in their heavy Mjolnir armor. Sergeant Johnson cleared his throat. The boy was a little on edge. After all, he'd been through, you'd expect that. But he was an ODSD, tough as nails and twice as sharp and used to getting pounded. He wouldn't crack. He had a reason. Dr. Halsey. Haverson remarked and narrowed his eyes. She had to have set this up. Matt started to defend Dr. Halsey, but he stopped himself from arguing with another officer. Yes, her actions were inexplicable. She had exfiltrated Kelly left them when they needed her the most, and given Locklear the alien artifact. Matt still wanted to trust her, though. Perhaps whatever she was up to was for the greater good. Let's not start this, the Admiral said. I don't want anyone's perceptions colored by us discussing the whys and what-ifs of this situation. Save it for the debriefing they're going to give us when we get back. He cast a sideways glance at the bar and unconsciously smacked his lips. From here to Earth it should be smooth sailing, and we can finally relax. Permission to speak, Admiral, Matt said. Granted. Speak your mind. I don't wish to contradict you, sir, but perhaps it shouldn't be smooth sailing. And maybe we shouldn't relax. Admiral Whitcomb leaned forward. I have a feeling I'm not going to like this, but explain yourself, Commander. Matt outlined his mission plan, how he and his team would take a Covenant dropship and insert into the rendezvous location for the invading Covenant fleet. They would then infiltrate their Commandant Control Center, the unyielding Hierophant, and destroy it, that would hopefully cripple the Covenant force, or at least slow them down. Maybe even enough to buy Earth time to reinforce their defenses. The Admiral stared at Matt without blinking and flatly replied, Mission request denied. Acknowledged, sir. He remained standing, at stiff attention. Whitcomb frowned, as the other Spartans also snapped to attention and remained still. He sighed. I understand your motivations, Commander. I do but I will not risk transporting your team to the Covenant rendezvous point, the Admiral explained. If we lose this ship, Earth never gets its warning. Sir, Matt replied, we will transition from slip space to normal space alone. Once the dropship clears the gravitational influence of the Gettysburg and the Ascendant Justice, the slip space field will deteriorate and we will enter normal space. You need never even stop. And only a minor course correction puts the Gettysburg on the correct trajectory. Has a drop out of slip space ever been attempted in a ship so small? The Admiral asked. His heavy brows knitted together. Yes, sir, Cortana said. Our slip space probes perform the maneuver all the time, but the shearing stress and radiation are considerable. She paused and looked toward Matt. The Spartans, however, in the Mjolnir armor should be able to survive. Should, the Admiral echoed, his face grim. As much as I admire your daring, Commander, I still have to deny your request. You'll need Cortana or Crystal to get past the Covenant security systems. They have to make it to Earth. With the data they're carrying on Halo, the Flood, and Covenant technology, they're far too valuable to risk. Understood, sir, Matt replied. I hadn't considered that. Haverson slowly stood and brushed the sleeves of his tattered uniform. I'll volunteer to go on the Commander's mission, he said. I have extensive training in cryptology and Covenant systems. Admiral Whitcomb narrowed his eyes and re-examined the lieutenant as if seeing him for the first time. You'd never survive the slipspace transition, Cortana told him. But, she tapped her lip with her forefinger, deep in thought. There might be another way. Covenant icons entered the stream of symbols flowing along the surface of her holographic body. I discovered a file duplication algorithm in the Covenant AI on Ascendant Justice. I successfully used it to reproduce my language translation routines. I might use it to copy portions of my infiltration programming into the memory processing matrix in the commander's Mjolnir armor. It won't be a full copy, there are replication errors and other side effects, 
but it would give the Spartan team access to some of my capabilities. Enough, I think, to get them through the Covenant security barriers. What about Crystal? Matt asked. I passed this information over Crystal, so she should be able to do the same, Cortana replied. I also told her what to watch out for and how to deal with the Covenant AIs you'll probably encounter. Admiral Whitcomb sighed deeply. He stood, went to the bar, and then returned to the table carrying a bottle of whiskey and three intact crystal tumblers. I assume you Spartans won't join me in a drink. No, sir, Matt replied, answering for his team. Thank you, sir. The admiral set a glass before Haverson, the sergeant, and himself. But before he poured, he set the bottle down and shook his head as if a drink were suddenly the last thing he wanted. You realize, Commander, that you and your team will be on your own. That my first, my only priority, must be to get to Earth. My team is willing to accept the risk, Matt said. The risk, the admiral whispered. It's a one-way ticket, son. But if you're willing to do it, if you can slow the Covenant assault on Earth, then, hell, it might be worth the trade. Matt had no reply to this. He and his Spartans had survived against impossible odds before. Yet the Admiral was right there seemed to be something final about this mission, something that told Matt he wouldn't make it. That was acceptable. The cause more than justified the sacrifice of four when measured against billions of lives on Earth. Admiral Whitcomb stood and said, Very well, Commander. Mission request approved. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 77 Give M Hell. Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 77 Give M Hell. Location aboard hybrid vessel Gettysburg Ascendant Justice, in slip space. September 13, 2552, 0520 hours. Matt parked the groaning overloaded robotic dolly next to the side hatch of the Covenant dropship. The dolly held four tons of carbon molybdenum steel I-beams. Will unloaded the cargo and hauled it inside, where Fred and the sergeant cross-braced and welded the beams in place. This was the final reinforcement to the dropship. The interior of the craft was so cramped that two armored Spartans could barely pass one another. They had welded layers of lead, boron fibers, and titanium A-hull plates they had removed from the Gettysburg. According to Cortana's calculations, this was the only way to give them better than 50-50 odds of emerging from a slipspace transition with an intact ship. Admiral Whitcomb monitored the display of a computer repair card, then looked up and said, Crystal is ready for you, Commander. He waved him over. They decided to use Crystal so Cortana could help pilot the ship. Matt marched to the cart and let the Admiral hook up the interface to the base of his neck. This should feel just like a normal download, he said. Chilled mercury filled Matt's mind just like it always did when Crystal entered and fused with his thoughts. This presence, however, warmed too quickly, as if it were just thin ice melting against his body's heat. It was like a recollection of Crystal inside his head, not the real thing. Initializing Mjolnir Armor Systems check and subroutine unpacking protocols, Crystal's voice whispered. At the same time, the real Crystal also spoke over the calm don't listen to her. She's only half the woman she used to be. As long as you only copied the good parts, Matt replied. I'm all good, Crystal replied tersely. Just don't get too used to a passenger you can order around. I wouldn't dream of it. Systems check complete, the copied Crystal whispered. All systems are functional. Linda approached the opposite side of the Covenant dropship, a robot dolly followed stacked with rifles, Lotus anti-tank mines, explosives, and crates of ammunition. She angled the dolly and led it up to the loading ramp until it butted against the hull. John emerged from inside, and Linda handed him an armful of submachine guns. Matt detected a slight limp to her stride and an almost imperceptible awkwardness to her usual fluid motions. He opened a private comm channel to Linda. What's your status? Are you fit? She shrugged. This gesture was notoriously difficult to perform in Mjolnir armor with its force multiplying circuits. It took a degree of concentration and dexterity that spoke volumes about Linda's true coordination. Dr. Halsey would say I needed a month's bed rest, she wryly replied. But I'm squared away, Commander. I still have this. She picked her sniper rifle off the dolly and slung it over her shoulder with liquid grace. And I still have this. She patted her helmet. Even though the Covenant did their best to shoot it off last time, she stepped closer to him. I can take care of myself. 
and I can take care of the team's back. I've never let you down, sir. I don't plan on doing so now. He nodded. What Matt wanted to do, however, was order her to stay behind. He cared too much about her and if something happened to her, his heart would shatter into a million pieces. But he'd need her uncanny skill with the sniper rifle on this mission. He would be in Linda's role, but he was the leader on this mission. He'd need her so they could survive just long enough to stop the Covenant. If he could have accomplished this mission alone, he would have made everyone on Blue Team stay. His team, however, knew the risks and knew the payoff for their sacrifice. It was as good a final fate as any soldier could ask for. He marched to the other hatch on the dropship and boarded the craft. There was one last detail to take care of with Lieutenant Haberson. Matt moved past Sergeant Johnson who, obscured by a shower of sparks, welded the last supporting a beam in place. The lieutenant sat in the cockpit checking the automated routines that Cortana had uploaded into the system. These would generate the proper coded responses to Covenant queries. They had also changed the dropship's registry tag so the Covenant would not recognize this ship as belonging to the now renegade Ascendant Justice. Lieutenant, Matt said. Forgive the interruption. Haverson looked up and slicked the sweat-drenched hair from his face. What can I do for you, Commander? Matt eased into the co-pilot's seat. Dr. Halsey gave me something to pass on to ONI Section 3 her analysis on the flood. Haverson's eyebrows shot up. He opened his belt compartment and hesitated. Which data crystal? The one containing Dr. Halsey's flood analysis and possible inoculation? Or the one containing the source files for her conclusions, the one she said would kill Sergeant Johnson? While Matt felt justified in gambling his life and the lives of the other Spartans, that was his choice as their commander to make. That wasn't the case for the sergeant. It was a biological fluke that had spared the sergeant from the flood. A one in a billion shot, the doctor had said. But it was a million tune shot that he could save billions of lives. So the mathematics of the situation was almost even. What had Dr. Halsey said about saving every person, no matter what the cost? No, Matt had sworn an oath to protect all of humanity. His duty was clear. He reached for the crystal containing the complete files and handed it to Lieutenant Haberson. She said it would help fight the flood, sir. I'm not exactly sure what she meant. We'll see, Commander. Thank you. Haverson took the crystal and peered into his depths. He shrugged. With Dr. Halsey, who can tell? The comm channel clicked, and Cortana announced, 10 minutes until we reach the drop zone. Make final preparations to launch Blue Team. You'll only get one shot at this. Roger that, Cortana, Matt replied. Spartans, on deck Haverson tentatively extended his hand. I guess this is it, Commander. Matt gently shook the lieutenant's hand. Good luck, sir. Matt moved back though the dropship, almost running over Sergeant Johnson, who was dragging the arc welder down the gangway. Allow me, Sergeant. Matt grasped the 200 kilogram machine and lifted it with one hand. Matt exited the dropship, and he and the other Spartans assembled outside. He stowed the arc welder and took his position at the head of the Spartan formation. Admiral Whitcomb looked them over once and then said, I'd wish you luck, Commander, but you Spartans seem to make your own luck. So let me just say I'll see you all when this is over. He saluted them and they returned the salute. Just one last order, the Admiral said. Sir? Matt asked. Give em hell. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 78 Infiltration Authors note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 78 Infiltration Location aboard captured Covenant dropship in slip space. September 13, 2552, 0530 hours, the dropship rolled, inverted, and spun out of control. It tumbled and pitched, and one of the I-beams solidly welded to the hull buckled and snapped. The Spartans of Blue Team were strapped to the hull in quick-release harnesses. No one, however, gave any thought to the red quick-release button in the center of their chests. They were all hanging on for their lives. The forward monitor was black because there was nothing for them to see in slip space. The only light inside the dropship came from chemical light sticks activated and tossed inside before they departed. Those plastic sticks had cracked, and their luminous contents had balled into a million microscopic blobs in the zero G. Although the hydrostatic gel inside his Mjolnir armor had been pressurized to its maximum safe value, 
Matt's bones still felt as if they were being shaken apart. This violent ride started when they had cleared Ascendant Justice's launch bay and entered the inky void of slip space. This normal slip space was nothing like Matt had experienced before. Without the smoothing effect of Dr. Halsey's alien crystal, this ride was a thousand times worse. Radiation levels spiked and dipped, but so far the dosages getting into the leadline dropship were survivable. Now I know, Linda said, why only big ships travel through slip space. You know those SS probes? Fred asked. They're almost solid titanium, eh? Matt checked his team's biosigns erratic but still within normal operational parameters. Grace's heart skipped a beat or two, but then returned to a normal strong rhythm. No broken bones or signs of internal bleeding yet, either. It was also a good sign that Blue Team were reasonably calm about their dire situation. Matt knew it was all they could do until they cleared the slip space field generated by Ascendant Justice. He ran a diagnostic on his Mjolnir shields. They still recharged faster than they were drained by the ambient radiation that stormed invisibly around them. He wished the real crystal was with him. She would have said something to distract him. Status? Matt asked. Five blue acknowledgement lights winked on, and five Spartans gave him thumbs-up signals. Fred chimed in, this isn't so bad. The last insertion I made, we hit the ground before the dropship. Now, that was a rough ride. We were. The dropship lurched violently and cut off Fred's story. Cracks appeared along the armor welded to the port wall. Molten lead oozed from the rupture. Despite the hydrostatic gel and the padding, a jolt slammed Matt's head against the front of his helmet with force enough to make black stars explode in his eyes. Another jolt slammed his head into the back of his helmet. The inside of the dropship went entirely dark. Commander? Commander? Crystal's voice whispered through his helmet speaker. Commander, respond please. Matt's vision came into focus. His biosign sluggishly pulsed on his heads-up display. Beyond the display, it was completely dark. He activated his external lights and pointed his head along the interior of the dropship. His Spartans hung limp in their harnesses. Aside from spheres of lead that had melted under the hull armor, resolidified, and now floated like champagne bubbles in the interior of the vessel, there was no other discernible motion. We made it. Affirmative, the cloned crystal answered. I'm picking up a tremendous volume of Covenant Com traffic on the Thrufk bands. They've pinged us three times already for a response, Commander. Awaiting orders. How can you pick up any signal inside this lead-lined hull? The hull is breached in many sections, Commander. The Com traffic is also unusually strong, indicating extremely close proximity of Covenant forces. Stand by, he told her. He hit the quick release on his harness and floated free. He called up Blue Team's bias signs and found them all unconscious, but alive. He grabbed a first aid kit, injected them each with a mild stimulant, and released them from their safety restraints. Where are we? Will asked. Matt looked instinctively to the forward monitors, but they were dead. There's only one way to find out, he replied. I'll take the port side hatch. John, you're on the starboard. Roger, Blue One, John replied. Matt rotated the manual release of the hatch and it eased open. Beyond was the velvet black of space, filled with stars that shone yellow and amber and red. He clipped a tether onto his suit and then onto the hull and leaned out the hatch. As Crystal had indicated, there were Covenant forces in close proximity. A cruiser glided silently past them 300 meters away. All Matt could see was its silver-blue hull, its plasma turrets with their lateral lines aglow with fire, and the flare of its engine cones as it passed. And then Matt saw the rest of them. There were Covenant cruisers and larger carriers, there were even bigger vessels with five bulbous sections that were two kilometers stem to stern and had a dozen deadly energy projectors. Motes of dust swirled between the numerous ship Sarah fighters, dropships, and tentacled engineer pods. How many ships, he asked Crystal, are we looking at? 247 warships, she replied. Estimation of the total population based on the sampling from your limited field of vision puts the total number at more than 500 Covenant warships. For the first time, Matt froze, his gauntlets locked onto the edge of the hatch, and his arms failed to respond. 500 ships. There was more firepower here than he had ever seen before. This fleet would easily overwhelm any UNSC defensive force, whether or not the Admiral got through with his warning. Their opening salvo would be a tidal wave of plasma and it would obliterate Earth's orbital fortresses before they could fire a shot. A thousand kilometers below, space rippled, parted, and seven more cruisers appeared in normal space. They maneuvered to join the rest of the pack. 
Matt realized he had seen this magnitude of destructive power halo. The ring was a weapon designed to kill all sentient life for dozens of light years in every direction. And he had stopped that threat. He could stop this one, too. He had to. His plan called for the infiltration and destruction of their commandant control station. But how would that stop this gathering offeree? It wouldn't, but it might buy Earth enough time to come up with a plan to counter the seemingly invincible armada. You said they've pinged us three times. Matt asked Crystal. Affirmative. They've been curious about our status, but not as much as you might expect. There's a tremendous amount of calm traffic. They're probably only interested in us as a navigation hazard. Send a signal and explain that our engines are crippled and will need assistance to move. Let's see if we can get them to take us to this central station for repairs. Sending message now. Matt piped what he was seeing to Blue Team. Time to wake up, he said. Armor and weapons check on the double. There was a pause of several seconds before Blue Team's acknowledgement lights pulsed in his HUD. He knew they were having the same reaction of fear, and then drawing the same conclusion as he had about their mission. They couldn't fail the fate of humanity lay in their hands. Matt angled his head around to take a look at the dropship. The majority of the dropship's hull had peeled away, and lead and titanium plates underneath showed through. Without their reinforcements, the craft would have disintegrated on the rough ride through slip space. Covenant CC responding to our request, the copied crystal informed him. Ferry en route to take us in for repairs. They were a little confused about which warship we belonged to, but I simulated static to cover our ship's registration ID. They're too busy to take too close a look at us. Matt returned inside the dropship. We're getting towed, he told Blue Team. Linda came up to him and made a circle in the air with her index finger. Matt nodded and turned around so she could visually inspect his Mjolnir suit. Computer diagnostics were fine, but his Spartans didn't take any chances with their armor. Especially not in an evacuated environment. You're good, she told him. Matt then returned the favor and examined her suit. Fred and Will had done an excellent job integrating the replacement parts into Linda's armor. Aside from their pristine condition, they were a perfect match. He patted her on the shoulder and gave her a thumbs up to indicate that her armor was in working order. Ordnance loadout, Grace said and unraveled the duffel bags they had tied to the hull. The packages had been wrapped with lead foil, layers of thermal padding, and then a layer of utility tape. Heavy or light? She asked. We go in heavy, Matt said. Except Linda. Linda started to object, but he explained, we'll need you to hang back and cover us with your sniper rifle. I want you fast and deadly. Take a close-range weapon, extra ammo, and whatever you need to keep your sniper rifle working in the field. Roger, Linda said. Her voice was cold, hard, and brittle. This was the voice Matt had heard as she reported in while sniping targets around the team. Matt sometimes found it a little too cold, but he knew this was a good sign. Linda was preparing to do what she did best kill with a single shot. The rest of us will take whatever we can carry. Once we're in I have a feeling we won't be able to come back. If we have to, we can always lighten our load. Matt grabbed a battle rifle and, for close use, a pair of submachine guns. He took a pair of silencers for the SMGs and hip holsters for the smaller weapons. He picked up a dozen frag grenades in their plastic ring carrier and slotted that into the left thigh section of his armor. He'd need ammunition, a lot of it if things got hot. So he took extra clips for the SMGs and the battle rifle and taped them onto his chest, arms, and right thigh. More clips went into a backpack, along with two Lotus anti-tank mines, a few cans of C7 explosive, detonators, timers, two field first aid kits, and a fiber optic probe. While the rest of Blue Team got their gear together, Matt told them, stay off the comm from now on. They all nodded. Lead lining or not, they were close to too many listening covenant ears to take any more chances with the comm. He moved to the still open port hatch, slid the fiber optic probe outside, and plugged it into his helmet. Grainy images appeared on his heads-up display. Hundreds of Covenant ships swarmed into view. In their midst, a speck glowed and grew larger until Matt saw it was a ship of similar design to their own two ushipped hulls, each the size of their dropship, sat on top of one another. This ship accelerated toward them and separated, one part moved to their dropship's stern and the other drifted to the nose. The clanging of metal on metal reverberated through the hull, and Matt felt a gentle motion in the pit of his stomach. He looked back and passed on a thumbs up to John, indicating that their tow had arrived, and John passed this signal on to the rest of the team. On the fiber optic feed, Matt saw that the Covenant tug maneuvered them through the fleet, up, over, and around ships a hundred times their size. 
There was a moment when they dived and there was nothing on screen save the stars and black of space. Matt got a glimpse of the gold-colored star on his heads-up display. And then the video feed moved over to a planet that was smeared with clouds of sulfur dioxide and an orbiting moon of silver. The tug turned to face a new ship in the distance. This vessel looked like two teardrop-shaped covenant ships that had collided, giving the result an overall elongated figure eight geometry. They moved toward this ship, and Matt made out more details. Spokes radiated from the narrow midpoint of the vessel and connected to a slender ring that he hadn't seen before because they had approached facing it edge and feather-like tubes extended from either bulbous section and moved slowly over that central wheel. Matt squinted to make out more details on this unusual ship, but he was already at maximum resolution. It had a ring. Was it rotating? But the Covenant had gravitational technology. They didn't need rotating sections to simulate gravity. Then he saw something recognizable on the structure tiny ships docked to that ring. Covenant cruisers and carriers. There must have been 60 connected to the central hub. The titanic perspective of this structure clicked into place. The carriers looked like toys. The twin teardrop shapes had to be 30 kilometers end to end. This could only be the Covenant Commandant Control Center, the unyielding Hierophant. The tug moved directly toward the station. It was precisely where they had to go, so it was a lucky break, but ironically, it was also the last place Matt wanted to be. There was no telling what kind of sensors the unyielding Hierophant had, but they couldn't take chances. Matt retreated into the dropship and eased the hatch shut. He moved deeper into the ship and waited with the rest of Blue Team. Three minutes ticked by on his mission clock, Matt tried to control his breathing and focus his mind. Gravity settled his stomach, and there was a series of metallic clatters along the hull. Atmosphere hissed in through the cracks of their breached ship. Matt pointed at Fred and Grace and then to the starboard hatch. They leveled their rifles and moved. He pointed to Linda and himself, then the port hatch, and they also moved into position. Matt wasn't sure what kind of reception waited for them on the other side of those hatches, but one thing was certain, they'd have to face it heathen. There was nowhere to hide inside the reinforced and took cramped interior of their dropship. The port hatch cracked and squeaked open. Linda and Matt aimed their rifles. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 79 Ambush. Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 79 Ambush. Location Tau Seti System, aboard Covenant Battle Station Unyielding Hierophant. September 13, 2552, 0610 hours. A rubbery tentacle reached in along the seam of the dropship's hatch. Matt raised his hand and signaled Linda to stand down. He recognized the alien limb, the splitting cilia feelers and globular sensory organs could belong only to a Covenant engineer. The engineer pushed open the hatch and entered the ship, floating past Matt and Linda as if they weren't there. It chittered and squawked as it ran its tentacles over the foreign armor plates and splatters of lead. Two more engineers bolted through the open hatch and joined the first. As long as they left the single-minded aliens to their work, they wouldn't raise an alarm. But what else was out there? Matt eased against the frame of the hatch and slid the fiber optic probe outside. There was a line of dropships, seraph fighters, and other single ships that stretched away into the shadows. Swarms of engineers, thousands of the creatures, hovered and drifted throughout the area. They moved parts, disassembled and reassembled sections of ship hulls, and plumbed plasma coils. There was no trace of a welcome party of elites waiting for Blue Team. Matt turned the optic probe up and saw a latticework deck overhead with tools, welders, and spotlights hanging like jungle vines. It was as good a place as any to get their bearings. Matt turned and pointed at Linda and Will, then out the hatch and up. They nodded and moved out. Five seconds later acknowledgement lights from Blue 4 and 5 winked on. It was safe for the rest of them. Matt grabbed the upper lip of the hatchway and flipped up onto the top of the dropship. He grabbed a dangling cord and pulled himself onto the latticework deck where Will and Linda perched, watching and making sure the bay was clear. John, Grace, and Fred disembarked and scrambled silently up into the darkness, joining them. Matt pointed two fingers at his eyes and then made a flat fan motion across the space of the bay. The Spartans moved to carefully skin the area. From his shadowy overview, Matt saw that this place was a reparandrophid facility, with slots for hundreds of single ships. 
The room curved out of view 300 meters in either direction. It must run the circumference of the station's hub. Apart from the thousands of busy engineers, Matt spotted only two grunts wearing white methane breather masks. It was not a color designation he had seen before. They pushed carts containing barrels of sloshing fluids. They would be easy to avoid. One side of the bay had a series of sealed doors that he presumed led to airlocks. The opposite wall of the bay had a meter-thick window through which poured an intense blue light. Every 30 meters along that transparent wall was a recessed alcove. Overflowing from the nearest alcove were purple polyhedral cargo barrels, old charred plasma coils, and plates of the silver-blue covenant alloy. But what piqued Matt's interest was what was next to this pile of junk a holographic terminal. Matt clicked his comm to get Blue Team's attention, pointed to the junk pile, held up two fingers, and then pointed again at the alcove. Everyone nodded, understanding his order. Fred and Linda silently dropped to the deck, ran across the bay, and melted into the shadows behind a cut section of the hull. Grace followed. Matt looked up and down and side to side across the bay, making sure no grunts were visible. He, John, and Will crossed and took cover behind a plasma coil the size of a warthog light reconnaissance vehicle. He used both hands to point at Fred and Linda, turned his hand so they pointed to himself, and then nodded to the data terminal. Linda lay flat and slithered to the edge of the alcove shadows on his right. Fred took the left. They would cover him while he moved to the terminal. Matt reached to the back of his neck and pulled Crystal's chip from his skull. He crawled on his stomach, hugging the wall until he got to the terminal. He slid Crystal's chip into the input slot and then eased back into the shadows. I'm in, Crystal reported over the comm. I have secured our own channel and encrypted the signal so we're free to use the inter-team comm. Good work, Matt told her. Is there a central reactor in this station? How well defended is it? Stand by. I have to move carefully. There are Covenant security AIs in this system. Matt hoped that this copy of Crystal's infiltration routines was as good as the real Crystal. I have schematics for the station, she told him. The good news is, each lobe has a central reactor complex with 512 etterwatt units similar in design to the pinch fusion reactors on their ships. Apparently, this energy is used to power a shield generator that can repel the collision of a small moon. I can overload one reactor, causing the melting of its field coils, which will saturate the surrounding. Will it explode? Matt asked impatiently. Yes, an explosion of sufficient force to vaporize both sections. That's the good news. What's the bad news? The reactor's control system is isolated. I cannot reach it from this terminal. You will have to physically deliver me there. Where is it there? The nearest reactor control access point is 7 kilometers farther into the station's top lobe. Matt considered this. If they were careful and lucky, it might be possible. Is there a way to leave you in the central system until we need you? He asked. It would be handy to have you monitor the Covenant security systems. The duplicate crystal was silent a full three seconds. There is a way, she finally replied. When I was copied from the original crystal, the duplicating software was copied as well. It becomes an inseparable part of all subsequent copies. I can use this to copy myself into this system. Perfect. There are risks, however, Crystal told him. Each successive copy contains aberrations that I cannot correct. There may be unforeseen complications associated with using a copy of a copy. Do it, Matt ordered. I'll take that chance. But I'm not willing to take a chance on crossing seven kilometers behind enemy lines without a way to bypass their security systems. Stand by. Crystal said, working. A minute ticked off Matt's mission timer. Then the data chip ejected from the terminal. Done, Crystal said over the inter-team comm. I'm in. There's an exit to this bay 30 meters to your left. I will black out the security cameras there and open the door in 20 seconds. Hurry. Matt retrieved the chip and reinserted it into his skull. There was a flash of cold mercury in his mind. Move out, Matt told Blue Team. Stay low. Fred's and Linda's acknowledgement lights flickered, indicating the way was clear. Blue team ran, crouching, for 30 meters. A small access panel slid open, they piled through, then the door snapped shut behind them. They proceeded, hunched over, they crawled on their hands and knees, on their stomachs, and through ducting so tight they had to shut down their shields and scrape by on bare armor over metal. For kilometers they followed Crystal's directions, halting as she ran motion sensors through diagnostics until they passed. Twisting and turning and shimmying down long lengths of pipe, dodging the giant blades of circulation fans, and edging by transformer coils so close that sparks arced across their shields. 
According to Matt's mission timer, they had followed this route for 11 hours when it deadened. New welds, Fred said, running his gauntlet over the seams in the alloy plate blocking their path. Crystal broken over the comm, it must be a repair not logged into the station manifest, Matt said. Options. Crystal replied, I have only limited mission planning routines. There are three obvious options. You can blow the obstructing plate with a Lotus anti-tank mine. You can return to the repair bay where we might find a less obvious way in. Or there is a faster, alternative route, but it has drawbacks. Time is running out, Matt said. The Covenant isn't going to stick around much longer before they strike Earth. Give me the faster route. Backtrack 400 meters, turn bearing Zirinanezero, proceed another 20 meters, and exit through a waste access cover. From there you will move in the open for 700 meters, pass through a structure, and then down a guarded corridor to the reactor chambers. Grace interrupted, what do you mean, in the open? This is a space station, there should be no open spaces. See for yourself, Crystal said. A schematic of the open space appeared on their heads-up displays. Matt wasn't able to make much sense of the diagram, but he could tell there were several catwalks, buildings, and even waterways, as Crystal indicated. Lots of open areas for them to be seen in. Let's take a look, Matt said. He led his team back the way they had come and pushed open the waste access duct. Blue light flooded the tunnel. Matt blinked and let his eyes adjust, then pushed the fiber optic probe through the opening. Matt didn't understand what he saw, the optical probe must have malfunctioned. The image looked impossibly distorted, but there was no motion nearby, so he risked poking his head out. He was at the end of an alley with walls towering 10 meters to either side, casting dark shadows over the waste access hole. A group of jackals passed the mouth of the alley only 5 meters from his position. He ducked, and none of the vulture-like creatures saw him in the dark. When they passed he looked up and saw that the fiber optic probe had not been broken after all. The space station was hollow inside, and a light beam shot lengthwise through its center a blue light that provided full daylight illumination. Along the curved inner surface were needle-thin spires, squat stair-step pyramids, and columned temples. Catwalks with moving surfaces crisscrossed the space, as did tubes with capsules that whisked passengers. Water flowed along the walls in inward spiral patterns and then waterfalled up into great hollow towers that sprouted from the opposite wall. Banshees flew in formation through the center space of the great room, as did flocks of headless birds and great clouds of butterflies. It could have been an Escher etching come to life. Matt felt extreme vertigo for a moment. Then he understood that with advanced covenant gravity technology, there didn't have to be an up or down here. Odd that a military station would have so much unnecessary ornamentation. Yet Fleet HQ had a large atrium in their lobby. Maybe this was the Covenant equivalent, multiplied a hundredfold. Matt spied a band of translucent material set into a far wall, glistening. Is that the window to the repair bays, Crystal? Correct, she replied. Then at least we know the way out. And the structure we need to enter. One o'clock, she said. The one with the carved columns. It is the most direct route to the reactor chambers. Matt moved out of the hole and hugged the nearby wall. The shadows in the bright daylight would do a decent job of camouflaging them. Okay, blue team. Get oriented, as much as you can. Our target is the columned building at 1 o'clock. I make it out to be a 300-meter sprint across open ground. We'll make a break for it. Unless anyone has a better plan. Linda emerged, looked around, and said, permission to post on the rooftop and provide cover. Do it, Matt said. Let me know when you're in position and ready. Linda retrieved a padded grappling hook and rope from her pack, twirled it, and tossed it up and over the adjacent roof. She tugged it once, it caught, and then she quickly ascended. The remaining Spartans joined Matt in the shadows. He shouldered his battle rifle and thumbed the safety off. Linda's acknowledgement light winked once. Matt tensed and ran. It took him three strides to build to his top speed sprint. His adrenaline spiked and it made his blood burn. He felt time slow his perception running at an overclocked pace. He focused on speed, putting one foot in front of the other. His boots dug into cobblestones, crushed rock, and sent a fine spray of gravel behind him. He saw three obstacles in his path a group of startled grunts. He slammed the butt of his rifle into the nearest one and crushed its skull. The dead grunt spun end over end and landed in a heap. He heard squawks and shouts around him but didn't stop to look. He was on the stairs of the building, worn smooth stone steps that he bounded up five at a time. Matt saw three friendly contacts behind him on his motion tracker, and at the periphery of its range a solid mass of enemy contacts. 
You're good so far, Linda reported. There are elites, but they're unarmed. No, wait. A hunter pair is advancing on your position. Stand by. A quartet of shots split the air like thunderclaps. Threat neutralized, Linda said. The rest of them are scattering. Banshee's approaching. I'm moving. Matt cleared the stairs and skidded to a halt on the threshold of the temple. The interior was cold, external temperature readings were near freezing. Light filtered in through stained glass windows in the ceiling, tinged lavender, cobalt, and turquoise. Three rows of giant columns made of blue-black basalt ran the length of the 30-meter-long rectangular structure, casting long shadows. It was a good place for an ambush. He set his back against one of the pillars and swept the entrance, covering his team as they entered. Crystal, update on station security, Matt said. There are dozens of reports on the security channels. I've got them covered. Another crystal voice broke in over the first also be advised, Commander, that there are ceremonial guards in this temple, a race we have not encountered before. Roughly translated from Covenant dialects, they are called brutes. They shouldn't be a significant threat or they would have been used in previous military situations. Matt wasn't so sure of that. The name Brute didn't sound promising. He also wondered why there now seemed to be more than one crystal in the station system, but that could wait. They had to keep moving now that they had revealed their position. He waved blue team forward. Matt took point. He moved up to the next column in the middle of the building. Fred and Will stepped over to the columns on either side behind Matt. John and Grace had their backs. There was a flicker on his motion sensor, just ahead. It vanished. Matt held up his hand. Blue team froze. His motion detector was clear, but there had been something there. He pulled out a frag grenade. The transient contact was back. A shadow moved around the same pillar Matt used for cover. It moved faster than an elite, as fast as Matt. He fired his rifle point blank into the shadowy silhouette. It didn't slow, it only howled with rage. John, Will, and Fred fired three round bursts from their rifles into the creature. It flinched with each bullet impact. Three explosions detonated behind them. Grace's biosign alarm shrilled and flashed on Matt's heads-up display. Ambush will cried out. The creature Crystal had called a brute stepped from the shadows and faced Matt. It was taller than an elite, wider and more muscular. Its mouth was lined with razor-sharp teeth, and its red eyes burned with hate. Its blue-gray skin was riddled with bullet holes. The brute tackled Matt, knocking his weapon from his grasp. Even with his Mjolnir armor, Matt was not as strong as the alien. It pounded on him with bare fists, broke through his shielding, grabbed his neck, and squeezed. Red flashes played across Matt's vision. He began to black out. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 80 Overload Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 80 Overload Location Tau Seti System, aboard Covenant Battle Station Unyielding Hierophant. September 13, 2552, 1751 hours. Matt struggled and tried to pry the hands from his throat. The tendons in the brute's forearms were solid bands of steel, and the creature was so determined to rip Matt's head off that a full clip from a rifle into its chest hadn't even slowed it down. Behind him, Matt felt another explosion thunder through the stone floor, followed by the staccato rattle of rifle fire. Blue Team was busy with another threat. He was on his own. Matt blinked. The darkness dimming the edge of his vision wouldn't clear. Matt watched his shield bar flicker and sluggishly recharge. If it built up enough repulsive force, he might have a chance to wriggle out of the brute's grasp. If he tried too quickly, though, the brute wouldn't lose its grip and could pound his shield flat again. The brute bellowed, and globules of spittle spattered onto Matt's visor. It leaned closer, screwing its massive hands tighter around his throat. Matt's vision narrowed. His windpipe swelled, and he gagged. Shields were at a one-a-quarter charge. It'd have to be enough. Matt had been in similar death grip holds before, endless hours of training on the wrestling mats with his teammates and martial arts specialists provided by Chief Mendez. There were ways to escape a larger, stronger opponent. And there were always countermoves to those escapes. And countermoves to those counters. It was like a game of chess, except the pieces were arms and legs, torque in your center of mass, and most importantly your mind. He pulled his knees to his chest and tucked his torso toward his pelvis at the same time. 
He twisted 90 degrees and shot out both legs and arms, and uncoiled his body. The maneuver was called shrimping. Matt's head slipped from the brute's grasp. He used the monster's split second of disorientation to scramble onto its back. Matt brought his elbow down on the base of the brute's neck. He swept out its elbow, wrenched the joint around, and pushed it as far as it would go, far past the point any humans or elites would have snapped. Matt scissored his legs wide and pushed against the floor, leveraging his body to keep the brute pinned. It growled and pushed itself and Matt up with its one free arm. No. You. Don't. Matt still clutched a frag grenade in his left hand. He flicked the arming pin, reached around and under, and thrust it into the brute's belt, then withdrew, sweeping out its one arm holding them up. The brute dropped onto the floor and screamed with rage. The grenade detonated. It lifted them both a meter, and they landed again, this time accompanied by a wet, pulpy smack as the brute's dead hulk slammed into the ground. Matt rolled off and sprang to his feet and looked for Blue Team. The large pillars blocked his view, but he saw on his motion tracker that Fred and John was behind a pillar down and to Matt's left, and will behind the pillar to the right. There was no tag indicating Grace's location. There were, however, blurry motion contacts beyond the wide arched entrance to the temple. And there was one other thing, neither Will, John, or Fred checked Matt's status over the comm. That silence meant trouble. Matt fumbled for his fiber optic probe, but it had been lost in the scuffle with the brute. He eased around the basalt pillar. Grace lay face first on the floor, five meters from the temple entrance. A puddle of hydrostatic gel and blood spread across the floor. Matt clicked the comm once, a status query. The instant he did this, two brutes wheeled from their cover on either side of the entrance archway. They held rifles with large caliber muzzles and padded stocks, fixed with razor-edged blades. One of the brutes saw Matt, aimed, and fired. Matt darted back behind the basalt pillar. He saw the flash and thunder of a grenade launched from the weapon, heard two more rounds fired immediately after that. The first grenade impacted on the opposite side of the pillar and exploded. The overpressure rattled his teeth. Matt turned and dived, hoping to get behind the next stone column before. The second and third grenades impacted and detonated on the pillar he had stood behind a split second before. The solid stone crumbled into fist-sized chunks. He skidded and scrambled for cover as the upper part of that column collapsed, raining stones that shattered the floor, and would have crushed him. So much for engaging these brutes in a direct assault. Matt wasn't up for another round of wrestling, either. Not with the clock ticking. Not with every covenant on this station about to tear them to pieces. Complicating all this was the enemy's apparent ability to locate them when they used the comm. That only left one tactical option run. He wasn't going to leave Grace behind, though. Not until he knew for certain she was dead. He removed his backpack and took out one of his two Lotus anti-tank mines. The disc was a quarter meter across with spikes set along the rim to stabilize it when buried. He set the detonation selector to countdown mode, seven seconds. He then slid around the edge of the column. He threw the mine with a flick of his wrist. It spun in a wide arc across the temple hall and embedded into the wall just over the entrance archway. Two seconds until it blew. Matt clicked on his comm and said fire in the hole. The brutes again wheeled around from their cover and leveled their deadly grenade launchers. The lotus mine detonated. It was a flash and an instant of fire. The temple opening and brutes vanished, replaced by a cloud of dust and a cascade of stones that fell from the ceiling. One gray arm remained exposed under the rubble, still flexing. Matt moved up. The entrance was sealed. They were safe for a few seconds. He knelt next to Grace. Her bias signs had flatlined. He tried to roll her upright, but there was no need. The detonations he had heard while wrestling the first brute had been three of their high-velocity grenades, which had blown Grace's midsection apart. John, Fred, and Will emerged from their cover. Matt looked at them and shook his head. Matt opened the tiny access panel on Grace's armor power pack and entered the failsafe code. They still had a mission to finish, which meant they couldn't carry her out, it would slow them down too much. They wouldn't be leaving her for the Covenant either, though. Her armor's tiny fusion reactor would overload and burn everything within a 10-meter radius, Grace's funeral pyre. Let's move, Matt said. Crystal, which way? Proceed into the temple 30 meters. Turn right. There will be a sealed doorway, an access hatch for engineers. I will open it and lock it behind you. Hurry. I'm encountering increased resistance from the station's AIs. While I have their security comm channels blocked, word of intruders is speeding via private comms. There was a curious echo to her voice. 
Maybe it was feedback from the covenant triangulating on their signals. Or maybe there was some other effect at work. What had she warned him about? Unforeseen complications using a copy of a copy of Crystal. Roger that, he said and waved John, Fred, and Will forward. He took one last look at Grace, then marched quickly and silently ahead. There were no more motion contacts in the temple. Matt, however, saw grunts and jackals, elites and hunters in murals painted on the walls. In the shadows and stained glass filtered light, those pictures seemed to move. They genuflected to something farther ahead. Matt wished he had more time to take a full video record. Blue team moved 30 meters and turned to face a section of the wall. It parted. The passage could have fit two engineers side by side, but Matt had to crouch and turn sideways to pass. John, Will, and Fred followed. Crystal sealed the door behind them. They continued until the narrow passage turned 90 degrees and dropped straight down. Will attached a rope and they rappelled down a hundred meters, landing on a platform. Matt overlooked a cavern hewn from rough stone that arched up 90 meters and vanished into the shadows in the distance. 512 fusion reactors that looked like flatted spiral seashells filled the space, stacked in rows and columns eight deep. Each was the size of a pelican dropship and thrummed with power, casting off waves of wavering heat. The open areas between the reactors were a tangle of plasma conduits and alive with swarms of thousands of buoyant engineers as they tended the machinery. Faint wispy borealis comprised of escaped plasma swirled, whipped into a luminous froth by the intense magnetic vortices within the chamber. It was a tremendous feat of engineering. It was as if the station's builders had hewn this from a seed asteroid and built the rest of the installation around it. Will pointed across the room to three jackals who walked along a catwalk. Blue team held position and didn't move. There, Cortana announced. Across the platform is a terminal on the reactor subsystem. Matt held up a hand to John, Will, and Fred, waited for the jackal guards to pass, and then sprinted across the platform. He removed Crystal's chip and inserted it into the terminal. After three seconds, she reported I'm in. Very few Covenant counter-intrusion measures in this system. I can accomplish the overload. I found an exit route for Blue Team and uploaded it into your NAV systems, she continued. It should be stealthy enough for you to return to the repair bay undetected. Once there, give me the order and I can begin. It will take 10 minutes for the overload to build. There's no stopping once I start this, Commander, so be sure. This station and the Covenant fleet might jump to Earth in the next 10 minutes, Matt said. He looked to Fred, John, and Will, and they nodded as if they could read his mind. Proceed with the overload now, Crystal. The light from the reactor shifted, blue plasma tinged white and spread like a poison through the interconnecting conduits. Overload commencing, the copy of Crystal announced. I suggest blue team move at top speed to the exit. A NAV triangle indicated a ladder that ran to the catwalk overhead. Matt held up two fingers at John, Will, and Fred and then nodded to the patrolling jackals. Fred, Will, and John knelt, braced, and waited for him to go ahead. Matt climbed the ladder. As he neared the top, three shots rang out behind him. The sound was nearly drowned out by the intensifying reverberations from the reactors. He cleared the top of the ladder and saw three dead jackals on the catwalk. He swept both directions with his rifle and then waved John, Will, and Fred forward. His countdown timer read 9.47. The heat and light from the reactors grew stronger, and Matt's shields flared slightly. Blue team jogged down the catwalk to an elevator. They got inside, the doors closed, and the car immediately ascended. When the doors opened again, artificial blue sunlight filled the car, as did the shadows cast by two elites waiting for the elevator. Blue team opened fire and cut down the elites, leaving a spray of blood across the ground. Matt edged around the frame of the elevator door and saw a tangle of pipes and fountains and one of the curious spiral waterways that fell up from its center. This was a heat exchange plant for the reactors below. Already the water in the canal steamed and boiled. He saw that Covenant Elite and Hunter pairs had converged at the entrance to the temple a hundred meters to his right. Over the temple, dozens of banshee flyers circled the carnage. A gang of grunts managed to clear an opening to the temple. There was a flash of light and fire that roiled out in a long plume, burning them as well as their elite overseers. Goodbye, Grace, Matt whispered. The detonation of her power pack would buy them more time while the Covenant forces tried to figure out what just happened, perhaps they'd think Blue Team was still inside the temple. Grace had also taken out a dozen grunts and four elites with her last action. That would have pleased her. 
Matt turned toward the far end of the great room and spotted a band of translucent material on the far wall. It led to the repair bays and airlocks beyond. That was their exit. He glanced at his mission timer 842. They'd have to get there fast. His gaze locked onto the banshees in the air. He searched for Linda, posted somewhere in the odd geometry of this station. She could be anywhere along several kilometers of the cityscape. Matt clicked on his comm. Linda, do not reply. The Covenant are triangulating on our signals. I'm hoping they do and send a few of those banshees to reconnoiter. When they get close to the heat exchange plant, take them out, we'll need their vehicles. There was no answer. Did that mean Linda understood and was in a position to help? Or was she dead? As Matt hoped, four banshees peeled off the search formation, circling the temple and turning toward them. Matt waved Fred, Will, and John out of the elevator and into the forest of steaming pipes. They scattered, took cover, and aimed at the incoming banshees. The banshees spread out, slowed, but then banked, returning to the temple. Matt clicked his comm three times. The elite pilots immediately wheeled about and accelerated toward their position. One banshee flyer nosed into a classic strafing dive. Its plasma cannons warmed and crackled with energy, indicating an imminent discharge. There was a spray of blood in the flyer, then the pilot fell forward and pushed the accelerator to full. The banshee careened through the air at maximum velocity crashing into a water recovery tower and wobbled to the ground. Linda, Matt muttered and tried to spot her. Judging from the blood spray, she'd managed to send a round through the tiny exposed area of the cockpit, and inflicted a lethal ricochet. He looked for her position, most likely the shot had come from behind and above. There were numerous catwalks running across the length of the massive room. She had to be on one of them. The three remaining banshees accelerated toward Blue Team. Their plasma cannons flickered, and they leveled into a flat trajectory. Matt, John, Fred, and Will raised their rifles. There was two quick muted cracks of a sniper rifle, another banshee, and then a second drifted to the ground, its pilot felled by Linda's uncanny skill. The last remaining pilot veered to starboard, not knowing what had just taken out its two wingmates, only that it had to get out of the area if it was going to live. In the tightest arc of its curve, the craft slowed. Matt couldn't tell precisely where the shot came from, but a third sniper round ricocheted through the craft's cockpit. The banshee spun in circles before it thumped to a halt, nose down in the street. Four impossible shots, four kills. Even for Linda, this was superb shooting, the finest shots Matt had ever seen from her. He looked around the station, over the buildings, spires, catwalks, transit tubes, it was impossible to spot her. Matt waved John, Fred, and will toward three of the down banshees and sprinted toward the one still spinning riderless in the street, its canards scraping and sparking along the stones. He climbed aboard, pushed the throttle forward, and pointed to the far wall. He held his hand flat and lowered it, indicating that Will, John, and Fred should skim low to the ground. Matt veered off in a wide arc. Maybe he could divert the attention away from them. He rose slightly higher and buzzed the tops of gilt domes and statues of elite heroes with raised swords. Grunts and jackals scattered as he approached, and Matt fired at them. He shifted to the side as he splashed through water falling from one side of the station to the other. For banshee flyers fell in behind him. Matt weaved back and forth. A pair of plasma bolts sizzled over his head. He risked a look over his shoulder and saw two of the banshees drop away. A moment later they crashed into the surface. Linda still had his back covered. He dropped to the ground and skimmed along a street, skidded, and turned into an alley. Banshee shadows passed overhead. He pushed the throttle to full and made a direct run toward the back wall. John, Will, and Fred had grounded their flyers and crouched next to the meter-thick window separating this intersection from the repair bays. Matt settled his banshee next to theirs, turned his backpack around, reached in, and tossed John his last Lotus anti-tank mine. Get that on the window and set for a remote trigger. He then risked an open comm channel to the copy of Crystal in the station's system. Crystal, can you open the air locks in the repair bay? A flurry of voices filled the comm, all speaking at the same time, shouting to be heard over one another, all Crystal's voices. One finally broke through. Commander, I've spun off a copy dedicated exclusively to communicate with you. Go ahead. How many copies are there of you? Unknown. Hundreds. The Covenant AI overwhelmed me. Had to. This is difficult. Many errors in my systems. Filtering overall subchannels of information. She paused. To answer your initial question, yes. I can override safety lockouts and open the airlocks. My systems are fragmenting. 
I cannot exist in a coherent state much longer. Matt looked out across the kilometers of curving cityscape. Wraith tanks rolled into the streets, legions of grunts, jackals, and elites raced from building to building and shot at targets that weren't there. Banshees and ghosts buzzed through the air like clouds of flies. Matt's mission countdown timer read 745. Linda's back there, he told John, Fred, and Will. John started to say something, but Matt cut him off. If I'm not back in three minutes, blow that window and exit. John hesitated but then nodded. I can't leave her, Matt said and gunned his banshee's throttle. Not if she's still alive. Dr. Halsey's last words to him resonated in Matt's mind I should have been trying to save every single human life, no matter what it cost. He'd get to Linda. He'd get her out alive, or die trying. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 81 Explosive Exit Authors note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 81 Explosive Exit Location Tau Seti System, aboard Covenant Battle Station Unyielding Hierophant September 13, 2552, 1820 hours Matt accelerated his banshee to its top speed. There was another explosion at the temple and plumes of steam geysered into the air from the heat exchange plant. The circling formations of banshees scattered. Matt tucked as close as he could to his flyer's fuselage and coaxed every bit of speed from the craft. A pair of banshees swooped in, one off his port, the other on his starboard. Their plasma weapons heated, Matt rolled back and forth to throw their aim. He braced for impact, but there was none. Matt craned his head back and saw the pilot of the lead banshee slump, slide off the flyer, and plummet to the ground. The trailing banshee was riderless as well, only a blood-spattered cockpit and cowling. Linda still had him covered, had taken out both pilots with precise fire. She had to be close. Matt scanned the area. There were spires and water reclamation towers, transport tubes, and catwalks that crisscrossed the center of the interior. There was a nexus of walkways near the beam of illumination that ran down the center of the station, a location with enough glare that a sniper might hide in the open undetected. He risked keying Linda's private comm channel. Thought you might need a ride, so I. An energy mortar blasted over Matt's shoulder, burning the air like a sun in close orbit and draining his shields to half. It impacted a water tower, and the structure detonated into a cloud of blinding steam. Matt punched the banshee through the cloud, glanced down, and saw a wraith tank tracking his trajectory. He ducked and weaved but kept moving toward Linda's probable location. His mission countdown timer read 706. There was no time for fancy evasive maneuvers. Did Linda even want to be found? Maybe she wanted him to get to safety and leave her behind. It's what he would have done. Position report, Linda, Matt barked over the comm. That's a direct order. Three seconds ticked off his mission clock and then the six-tone Oli Oli Oxen free song whistled through Matt's speakers and a NAV marker appeared on his heads-up display. The triangular marker centered on a rope that ran between two transit tubes and dangled perilously close to the high-intensity light beam. It was a barely discernible thread that ran through a hard shadow cast by a nearby catwalk. Matt hit his image enhancers. Through the glare of the light, and in the depths of the shadow, he caught the flicker of reflected optics. Linda used both the brilliant light and the darkness to hide. Matt angled the banshee to her. He clipped the tether line from his belt to the frame of the banshee and squeezed his thighs tighter onto the seat. When he was 30 meters away, he made visual contact. Linda had the rope coiled about a boot and wrapped about one forearm. She held her sniper rifle in one arm, and Matt could only surmise that she had been firing from such an impossible position. She uncoiled the rope from her boot, swung, released at the apex of the arc, and fell toward him. Matt forced the banshees cowling up against straining hydraulics and stretched out his arm, his fingers touched hers, and her hand slapped firmly into his gauntlet. He swung her around and over his shoulder. Linda landed in front of him, straddling the seat. Matt spun the banshee about and accelerated back to the windows. The craft's forward cowling remained wrenched up and slowed them down, but there was no other way to fit two people on the craft. Coming in hot, Matt said over the comm to John, Fred, and Will. Open the door and get ready for a quick exit, blue team. A trio of acknowledgement lights winked on. Crystal, breach those airlocks. Now. A cacophony of voices filled Matt's calm. 
There were so many copies of Crystal speaking at the same time he couldn't make out anything coherent. Crystal, the airlocks. There was a pop of static. Apologies, Commander, Crystal replied. I've spun off a dedicated copy to, to, speak with you. Matt thought she had already made a copy to talk directly with him. What had happened to it? Override the airlock safeties, Crystal. Open the external and repair bay doors. Working, Commander. There's too much system comm traffic. So many of us, near saturation level, have to fight to get. Stand by. An explosion appeared a kilometer away along the far wall. The Lotus Antitank mine became a blossom of flame and black smoke that drifted and diffused and left a spider web of cracks on the meter-thick translucent section. But the window held. That Lotus Antitank mine could have sheared through that wall even if it had been reinforced steel, but this wall had remained in one piece. They were stuck inside. 300 meters to the window. Crystal. In Matt's peripheral vision he saw clouds of banshees and ghost flyers gaining on them. Crystal, it's now or never. I in. Crystal's voice was faint. Intersystem failure 08934EE. Global system error 9845W. Resetting. Inner doors open. Override in progress. System locked o. The comm went dead. A hundred meters away, beyond the cracked window, the atmosphere turned white for a split second then cleared. Spaced every 20 meters along the bay walls, the airlock doors were opening. Beyond, stars shone upon velvet black. Fred and Will's banshees appeared off Matt's starboard canard while John appeared off his port. Matt pointed and together they dived, accelerating toward a bullseye pattern of cracks on the translucent portion of the wall. That web of fissures spread fingers that stretched and split along the length of the window, slowed and stopped. Matt fired the banshee's plasma cannons. John opened fire as well, and four blobs of plasma splashed across the glassy surface 50 meters away. The window flexed, crackled, tiny flakes popped off, but the translucent material remained stubbornly intact. Matt was 30 meters from the surface, he'd have to veer off now, or impact upon it. He gritted his teeth and braced himself. 10 meters. The window's smooth surface flashed into a jigsaw mosaic. The squealing of glass over glass filled the air. It shattered. The entire length crumbled and instantly blasted into the vacuum of space, swept out by the pressurized atmosphere filling the interior of the station. Matt tried to maneuver the banshee. He bounced into the repair bay, rolled the craft over an upright, fell off, tumbled through the airlock, and drifted away into the darkness of space. He flailed his limbs in the zero gravity and the tether on his belt snapped tautly. He recoiled back toward the banshee. Linda held on with one hand and held out the other to him. He climbed back aboard and tapped the thrusters to stabilize their pitch and yaw. Behind them, the station vented gas as well as the bodies of Covenant engineers, grunts, jackals, and elites. Clouds of metal junk bled from the ruptures. Tendrils of steam flash froze into glittering ice crystals. The Covenant fleet moved as well, some cruisers closed with the station, others moved farther away. There were 500 alien warships without leadership from their Commandant Control Center, and they reminded Matt of motes of dust in a sunbeam, silently floating in every direction. Matt spotted a dropship drifting a kilometer ahead, dead in space. He clicked his comm once and dropped a NAV marker onto a Covenant craft. Fred, Will, and John's acknowledgement lights winked on. Matt pulsed the Banshee's engines once and let its inertia carry them to the dropship. He hoped the rest of the Covenant fleet was trying to figure out what had just happened, and not paying any attention to one more piece of debris floating in space. The Banshees gently impacted onto the tumbling dropship. Matt grasped the hull, and Linda scrambled over him, opened the port access hatch, and entered. John, Fred, and Will drifted closer, and Matt helped them aboard. He hesitated and took another look at the Covenant fleet. Hundred of ships without control. But how long would that last? Even if the station's reactors chained and blew, the Covenant still had enough force to destroy Earth's defenses and burn it to a cinder. All they had done was buy a little time as long as it took for someone to take charge of the Covenant fleet. That wasn't enough, but Matt wasn't sure what else to do. He crawled to the hatch, entered the ship, and sealed it behind him. Linda stood at the pilot's console while Fred stood beside her manning the op station. An engine schematic appeared in front of Linda, and power pulsed through its plasma coils. The interior lights dimly glowed. Where to, Commander? Linda asked. Away, Matt said and looked at the system NAV display. He pointed to the tiny moon orbiting the nearby planet. Get us into the moon's shadow, but slow. Try not to attract any attention. 
His countdown timer read 512. They might still have time. Roger, Linda said. The dropship spun about and gently moved away from the station, almost imperceptibly accelerating toward the tiny moon covered with black and silver pockmarks. Fred hunched over his console. Thick spiky lines representing the Covenant Fruft bands fluxed and flickered on his screen. Covenant comm channels are jammed, he reported. Communiques and queries to and from every ship in the fleet wondering what the hell is going on. And the station's comm channels are all full of those copied crystals, and she's just repeating different system error codes. What's this? Matt asked, leaning over Fred's shoulder. He pointed to one comm band with only a single spike. Fred looked at the Covenant calligraphy for a long moment and then inhaled sharply. If the translation software is working right, he whispered, that's the Aband, it's one of ours. Fred snapped on the external speakers. Six tones beeped, stopped, and then repeated. Oli oli oxen free, Matt breathed. Send the countersign, Fred. I, Commander. Sending now. Who could have sent that signal? There was no other living Spartan in this system. Unless it was Dr. Halsey and Kelly. Had they somehow tracked them? It's about time you showed up. The drawling voice of Admiral Whitcomb was loud and clear over the comm. Switch to encryption scheme, Rainbow. Matt nodded to Fred, who ran a shunt from the Covenant comm into the data port in the back of his helmet. Decryption online, Fred reported. Admiral, Matt said. With all due respect, sir, why are you here? Lieutenant Haverson suggested we drop out of slipspace on the edge of the system, hide in the Oort cloud and gather a little intel. The Admiral sighed. Well... I took one look and figured that even if you took out that station, hell, son, there'd still be a couple of hundred Covenant ships within spitten distance of Earth. Me getting there and warning them about it wouldn't make a lick of difference. So I'm going to do something about it here and now. You've done your part, Commander. Leave the rest to me. There was a pause, then the Admiral asked in a low, serious tone, you did get it done, didn't you, son? You got that station rigged to blow. Yes, sir. Matt linked his mission timer to the comm. For minutes 32 seconds and counting. Perfect, Commander. Bring M on back to the barn. Stay on your heading. Your instincts are dead on. We're on the far side of the moon and are waiting for you. Matt motioned to Linda to increase their velocity. She pushed the acceleration stripe to three quarters power. Waiting, sir. Whitcomb over and out. The comm went dead. Matt looked to John, Will, Fred, and Linda, and they all shrugged. He pushed the acceleration stripe to full velocity, and the dropship entered a high orbit around the splotchy moon, arcing around to the far side, where the battered Gettysburg waited for them. But only the Gettysburg. Where's Ascendant Justice? Matt whispered. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 82 Get Us Out of Here. Authors note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 82 Get Us Out of Here Location Tau Seti System, aboard UNSC Vessel Gettysburg, near Covenant Battle Station Unyielding Hierophant. September 13, 2552, 1825 hours. Matt and Blue Team stepped off the lift and onto the bridge of the Gettysburg. Sir, Matt started to salute Admiral Whitcomb, but neither the Admiral nor Lieutenant Haverson was there. The only two on the bridge were Sergeant Johnson, who stared at the forward view screens, and Crystal, whose holographic figure burned bright blue and streamed with code symbols and mathematics beyond Matt's comprehension. Sergeant Johnson turned toward them. He looked the Spartans over and frowned, noting that not all of them had returned. I'm not sure what that thing is. The sergeant nodded to view screen one, centered on the Covenant Commandant Control Station. Don't look like any, uneven elephant, to me, more like two squid kissing. Whatever it is, damned glad it's going to blow up. Nice job, almost as good as if we sent in the Marines. One corner of his mouth quirked into a smile. Where's the Admiral? Matt asked. And Lieutenant Haverson and Cortana. The sergeant turned to John and reached into his belt pouch. The Admiral told me to give this to you, Chief he said as he handed John Cortana's chip. Thank you, Sergeant, John said. The sergeant's half-smile vanished, and his eyes darkened. He moved to weapons station one. I'll show you. A Clarion spy drone is nearly in position. The center view screen fuzzed with static and then resolved to show the Ascendant Justice moving out of the shadow of the moon. 
The once formidable Covenant flagship was a wreck, its hull was breached in a dozen places, its skeletal frame exposed, and only a handful of plasma conduits flickered with life. I don't understand, Matt said. He stepped closer to Crystal's hologram. Being near the real Crystal, not one of her fragmented copies, reassured him that everything was under control. What's going on? Stand by, Commander, she replied. I'm attempting to attune Ascendant Justice's slipspace drive to the Gettysburg's mass and profile. That's what we were up to while you were off sightseeing, the sergeant told him. We pulled the slipspace matrix out of our piggybacked ship and slapped it into the Gettysburg. Matt wheeled and faced the view screens. Ascendant Justice couldn't jump. Then why was it headed straight toward the Covenant fleet? A decoy. He glanced at the countdown timer 209 left. Not a decoy, he whispered, a lure. Sergeant, get a signal to Ascendant Justice. Bounce it off that spy drone if you have to. Roger, Commander, Sergeant Johnson said and tapped in commands. An error warning blared. He shook his head, puzzled, and tried again, carefully retyping. Linda, take the NAV station. Fred, you're on ops. Will, give the sergeant a hand at weapons one. John, you're with me. Blue team jumped to their assigned stations. Will edged the sergeant aside and quickly tapped three buttons. Com patch established, he reported. On view screen two. The bridge of Ascendant Justice appeared on view screen two. Lieutenant Haverson and Admiral Whitcomb stood on the central raised dais, adjusting the holographic controls. Behind them, the wall displays showed Covenant ships closing on their position. Admiral Whitcomb smiled. Glad to see you made it safely aboard, son. Sir, that fleet will destroy you before you can fire a single salvo. I don't think so, Commander, he replied and tapped the holographic display. A slim blue crystalline shard appeared, an exact copy of the alien artifact they found on Reach. I'm sending this image to every ship in the system and letting them know it's theirs for the taking, if they dare to board this ship and face Earth's best warriors. He laughed. I think that'll appeal to those elites and their overinflated sense of honor. Matt nodded. Yes, sir. It will. He looked at the countdown timer 142. The Covenant fleet turned and moved toward the incoming Ascendant Justice. A cloud of cruisers and carriers. Hundreds of them. Impossible odds. Fire turret 4, Lieutenant, the Admiral ordered. Firing Haverson replied, his face set in grim determination. A lance of plasma discharged, arced, and impacted upon the nose of the nearest carrier. The energy splashed over their shields and dissipated. Turret 5, Lieutenant. Take them down. Firing 5, Sir, Haverson said. A second plasma bolt followed the first. It blasted the carrier's weakened shields and melted armor and hull, exploding through the foredecks. The ship rolled and crashed into a cruiser that had come too close. Nice shooting, Lieutenant, the Admiral murmured. The Covenant fleet responded with a blinding volley of laser fire. Pinpoints of energy concentrated on Ascended Justice's aft decks, boiled armor off in thick layers, sheared through to the other side, severing its engines. The Admiral smiled. A sound tactical response. Good thing they don't know we're just using that slingshot around the moon and our inertia to do the rest of the job. He glanced at the displays and the station growing larger on them. Hang on, Lieutenant. Brace for impact. Ascendant Justice drifted closer to the station. It crashed into the central ring, crushing the structure, and continued forward, dimpling the hull of the pinched center section, and finally ground to a halt with its nose impaled within the unyielding hierophant. The center view screen on the bridge of the Gettysburg shattered into static and then slowly resolved. The wavering image of Admiral Whitcomb pulled himself upright. A gash from his temple to the corner of his mouth wept blood. Lieutenant Haverson groggily got to his feet as well, his arm held at an odd angle, broken. System-wide transmission, Admiral Whitcomb barked to Haverson. I, sir, Haverson said and clumsily adjusted the comm. Come on, mighty Covenant warriors, the Admiral shouted. We're here in the middle of your fleet with your Holy of Holies. He flicked his finger at the holographic shard, and it pinged as if actually struck. Come and get it, he laughed again. Hundreds of Covenant ships moved toward them. Grapple lines and grab beams attached to the broken hull of the Ascendant Justice. A thousand dropships and elites in thrust packs filled the space around the flagship. Matt watched the countdown timer 027. Along the 10-kilometer dorsal bulb of the space station, patches warmed to a dull red, the heat from the overloading reactors becoming outwardly visible. Move us back, Linda, Matt said. Keep us in the moon's shadow. Use as much power as we can spare. Aye, Commander, Linda replied. 
Forward thrusters answering Onet heard reverse power. Course 180. Crystal, he asked, slip space generator status. Almost ready, Commander, Crystal said. She bit her lower lip in concentration. Capacitor charge at 80%. Adjusting final calculations. Stand by. On screen, the Admiral wheeled toward the bulkhead sealing the flagship's bridge. Sparks cascaded along the seam as arc cutters on the other side penetrated. Commander, I have final orders for you. Sir, Matt said. You watch and see what's left of this rabble when we're done with them. Do not engage under any circumstances. You get the intel and hightail it back to Earth and make your report. Understood, sir. Now listen, son, remember when we talked about the Alamo? You know every one of the brave defenders in those fights died. They knew the odds, but they hurt the enemy. He gritted his teeth in pain. Both were tactical defeats, but in the end, they were also brilliant strategic victories. They made the enemy afraid. Just a few good soldiers fighting for what's right made the difference. Yes, sir. Matt remembered all those who had made a difference for him. Sam. James. CPO Mendez. Captain Keys. The men and women who had fought and died on Halo. And now two more names to add to that list Whitcomb and Haverson. The bulkhead blasted off its mounts and clattered onto the deck of the Ascended Justice's bridge. Silhouetted in the passage were dozens of elites, their energy swords blur of motion and light. Admiral Whitcomb fired a submachine gun. The central view screen dissolved into static. Matt watched for a moment, hoping the admiral and the lieutenant would reappear, but screen number two remained offline. Video feed from the Clarion spy drone filled the side screens. There were 200 warships clustered tightly about the figure-eight-shaped unyielding hierophant. A similar number of ships circled in loose orbital trajectories. The formation reminded Matt of a miniature spiral galaxy with a supernova core. The dorsal bulb of the space station shot with color, red, orange, and blurred with blue-white heat in a heartbeat. Plasma tendrils erupted from the surface like solar flares. Internal explosions chained down the station's length through the narrow center portion and into the ventral bulb, shattering that section and discharging bolts of lightning that arced along the station's fragments and to the nearby ships. The unyielding hierophant became a roiling cloud of fiery plasma and smoke and static charges that enveloped the ships that had come to engage Ascended Justice, ships that flashed white hot and, in an instant, vaporized. This thunderhead of superheated and pressurized gas ballooned outward to engulf the rest of the orbiting flotilla, heated their shields, which shimmered silver and popped like soap bubbles, melted their hulls and consumed them. The blast cooled and the cloud dissipated, but ejected debris continued outward, leaving comet trails, and impacted on stray ships, not near the epicenter. Move the drone back into the moon's shadow, Matt ordered. I, Commander, Will said. Thrusters responding. The side view screens showed a hailstorm of molten metal streaking toward the drone's cameras, then their view was obscured by the black can silver pockmarked surface of the tiny moon. Crystal, is the Gettysburg ready to jump? Matt asked. Slip space capacitors charged, Commander. Ready when you are. Stand by. Matt waited a minute. No one spoke. Will, bring the drone back out. Roger, Commander. The side view screen changed from moonscape to space. There was little left of the fleet or the Commandant Control Station, only clouds of smoke, glittering metal, and ashes. A few Covenant warships survived. Those that could slowly move away from the blast site, others drifted dead in space. Perhaps a dozen of their original 500 craft had come through the explosion. A brilliant strategic victory, Matt whispered, the Admiral's last words echoing in his mind. Crystal, get us out of here. Matt stood on the bridge of the Gettysburg and watched the stars blur and vanish into the absolute blackness of slip space. They had jumped away from the battle zone over the unyielding Hierophant, emerged in normal space, and plotted their position. Crystal adjusted their course, and now they were finally on their way to Earth. Although they had overwhelming evidence that the Covenant knew the location of Earth, overwhelming was not absolute proof. The Cole Protocol still applied. Slip space transition complete, Crystal said. ETA to Earth in 35 hours, Commander. The tiny hologram of Crystal continued to stare at him, and her slender brows knit together. Was there something else, Crystal? He asked. The furrow in her brow deepened. She sighed and crossed her arms over her chest. I was wondering about the copy of my infiltration programming. Crystal's color cooled from blue to ultramarine. I've reviewed your mission logs. Maybe it was the additional copying that caused its breakdown, but that copy did have some of my core personality programmings as well. 
I just hope it's not a sign of some other instability. Crystal had been on edge. She had been so distracted at times she hadn't known the correct time. They had, however, all been pushed to the breaking point in the last few weeks. And despite any minor flaws, Crystal had always come through for him. We couldn't have survived without you, he finally told her. Your programming is as good as ours. She tinged pink and then her hologram returned to a cool blue hue. Are my oral systems malfunctioning or was that a compliment, Commander? Continue to monitor slip space for any anomalies, Matt said, ignoring her. He strode to the three forward view screens and stared into the blackness. He wanted solitude, to gaze at nothing, and complete the task that he dreaded. Matt pulled his team roster onto his heads-up display. He ran down the list, designating all those who had died on reach, and afterward, as missing in action. James, Lee, Grace, and all his dead teammates who would never officially be allowed to die. And in his mind, they would never find any peace until this war was won. He paused at Kelly's name. Matt listed her as MIA, too. She was ironically the only Spartan truly missing, whisked away by Dr. Halsey on some secret private mission. Matt knew that whatever the doctor had planned, she would protect Kelly if she could. Still, he couldn't help but worry about them both. He added Corporal Locklear to his list and designated him killed in action. It was a more fitting end for a man who had been as much a warrior as any Spartan. The last three names on his list he stared at for a long time warrant officer Sheila Pulaski, Lieutenant Elias Haberson, and Admiral Danforth Whitcomb. He reluctantly listed them as Kia and referenced his mission report, which detailed their heroism. Two men had stopped a Covenant Armada, they had willingly died doing it, and they had bought the human race a brief respite from destruction. Matt felt glad. They were soldiers, sworn to protect humanity from all threats, and they had fulfilled their duty as few ever could. And like his Spartans who were missing in action, the Admiral and the Lieutenant would never die, either. Not because of a technicality in a mission status listing, but because in their deaths they would live on as inspirations. Matt turned and watched as John stood on the bridge looking out the front view screen while Linda, Will, and Fred occupied the bridge stations. Matt would make sure that he and the last surviving Spartans did the same. The elevator doors opened, and Sergeant Johnson stepped onto the bridge. Got all those Covenant engineers rounded up on B-deck, Sergeant Johnson announced. Slippery suckers. Matt nodded. The boys at ONI and those squid heads have a lot in common. Can't understand a thing they say and they're just as good looking. Guess they're all going to have a long talk about technical watsits and scientific doodads when we get home. Sergeant Johnson crossed the bridge to Matt. There's one other thing. Another ONI thing. He held out a data crystal and his gaze fell to the deck. Lieutenant Haverson gave this to me before he and the Admiral left. He said you'd have to deliver it for him. Matt stared at the data crystal and reluctantly plucked it from the sergeant's fingers as if it were a slug of unstable radioactive material. Thank you, sergeant. He hesitated and then added, I'll take care of this. The sergeant nodded and strode toward weapons station one. Matt turned back to the blank monitors and retrieved the other data crystal from his belt compartment. Yesterday he had believed he had done the right thing by giving the lieutenant all of Dr. Halsey's flood data, including the data on the sergeant which she assured him would lead to his death. But now, now, Matt knew the difference one man could make in this war. He understood Dr. Halsey's desire to save every person she could. Matt held the two data crystals, one in each hand, and stared at them, trying to discern the future from their glimmering facets. That was the point, wasn't it? He couldn't know the future. He had to do what he could to save every person. Today. Now. So he decided. He tightened his fist around the crystal with the complete mission data and crushed it to dust. Matt couldn't condemn Sergeant Johnson. He hefted the remaining data crystal. There would have to be enough in it for ONI. He set the crystal securely back into his belt. Today they had won. They had stopped the Covenant. Matt would return to Earth with a warning and enough intel to keep scientists at ONI busy. But what about tomorrow? The Covenant didn't give up once they set their sights on a target. They wanted Earth, they'd come for it. Destroying their fleet would only delay that inevitable fact. They had time, though. Maybe enough time to prepare for whatever the Covenant could throw at them. Matt would take today's victory. And he'd be there when the fighting started again. He'd be there to win. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 83 New Developments Authors note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment.
Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 83 New Developments Location aboard UNSC Vessel Gettysburg, in slip space. September 13, 2552, 1900 hours. Commander, request permission to go below, Linda asked. Granted Matt replied. John take over for her. Linda gave him a nod then left the bridge and rode the lift down to the machine shop which was designated at the Spartans temporary barracks. She pried her helmet off and inspected it, some of the components were new, salvaged by Red Team on reach. Mostly the ones in the back where she was shot and killed by a jackal's plasma pistol. Killed, that word stuck in her head, she actually died. Linda had made a few remarks about it after she was revived by Dr. Halsey, but those were mostly jokes. Now that she had some downtime, strange feelings started to pop into her head, she just didn't feel the same anymore. Linda sat down on the floor, cross-legged, and closed her eyes. Although she never adopted the religion, she was a practitioner of several Zen meditation techniques that helped hone her skills with the sniper rifle. After a few minutes of controlled breathing, she found her mind adrift in the Zen Nafut state. She was however interrupted from her meditations as someone else entered the machine shop, Matt. He glanced at her briefly before walking over to the other end of the room and standing before a metal table, he began to disconnect his armor. Linda watched him from the corner of her eye and pretended to still be meditating. Matt removed the upper portions of his armor and stripped off the top part of his undersuit revealing the pasty white skin of his body, but around parts of his neck were nasty looking bruises. She couldn't see his chest but she could make out the edge of another bruise on his side. Without even thinking about it she got up and walked over to him. Commander, are you all right? She asked. I'm fine, he replied. Like hell, said Linda as she grabbed Matt's arm and spun him around to face her. Matt she cried when she saw the extent of the injury, the bruise covered most of his lower right side and it had a nasty gash in the middle. I was going to use some biofoam and some nanites, he said. Matt, this is serious, she said, you've definitely got a fractured rib, what if it was forced back and punctured your heart? It wasn't, said Matt, you don't need to worry. Like hell, Linda said again as she crossed over to the wall and removed a heavy-duty first aid kit from one of the lockers, then went back to Matt. You better just let me do this, said Matt. Like hell, Matt, Linda once again said. She removed her armor gauntlets and delicately began touching the bruise to find the exact rib that was fractured. Just tell me where it hurts the most. As she was doing this Linda started to get this weird feeling in her chest, like it was becoming lighter. There, Matt said which brought Linda out of her daze. Linda removed the biofoam and stuck it into the spot Matt had specified, in seconds the foam had hardened around the rib. Linda removed a dressing and began wrapping around Matt's body. After she got the dressing on, Matt pulled out a syringe with a silver liquid in it and injected into his neck. After Matt injected the silver liquid in the syringe into his neck, Linda turned her attention to the smaller bruises on his neck, unfortunately, they would have to heal on their own. How did you get all these? Linda asked. In a tangle with something called a brute, Matt explained, they're more like big hairy apes. Matt remembered that Linda was posted in an impossible position outside the temple where the brutes were. He risked everything to save her, all in his mind because of the promise he made to her when they were nine. He looked over at her face, specifically, the old scar she had on her jawline, just one of many she now had due to the risky operation to save her life. In a way, Matt blamed himself for letting Linda die the first time. This was just one patch of guilt in a never-ending list. I think the rest of you is fine, said Linda. Glad to hear it, said Matt. How are you doing? I'm green, commander, she replied. That's not what I mean, he said as he placed a hand on her shoulder. I'm trying to ask how you're handling the whole, coming back from the dead, thing. I'm fine, it was nothing, she replied as she left Matt and went back to her corner of the room. Standing there in front of Matt half-naked made the strange feeling in her gut get worse, but the strangest thing for Linda was, she liked it. Location Soul System, aboard UNSC Vessel Gettysburg, September 14, 2552, 0700 hours. Their frigate emerged from slip space in record time and they were immediately surrounded by squadrons of long swords, due to the fact the Gettysburg was presumed lost at reach. Crystal was able to give them the proper authentication codes and the frigate was ushered to McKinley Station. When informed of the Covenant engineers on board the UNSC had the ship put under quarantine until ONI med teams could come aboard. When they did they had the Spartans and Sergeant Johnson disembark the ship and into a sterilized section of the station. But they were separated from Johnson. Where are you taking him? Matt asked. 
He's being sent to Med Station M25L as are you, but you'll be taking separate transports, said a doctor in a hazmat suit. Don't worry, Commander, said Johnson, I've been through worse. Matt nodded and they were ushered off to waiting pelicans and flown out to the Med Station. Once there they entered yet another sterilized area and the Spartans were placed on a conveyor and their armor was hosed down by chemical agents. Then they passed through another chamber and bathed in ultraviolet radiation to make sure all microorganisms on their armor were dead. They entered a clean room and had to wait for 10 minutes until another doctor appeared in a clean room suit. We'll need you to be inspected and decontaminated separately, said the doctor, that's why we separated you from the sergeant. We need to reduce the risk of contamination if you contracted something from those Covenant engineers. I'm sure we didn't, said Linda. Nevertheless, we can't be sure, said the doctor. Now follow me. He took the Spartans into the hall and one by one they were pulled into separate rooms by orderlies. Linda glanced at Matt as she was ushered into the prep room and asked to remove her armor. She complied and after a half hour, she was in her undersuit, which was in no better condition than her armor. It had a few large holes from where the plasma burned through the Mjolnir armor and all the way through her to the bone. She was told to remove that too and after some blood was drawn she then passed through a chemical shower and then into an examination room. She was given a black bra and underwear to put on, then told to wait. Linda sat on the bed for ten more minutes before another doctor, not in a hazmat suit came in. I'm Dr. Patterson, he said as he began writing something down on his data pad. Sorry about not getting you some proper attire but I need to examine the extent of your injuries, which I can see are quite extensive. Linda looked down at her pale body. Wearing only underwear, all of her scars from the operation were visible. According to your blood test you recently had a massive transfusion, said Patterson, and judging from your scars you must have had a flash cloned organ transplant. I did, said Linda, I was wounded at reach and declared clinically dead. I was in cryo until medical personnel was able to revive me. The doctor's eyes shot open when she that and he began writing more stuff down on his data pad. Have you experienced any problems physically, loss of motor control, spasms? He asked, no. What about mentally, dizziness, lapses in judgment or memory? Patterson asked. No, Linda replied. So you're saying you're fine? Yes. Okay, well I think that does it. We still need to keep you here overnight for observation but according to your blood work you don't have any immediate infections. Try and get some rest. Thanks, doctor, said Linda as he left. When Patterson was in the hall he went over his notes and forwarded them into his report, along with another message at the bottom. Slash recommend Spartan 058 undergo a psychological evaluation for possible Kia syndrome slash slash end file slash author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 84 Inquisitors. Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 84 Inquisitors. Location Soul System, M25L Recovery Station. September 15, 2552, 0800 hours. Linda awoke in a private recovery room that offered a full view of Earth from the window. She figured she was sedated during the night and moved in here. She was also dressed in a white robe, under which was the underwear she was given yesterday. The door opened and a Marine private entered carrying a black uniform and he placed it on the bed. There's a transport leaving in 30 minutes for HICOM, he said, you need to be on it. Can I see Matt? She asked. Who? Sorry, the commander, Linda corrected. I'm sorry, ma'am, but the orders are to keep you all separated until after the debriefing, the private said again. Oh, I almost forgot. He set a small case onto of the uniform and saluted as he left. Linda crossed over from the window and opened the case, inside was a purple heart and an oak cluster. She took it out and inspected it, this was her third purple heart and her second cluster, the clusters were only awarded when you got a subsequent medal. At the bottom, the box was the accompanying ribbon she would have to pin to her dress uniform. She made the changes to the uniform the Marine dropped off for her and began putting it on. She had finished with the pants and was about to put on the black wool jacket that bore her rank, name, ribbons, and the patch of the Spartan program. But she stopped for a minute to inspect it. Linda had gathered her fair share of ribbons over the years but it was nowhere near as impressive as Matt's. She donned the shirt, went down to the hangar bay and boarded her pelican to the surface. 
On the ride, she pondered why she asked the Marine to see Matt instead of the team as a whole. She pushed this thought aside as her pelican arrived at Sydney. After going through rigorous screening Linda was admitted to the lobby of one of the briefing rooms and told to wait. The room had a high ceiling with the UNSC seal brazen on it, the floor was marble and there was a comfortable lounge area where she took a seat. Nice to see you up, said Sergeant Johnson as he sat next to her. I'm doing fine, sir, said Linda. They asked some pretty tough questions of the commander when he was here earlier, said Johnson. Matt was here. Linda asked she realized she did it again. Yeah, but he left a few hours ago, they did my debrief, and now I'm just waiting for a friend, said Johnson. Linda's green eyes gravitated to Johnson's medals, one, in particular, stood out among the rest. It was of a planet with a sword going down the middle, on one side of the sword the planet was a lush green blue but on the other side, it was burning. This medal was the first contact medal and it was only awarded to veterans of the first battle of harvest, there were only a handful of people left alive who had it. You were at harvest? Linda asked. I was, said Johnson, in fact, I was the first Marine to meet a Covenant ugly up close. Linda was about to ask another question but Johnson stood up upon seeing a woman emerge from one of the elevators. She had a few streaks of gray in her hair and she wore the uniform of a Navy officer. Linda noticed she also had a first contact medal pin to her uniform. She hugged Johnson and the two left shortly after. Ma'am, they're ready for you, said an MP standing at the door. Linda stood up and entered the double doors. Location Soul System, aboard UNSC Hopeful. September 15, 2552, 1000 hours. First Lieutenant Allison Baker strolled through the halls of the Mobile Battlefield Hospital heading for her office. She was a psychiatrist on the Hopeful and at only 29 she was one of the best under Admiral Jeromney. She entered her office and found a message from Jeromney on her computer so she read it. From Vice Admiral Jeromney, Commanding Officer UNSC Hopeful, to First Lieutenant Allison Baker MD, UNSC Hopeful, slash message start slash, Allie, I've got an assignment for you. An old friend on M25L has requested a psychiatrist for a patent he believes is suffering from Kia syndrome. Now I know you like a challenge but you need to take a step back and consider this one for a moment because this patient is a Spartan. Either way, you've been placed on temporary detachment to ONI Section 3 and you're being sent to Earth. I know you can handle this and if you need anything don't hesitate to ring me. Jeromni. Slash message end slash. Baker couldn't believe what she read. Everyone had heard of the Spartans at this point, but Baker couldn't understand why one would need a shrink. Then there was the mention of having Kia syndrome. Baker had never found a patient she couldn't understand and like what the Admiral said earlier, she liked a challenge. An hour later Baker was on a shuttle to Earth. Strangely enough, she was the only one aboard and probably figured because ONI had sent it. It was a VIP shuttle complete with a lounge area, briefing room, and even a galley. She sat in one of the leather couches and busied herself in the records of the Spartani program. ONI had given Baker provisional security clearance so she could read the files but ONI made her sign several non-disclosure agreements before turning over the files. She was shocked to discover the Spartans' conscripting process involved kidnapping the children and replacing them with Flash clones. Baker read on about their training, augmentations, and finally their Mjolnir armor. She came upon that was classified at the highest level but her clearance allowed her to read it. It was titled Spartan Roster. Inside was a single sheet of paper with all of the Spartans that graduated in 2525. Her jaw dropped when she scanned the list and saw all but four marked MIA. At the bottom was a footnote from Section 3, Directive 930 stated that all Spartan casualties were to be listed as MIA to preserve the myth that Spartans never die. Beneath that was another footnote that added acceptance to the list. Spartan 087 and the Spartans of Grey Team were the only true MIA Spartans. Baker finally arrived at the file of her patient, Linda 058. According to her records, she had been presumed dead at the Battle of Reach and placed into cryo by Matt 038, the infamous Spartan that never missed a shot with a sniper rifle and John 117, the famed Master Chief. According to the reports, Linda was called a lone wolf among the Spartans, an excellent marksman, a practitioner of Zen. Sounds like the overall quiet type, Baker said to herself. Even with being armed with all the facts of the Spartans she knew that understanding this Linda was going to be a whole other can of worms. Location Soul System, Planet Earth, Highcom, September 15, 2552, 1100 hours. 
Linda sat before a panel of high-ranking officers as they debriefed her about the events at Reach and her subsequent death. So you were at no time on the surface of the construct world known as Halo? The chairman asked. No, Linda replied. Do you also confirm that you were not on the surface of Reach when the Spartans retrieved the unusual alien artifact? No, as stated in the mission logs I was clinically dead until I was revived on the 12th, said Linda. Are you aware of the date log error between these events? The chairman asked. I was told that, that the Pillar of Autumn arrived at the Halo on the 19th and my cryotube was ejected as per SOP. It was then retrieved by Spartan 117 and Spartan 038 and they took it to reach aboard the captured Covenant flagship. From what Dr. Halsey told us the crystal artifact found on Reach somehow pulled our Covenant ship through time to September the 7th and when the ship jumped with the artifact, we were sent a week into the future. According to the report, the artifact was destroyed shortly after. That is correct, said Linda. Very well, we have one more question for you. Do you know the whereabouts of Dr. Halsey and Spartan 087? No, sir, Linda replied. Very good then. Petty officer, you are dismissed. You are however not to discuss any information about Reach, Halo or anything covered in this room, am I clear? Crystal, sir. Good, a transport is waiting topside to take you to Vandenberg. You and the rest of your unit are being given extended shore leave until further notice. Sir, I request permission to be assigned to a mission instead. I applaud your tenacity, Spartan. But to tell you the truth we don't have anywhere to send the Spartans and if the Covenant do know Earth's location then we need the four of you rested and ready for battle. Sir, yes, sir, said Linda as she saluted and left. Location Soul System, Planet Earth, California, Vandenberg Base, September 19, 2552, 1,500 hours. Southern California wasn't reach but it had its perks. Most of the time the Spartans were in their Mjolnir armor doing nothing most of the time. Matt hadn't heard from Crystal ever since the ONI spooks yanked her out of the frigate and whisked her away to a secret facility to be scanned. Linda hadn't really talked to Matt since the frigate and he only mentioned to her that his injuries were healing nicely. Lately, Matt was the only thing on Linda's mind. Excuse me, petty officer, a Marine asked Linda as she entered the barracks where the Spartans were staying. Yes, said Linda. I was told to bring you to Building J right away. Linda nodded and followed the Marine out. Baker had been set up in an office at Vandenberg Building J by ONI who spared no expense. They gave her a desk, couch, chairs for the basics but the office also had very rare paintings, works of art and not to mention rugs. She was reclining behind her desk when the Marine arrived with her patient. Linda was wearing her Mjolnir armor which made Baker's job a little more difficult, not being able to read her body language. Ma'am, Spartan 058 reporting as ordered. At ease, said Baker, and while you're here I'm either Doctor or Allison, no ma'am crap. Yes, Doctor, said Linda. Why don't you sit down, she said offering one of the chairs in front of her desk, reinforced to support the Mjolnir armor. May I ask what I'm doing here, said Linda. I'm going to be truthful here, said Baker. She was a very unusual doctor because she always told her patients from the first day why they were there and what she was going to do. The doctor on M25L has noted some concerns about you, that you might be suffering from something we call Kia syndrome. Kia syndrome? Linda asked. It's a psychological condition people get when they are declared clinically dead for a long amount of time and then revived, like you. Some people have trouble adjusting to society after coming back from the dead and this is typically difficult for religious people when they discover no afterlife waiting for them. Sometimes it can lead to emotional breakdowns, depression, and suicide in most cases. People suffering from KIAS say that they feel a part of them is missing, that they no longer feel whole anymore. They believe they should be dead and the doctors had no right to bring them back. This is why people with KIAS often end up killing themselves. Ma'am, I don't believe I'm suffering from this Kia syndrome, said Linda. Spartans are trained to repress their feelings. I know, said Baker I read the files on the Spartan 2 program and just because you push your feelings aside doesn't mean they're gone. I know you must feel uncomfortable doing this but we need to determine if you've got Kia syndrome, and I'll be asking some questions that are a bit strange so bear with me. I'll do my best, ma'am, said Linda. I thought we agreed it was either Allison or doctor, said Baker. Sorry. Doctor, Linda replied. Let's get started then, said Baker. We'll start with something easy, like your armor for instance. Why do you wear it all the time? It enhances our strength and speed, Linda replied. The armor is a very useful tool. 
Perhaps I should rephrase the question, said Baker, why do you continually wear the armor in non-combat situations? Now Linda was starting to understand what Baker meant by uncomfortable questions. We're uncomfortable outside it, she finally said after a few moments. We're accustomed to it. That can be our first topic of this session, said Baker. Try to get yourself more comfortable outside your armor. I'll do my best, said Linda. That's all I ask, said Baker. Now why don't we try talking without the helmet on? Linda complied and reached up, twisted the helmet sideways slightly and pulled it off with a hiss. Baker was unprepared for what she saw. Linda's dossier gave her hair and eye color but not a picture of her face. Her red hair was cropped short, just slightly over-regulation. Her skin was completely pale but surprisingly smooth for a woman of 41. In fact, she looked closer to Baker's age. She figured her skin was so pale from long amounts of time in the armor. It's a start, said Baker. A few hours later Linda was back in the barracks, fully concealed in her armor. Her talk with Baker had opened her eyes a little. She started to think about the Kia syndrome she mentioned earlier. There's no way to know I've got it, she thought to herself. But she had to note several similarities to the way she'd been feeling and the symptoms of the syndrome. Linda collapsed on the reinforced bunk and tried to get some sleep. Thankfully it was quiet. Matt, John, Will, and Fred were out southwest she had the place to herself, or so she thought because Matt walked in as she was falling asleep. He was in his dress uniform and had a hard look on his face. Something wrong? She asked as she rolled over on her bunk to face him. John gave me the job of personally informing Captain Key's daughter of his death, Matt said. She didn't take it well. Damn near went ballistic on me. I didn't know he had a daughter, said Linda. She's in the Navy too, said Matt as he began removing his uniform. Lieutenant Commander to be precise, she even has a ship. I'm sorry, said Linda. I should have been there with you. You didn't need to be, said Matt. John and I can handle things like that. Besides, you didn't see him die like we did. Linda rolled over and tried to sleep. Her mind wandered to what Matt had said. It was a grim reminder that she was floating in a cryotube over the halo instead of fighting down there with John and Matt like she should have been. She finally drifted off to sleep and had a very peculiar dream. Linda was sitting under a tree in the arms of Matt and for some reason, he pressed his mouth over hers. Linda awoke immediately wondering what the hell that was all about. She started to feel that same weird feeling from before, the one she liked. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 85 Old Times. Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 85 Old Times. Location Soul System, Planet Earth, Vandenberg Base. September 29, 2552, 0930 hours. Linda sat on the floor of the barracks before a disassembled SRS 99C, inspecting the various components. She wasn't in her armor, which was a first for a Spartan. Baker had over the past couple of days worked with Linda of trying to break her of her shy habits. After trying out a day without the armor, Linda started to feel more relaxed and so she tried it another day and then another until she just wore a standard gray uniform most of the time. Matt, Fred, John, and Will still stayed inside their armor. Matt had started to notice her new behavior so today he showed up in the morning wearing the same gray uniform as Linda. Why the change? Linda asked him. I wanted to see why you found it so interesting Matt replied. Can't say I've found the appeal again. Although these uniforms will come in handy later on. Why is that? Linda asked. I should probably tell you our orders, said Matt as he sat down on the bunk in front of Linda. Highcom is splitting up blue team, Fred and Will are being transferred to Songham for the remainder of leave. John is being transferred to Cairo Station, but that might change. Why? It's part of their plan to fortify Earth for when the Covenant show up, Matt explained. Command has been reactivating a lot of old bases on the planet just in case the Covenant invade Earth instead of glassing it. They want the Spartans separated if the Covenant decided to begin with an orbital bombardment. No sense in having us all together where they can just take us out with ease, said Linda. So I guess you and I are staying here. Yes, said Matt. Linda looked away for a minute. She was concerned that the UNSC would choose now to split up the Spartans, but on the other hand, Linda liked the idea of just her and Matt, alone together until that happens. 
She started getting the same feeling again. Linda was starting to find it increasingly annoying. I wanted to ask you something Matt continued. Do you want to come with me to see an old friend? Location Soul System, Planet Earth, South Carolina, September 29, 2552, 1,100 hours. Matt and Linda walked up to the door of a simple two-story house in rural South Carolina. A woman with black hair was waiting for them in the open door. I never thought I'd see you two again, she said. Hello, Maria, said Matt. It's been a long time. Too long, Maria replied. Come on in, we've got some catching up to do. Linda and Matt entered Maria's home and she ushered them both into the living room. There were various pictures of her and another man up on the mantel. That's my husband in case you were going to ask, said Maria. I didn't know you were married, said Matt. Oh and I wasn't all that enthusiastic about me sending you letters, Maria explained as she sat in one of the armchairs. They weren't content with letting me retire, either. Linda remembered the circumstances of Maria's discharge from the Spartan program. A latent side effect of her augmentations left her with a degenerative heart condition that caused her to suffer a heart attack. She had to retire from any kind of duty in order to reduce the strain on her heart. You've lived a rather comfortable life, Linda remarked. Hard to imagine though, with the war going on. Believe me I'd rather be fighting out there, said Maria. For various reasons, which is why I re-enlisted in the reserves. You did, what? Said Matt. You know you can't take the strain. That's where you're wrong, said Maria. They found a cure about 12 years ago. I'm as fit as can be. Wouldn't Owen I try and reconscript you back into the program? Linda asked. My husband has some powerful friends and theirs. Maria started before the front door opened and a boy walked in. He couldn't have been any older than 12. Mom, what's going on? He asked. Mom. Linda said in her head. Zack. I want you to go upstairs, Maria said to him. I have to talk with these people for a little while longer. Sure thing, Mom, Zach replied as he bounded up the steps. He's the other reason Maria explained. He's also the reason they found the cure for the heart condition I had. When I found out I was pregnant with him they said a section wasn't possible and that I would most likely die in childbirth. Thanks to the baby's stem cells in my bloodstream it was only a matter of extracting them and cloning them. The rest is a lot of scientific crap I don't get. That's quite a tale, said Matt. Look, I'm not being rude by saying this but you two are going to have to leave now, said Maria. Zach doesn't know about my past and I want to keep it that way. It's not a problem, said Matt as he and Linda stood up and moved toward the door. Feel free to come and see me whenever, said Maria. Just try and look a little less military. Not a problem, said Linda as they darted out the door. Location Vandenberg Base, Baker's Office, September 30, 2552, 1,200 hours, and you found this weird? Baker asked. Well yes, Linda replied, she had told Baker about her encounter with Maria. It's hard to imagine a Spartan married and having kids. Does this make you feel awkward around her? Baker asked. No, Linda replied, it's just strange as all, Spartans were trained for fighting not for having families. So you don't think it's possible for a Spartan to love someone, is that what you're saying? Baker asked. An hour after the appointment, Linda was sitting in the bunk room attempting to meditate. Her mind was racing with all kinds of thoughts and feelings, she was trying to banish them from her mind using the meditation, but it was becoming increasingly difficult. Problem. Matt asked from his bunk. Linda sighed and opened her eyes. How did you know? She asked. Rapid eye movement Matt replied. Whenever you meditated like that your eyes always stayed still. Since when have you been watching me meditate? Linda asked. I only did it a couple of times, said Matt. Sometimes I can't concentrate and I've watched you meditating. It's kind of mesmerizing. I can't concentrate either, Linda replied. It's this place, it's so artificial. We need to get outside. I think I have an idea, said Matt as he stood up, pulled Linda on her feet and brought her outside. They crossed the base and arrived at one of the outer perimeter fences. Matt lifted a corner of the fence and Linda slid under it, followed by Matt. This brought back memories of when the Spartans used to sneak out of the training facility and escape into the woods of Reach. Matt checked their position using the sun and led Linda to the southwest, through the woods. When they emerged they found themselves over a large cliff overlooking the Pacific. Linda could hear the waves splash against the cliff face. How did you know about this? Linda asked. I studied up on the region, said Matt, it's a lot like Reach in some ways but this is one of its different features. This place is perfect, Linda said as she sat down in the grass, Matt sitting next to her. 
He repeated the subconscious breathing techniques that he was so used to. Soon he felt disconnected from his body and his mind floated free. Matt still had his eyes shut but he could hear the ocean below them, it was calming. I think the change of scenery is working, Matt whispered. You're not supposed to talk, Linda whispered back. Matt was about to say sorry but he caught himself before he could. Location Epsilon Eridani System, Planet Reach, Military Reservation 01478B, January 25, 2521, 2340 hours. Matt rolled over in his bunk and tried to get to sleep. He was having quite the case of insomnia due to the exercises Mendez had them do today. His system was still pumping with adrenaline while the others were too tired to even stand. He noticed a figure moving in the dark followed by a soft, quiet moan. Matt got out of bed and went over to investigate. Linda was sitting up against the wall with her legs tucked in close. What's wrong? He whispered. Bad dream, Linda replied. I couldn't sleep. What was it about? Matt asked. I don't want to talk about it, Linda replied. Matt sat down next to her and placed an arm around her. This time she didn't try and push him away. I'll stay with you, he said. Linda smiled at him and promptly shut her eyes. Location Soul System, Planet Earth, Vandenberg Base, October 1, 2552, 2100 hours. Linda had the same strange dream again, the one with her and Matt under the tree. He did the mouth-to-mouth -mouth thing again and then Linda and he started to rip each other's clothes off. What the hell she whispered when she was awakened by the dream. She got out of the bunk and started passing, trying to clear her head. These weird dreams with her and Matt were starting to drive Linda crazy. She finally sat against the wall and pulled her legs close, before she knew it she was fast asleep, but something jostled her awake. When she opened her eyes she found Matt sitting next to her, with an arm around her. She was reminded of that night back on Reach, she felt safe then, like now. She rested her head on Matt's shoulder and closed her eyes. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 86 Growing Affection Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again. I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 86 Growing Affection Location Soul System, Planet Earth, Vandenberg Base, October 5, 2552, 1136 hours, Linda sat with Matt near the cliff meditating with him. Matt had certainly become a quick study over the past couple of days and secretly watching when he wasn't looking had given Linda something to do, besides clean and service her rifle. The strange dreams with her and Matt hadn't been back since the last one, she decided to hold off on telling Baker about them, for now. She started to enter a deep meditative state and for some reason, she entered REM sleep. It was the same setting under the tree and both she and Matt were there, minus any clothes. She looked into his brown eyes and whispered three words that made Linda realize exactly what was going on. I love you. Linda bolted awake immediately and suddenly grabbed her head. I love him, she thought to herself. That's what all the strange feelings were, the tightening in her chest, how she liked being alone with him all the time. She looked over at him, still in a meditative state and suddenly another feeling began to rise in her chest, fear. She didn't know why, but she knew she had to get away from him so she quietly got up and ran for the trees and didn't stop until she reached Vandenberg. She made it to the bunk room and shut the door then leaned up against the wall. What the hell did I do that for, she said to herself. Linda didn't know how to handle these new feelings, they scared her in a way. Linda returned to her bunk and laid down on it, she knew Matt had by now noticed her absence and hopefully she would pretend to be sleeping and Matt wouldn't bother her. She lay on the bed for 20 minutes before she heard the door open followed by Matt's heavy footfalls across the floor. He sat down on the bunk opposite hers for a few minutes then got up and walked over to Linda. She kept her eyes shut and tried her best to pretend she was still sleeping. Please don't wake me and ask me why I left, she kept saying in her head. Linda braced herself for when he would try and shake her awake but instead, she felt the blanket and the foot of the bed being draped over her. Thankfully Linda was facing away from Matt so he didn't catch her slight smile. Location Vandenberg Base, Baker's Office, October 8, 2552, 1325 hours. Baker sat at her desk overlooking some paperwork when Linda barged into the room. Is something wrong? Baker asked, our appointment isn't until tomorrow. I needed to talk to you, Linda replied. I need your help. Of course, Baker replied, 
Just tell me what happened. How do I do this? Linda thought to herself. Look I wanted to talk to you because I think I love Matt. Baker sat back in her chair, dumbfounded by what she just said. The Spartans were indeed a challenge in psychology. She read that the Spartans had repressed sex drives and therefore couldn't become attracted to a member of the opposite sex, apparently this wasn't the case. Faced with this, Baker wasn't quite sure how to proceed. She wasn't a date doctor, but Baker always enjoyed a good challenge when it came to understanding a patient. This one, however, would be her hardest. Why don't you start by telling me how you came to realize this? Baker asked. Linda complied and started telling her about the dreams she'd been having over the past couple of weeks and the strange sensation in her chest. Baker couldn't help but crack a smile at Linda's tail. At first glance, it sounded like she was describing a sexual fantasy, but the more she went on the more Baker started to realize that these feelings actually scared her. Linda had no idea how to handle this. Linda, it sounds like you might have had these feelings for quite a while, said Baker. I think the first thing we should do is try and narrow down the time frame a bit, try and find out when this all started. What do I have to do? She asked. I'm going to perform a procedure called hypnosis, said Baker. It will allow you to access more of your memories much quicker and perhaps we can get to the bottom of this. Linda sat in a chair in a windowless room. There was a bright light in her face and she could hear Baker's voice. Clear your mind and only focus on my voice, she said. I'm going to give you a mild sedative cocktail we use for hypnosis purposes. Linda nodded and a moment later she felt a needle enter her arm followed by a dizzying sensation. The light in her face seemed to drift away as if it was at the end of a long tunnel. Think back, said Baker, her voice sounding distant. When did you first start to care for Matt? Location Epsilon Eridani System, Reach, Military Reservation 01478B, July 14, 2523. 0457 hours. I'll see you at the LZ, Matt said to Linda and Fred as the three of them sat inside a hollow out tree stump. This was a training exercise that involved the Spartans stealing a flag guarded by a company of Marines. Matt held out his fist and knocked it with Fred and Linda's. As he was leaving, Linda set her hand on Matt's shoulder and whispered, Be careful. I'm always careful, Matt replied. He left the hollow and joined the rest of Red Team. Linda and Fred were designated Blue Team and were armed with SRS-99 CS modified to shoot tranquilizer rounds. After five minutes they moved out from their cover into the tree line facing Tango Company's base. The forest around the base had been cut up to 200 meters in some places. Linda had only guaranteed the accuracy of their rifles for barely 100. Matt's counting on me, Linda told herself. She lined up on the flagpole with the attached oracle scope and waited. The operations were set to begin at 0500, three minutes away. She activated her night vision mode and watched the camp as the minutes turned to seconds. Suddenly there was an explosion of light from the barracks as the prepositioned stun grenades detonated. The guards around the flag tightened their perimeter but red team ambushed them. What they didn't see was the two guards round the corner of the warehouse and point their guns at Matt. Linda's heart began to race as the guards took aim at him. She sprang into action and fired off two quick darts, hoping to hell that they hit their mark, they did. Both guards dropped and Red Team quickly recovered the flag and made their way off the base. Linda and Fred moved from their position and toward the rendezvous point with Red Team. The plan was to have Blue hidden in the trees as Chief Mendez came to extract them, just in case it was a double cross. She and Fred found a tree that would give them a good vantage point and the scaled up to one of the highest branches, and waited. The extraction time was set at 0700 but a pelican swooped in at 0615. I knew it, Fred whispered. One of the chief's twists. Linda returned her focus to the oracle scope and saw the pelican touch down, then Matt emerged from the tree line heading straight for them. Matt she muttered under her breath. He was making a reckless move but Linda suddenly understood what he was planning, it was risky. Matt was soon surrounded by Tango Company Marines and punched in the stomach. Linda's heart clenched up inside her chest as she watched him collapse, but her mind remained focused on the task at hand. She quickly sent several darts flying at the guards as did Fred from next to her, they also were hit by Red Team from inside the tree line. After they were all down Matt entered the pelican and returned to the field a moment later. He whistled their six-note Oli Oli Oxen free and both she and Fred jumped down and ran over to him. Linda whistled Oli Oli Oxen Free followed by the countersign, All out in the free, we're all free. She had never been so happier than to see him standing there. She would always have his back. Location Vandenberg Base, Spartan Barracks. 
October 10, 2552, 1,500 hours, Linda had returned from meditating near the sea to find Matt waiting for her. He had made himself distance over the past couple of days, ever since Linda left him alone suddenly. She tried to make her way over to the bunk but Matt blocked her path. She knew it was futile to try and get around. What happened the other day? He asked. I had an appointment with someone on the base, Linda replied, a psychiatrist. Is everything okay? He asked in a concerned voice. Fine, Commander, Linda replied as she forced her way past him, but suddenly he grabbed her by the arm and pulled her into him. Nice try, he whispered, but not only could I tell you were lying, but I knew for a fact you were gone for twenty minutes and you spent them asleep in your rack. Linda was caught, she could feel her throat start to tighten, her heart raced. His face was only a mere few inches from hers. I don't understand what the problem has been with you the past couple of weeks, he said. You've been acting pretty weird around me. Without even realizing what she was doing she leaned in closer to him and her lips brushed his. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 87 Remission Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 87 Remission Location Vandenberg Base, Spartan Barracks October 10, 2552, 1,501 hours. Matt was taken completely off guard when Linda suddenly kissed him. Linda finally realized what she was doing and quickly backed away. Linda, he said, unable to think of anything to say to her. I shouldn't have done that she replied, I don't know what I was thinking. Look it's. Matt started before Linda cut him off again. Matt, it was totally inappropriate of me, I should know better, Linda said. Linda. You don't have to. No, Matt Linda barked. This is wrong and you and I both know it. Linda marched off to the far end of the empty barracks and collapsed on one of the bunks. Matt was left in a daze over what just happened. He had no idea Linda had those kinds of feelings for him. Part of him wanted to go over to Linda and perhaps try and work out what happened but the other part of him, the military part, told him that going over there would lead to Matt accepting his own feelings for Linda, and that would blossom into an inappropriate relationship between the two Spartans. In the end, he decided not to get into a sticky situation with Linda, at least not right away. Location Soul System, Planet Earth, South Carolina, October 11, 2552, 1,030 hours. You did, what? Maria yelled. I kissed him, Linda repeated. I just suddenly did it. Maria leaned back in her chair, this morning when Linda arrived seeking advice on something she never imagined it was this. I think I always loved him, Linda confessed. I just never realized it until now. Look, Maria, I'm not sure what to do next, I pushed myself away and now I can't stop thinking about him. It's driving me crazy. Look, Linda, Maria started. I think you need to consider the possibility that this is a one-way attraction. Linda didn't like where this was heading. I think Matt has feelings for someone else, Maria said. Location Epsilon Eridani System, Planet Reach, Military Reservation 01478B, March 5, 2525, 1900 hours. 14-year-old Maria sat with the rest of the Spartans in one of the smaller briefing rooms on the base while Dr. Halsey explained their next mission. This will not be a combat mission like you are accustomed to, said Halsey, and there is a very real possibility that some of you will not survive. We are going up to the orbital station tomorrow for preliminary workups of you all. Dismissed. Maria filed out of the room with the rest of the Spartans, John leading the group. They went back to their barracks and began talking in small groups. People Maria knew since she was seven were actually worried they weren't coming back. Two people, in particular, stood out, Matt and Alice. They were whispering in each other's ears. Suddenly a smile began to form across Alice's face as she grabbed Matt's arm and took him down the hall and ducked around the corner. Maria followed from a distance and watched as Alice led Matt into one of the storage rooms. There was a click as they locked the door from inside. Maria moved closer to the door and heard a couple of giggles from inside. Maria was fed up with listening so she returned to the bunk room. It was getting late and most of the other kids were asleep when Maria settled into her rack. She was still awake when Matt and Alice returned, two hours later. Location Soul System, Planet Earth, South Carolina, October 11, 2552, 1045 hours. 
How could I have been so stupid, Linda thought to herself, trying to go after someone else's men, and a friend's no less. I'm sorry you had to hear it from me, Maria said. She placed her hand on Linda's shoulder, trying to reassure her. I feel like such an idiot, Linda muttered. That night at Vandenberg, Linda was trying to sleep but she couldn't, all she could think of was Matt. Her feelings for him were starting to torment her very being. Linda, Matt said as he sat down on the bunk opposite hers, we need to talk. Linda rolled over on her bunk to face him but kept her head on the pillow. I don't want to talk, she said in a depressed voice. We can't deny what happened, Matt said. As far as I'm concerned it never happened, Linda snapped back. Never, get it. Don't give me that, said Matt in a strict voice. That's so like you, Linda hissed. Ever since you became an officer you're always, always, what? Matt said, his voice becoming more agitated. Always so, military Linda blurted. You don't know how to be a real person. And what, you do, said Matt. Look if I've somehow offended you, just tell me. You're always so inconsiderate of others' feelings, Linda said. What the hell is that supposed to mean? Matt snapped. Why didn't you tell me about Alice? Linda asked. Matt was taken back by her comment. I don't see how that's any of your business. That's just it, Matt. You didn't think to tell me about the two of you, after what I did, said Linda. You're implying that you wanted what happened to go further, Matt pointed out. Forget it, Matt, said Linda as she rolled over. Linda, look, Matt started before Linda took one of the pillows under head and used it to cover her other ear. Matt knew it was a lost cause and he returned to the other side of the barracks. Soon after he heard something clear as day, Linda's quiet crying. Location Vandenberg Base, Baker's Office, October 12, 2552, 1,400 hours. Linda sat quietly in the couch against the window, looking at the overcast sky. Baker walked in a few moments later and settled into her chair behind the desk. Linda moved to the chair positioned in front of her desk. Is everything okay? Baker asked. It's not, Linda started. I pushed Matt away because I was jealous that he was involved with someone else. I didn't know how to do it so I just got mad at him and we had an argument. Her eyes started to tear up. Baker couldn't help but feel sorry for her so she got up and sat down next to Linda, placed a hand on her shoulder. I'm sorry things didn't work out, she said. What am I supposed to do? Said Linda as she began to sniffle. I can't stop thinking about him. I feel like such an idiot for pushing him away. But I know we can't have a relationship. I don't know what to do anymore. Baker's eyes shot open. She didn't even begin to understand how to console a Spartan. Look, Linda, why don't you head back to the barracks, said Baker. I need to file a report and I'll see you tomorrow. Linda was curious as to why she would cut their appointment short but she was technically a superior officer. Linda complied and left the room. Baker returned to her desk and began to file her report, followed by an audio entry. It would appear that the symptoms have finally manifested themselves and there's no doubting it, she's got Kia syndrome and it's in its final stages. Linda's behavior is starting to slip into depression, the belief that she has nowhere left to go, classic suicidal behavior. It is my professional opinion that Linda is no longer fit for active duty. A few hours later Linda sat in the empty barracks holding the slip of plastic paper. It read suspended from active duty, pending transfer to a psychiatric hospital. I can't even be a Spartan anymore, Linda thought to herself. She had to get away so she snuck out of the base just as Matt returned from talking to the base commander. He slammed the barrack door shut. How could they do this to her, he said aloud. He had received a copy of Linda's orders from the base commander. Suddenly the door opened and Baker stepped inside. Can I help you, ma'am? Matt asked after he noticed the first lieutenant bars on her uniform. I'm looking for Linda, she replied. I need to talk to her about her suspension. Matt suddenly made the connection between the name on her uniform and the copy of the orders he'd received. You're the one who reported this. Matt said as he stepped over to her, towering over her. Why? I guess she didn't tell you, Baker said. I've been reviewing her for signs of Kia syndrome and she's definitely suffering from it. No, she's not, Matt barked in a defensive tone. Baker looked at his facial expressions and made a startling revelation. You love her, don't you? Matt lowered his head for a moment before meeting her gaze. Why does it surprise you? Linda told me you were involved with another Spartan, Baker explained. It was a long time ago, said Matt, besides, she's gone now. I tried to tell Linda the other day but she was mad at me for not telling her. I never realized how much I cared for her until she was shot at reach. Commander, do you know where she is? Baker asked. 
I think she might be planning something rash, she might try and harm herself. I'll handle this, Matt said. You've done enough. He left a stunned baker behind as he ran at top speed to the only place Linda could be heading. Linda was sitting close to the edge of the same cliff Matt saw her, crying. The clouds were blocking out the sun and the surf below was even more choppy. I've lost everything, she said to herself. Linda stood up and started walking toward the edge when she heard movement from behind. She turned around and saw Matt standing there. Don't try and stop me, Matt, she said. I have nothing left to live for. That's not true, Matt replied. Linda shook her head. Spartans can't love. I have feelings for you that I know I shouldn't and it doesn't make me a Spartan anymore. We can't have emotions if we're supposed to be soldiers. You're wrong, said Matt, because I feel the same way. You're just saying that, said Linda. You love Alice, Maria told me about the two of you. If you're talking about reach, it was a one-time thing, Matt said. We never did it again. We just stayed friends. Besides, she's gone now and I've accepted that. I care about you, Linda. Linda's heart was practically torn apart, put back together and she gave hope at Matt's words. Matt reached out and offered her his hand. Please, Linda, he whispered. Linda reached out and took his hand and pulled her from the edge of the abyss she was prepared to throw herself into. She hugged Matt, overcome with happiness. Let's head back, Matt said. It looks like it's going to rain. Linda nodded and they still held each other's hand as Matt led her through the woods. It started to rain and in a few minutes, they were both soaked through to the skin. When they arrived back at the barracks Matt had Linda sit with him on one of the beds and he draped a blanket around Linda, who was shivering. She pulled her muddy boots off as did Matt. We should probably get out of these wet things, Matt said as he stood up and walked over to the lockers. But he barely got two feet before a pair of hands wrapped around his waist and grabbed the hem of his shirt. He didn't resist as it was pulled off. He spun around to face Linda. She was still in her dripping wet clothes, her wet hair was flattened against her head. She pressed her body up against Matt's chest and kissed him. You know this isn't a good idea, Matt said. Linda replied with another kiss, then grabbed Matt by the arms and threw him back on the bed. Shut up, Commander, Linda said as she took off her own shirt, got down on top of him and started to unzip his pants. Yes ma'am, Matt replied as he locked his lips with hers and reached around to unclasp her bra. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 88 Love and Duty. Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 88 Love and Duty. Location Vandenberg Base, Spartan Barracks. October 13, 2552, 0800 hours. Linda had another dream at the tree, only this time she was heading for it. When she arrived she found Matt holding someone else. Sorry, Linda, said Alice, but he's mine. Linda tried to cry out but suddenly her voice was gone and she started falling into a black void. Linda arrived back in reality and immediately sat up in bed. When Linda realized she was naked and who she was sharing the bed with, a flurry of memories from the night before came back. I slept with him, Linda thought to herself as she looked back at him, still sleeping. He had the sheets pulled up to his waist, obscuring his lower features. Was this the right decision? Linda thought as her mind wandered to the night before. It was intense, passionate, and Matt did things to her that even she didn't think were possible. Parts of her lower body were sore from Matt's moves, but the pain was worth it. Linda had never felt pleasure like that in her entire life. Just thinking about it sent a shiver down her back, but Linda knew that this couldn't continue, both their careers would be at stake. Linda carefully removed one of the sheets and wrapped it around her body, then stood up. Her fatigues were still wet so she decided to walk over to her bunk and get a fresh set, but she didn't get that far. Matt grabbed her slender arm and pulled her back to the bed. Linda landed on top of him and Matt flipped her over to face her. He ran a hand through her red hair and gradually pulled her head closer to his until their lips met once again. When Linda backed her head away Matt saw an awkward expression on her face. You think this was a mistake? He asked. I don't know, Commander, said Linda. I mean, I wanted this, I forced you. We both wanted this, said Matt as he cuffed one side of her face with his hand. She smiled a bit, reassured by his words. What we have is special, no one can take it from us. Linda could feel the temptation rising in her again. 
We can't do this, she kept saying in her head. Do you want to go again? Matt asked. Damn him, Linda said to herself. She could feel Matt remove the sheet covering her body, his hands as they ran across her body. She shivered at the places he was feeling and could finally stand it no longer, she surrendered to her temptations. It started with their kisses but even they grew out of control, he stated with her lips but he gradually worked his way down. Kissing the scar she got when she was nine then moving on to the ones inflicted by her operations to resuscitate her. Linda didn't stop him and joined in the kissing frenzy and slowly kissed the side of his neck and moved to his chest. Eventually, Matt forced Linda under the same sheet and flipped her over so he was on top. Linda knew what was coming and her mind screamed for it. He thrust in and waves of pleasure and pain soared through Linda. She began to moan and Matt remedied this with a kiss. Linda could barely breathe. Her stamina was being drained at an alarming rate. Matt she cried out. Go faster. He complied and Linda thought she would go insane. They came and Linda fought the urge to cry out at the top of her lungs. Matt settled down next to her and Linda rested her head against his chest. Linda looked into his eyes and uttered three words she had been dying to say. I love you. Matt smiled back. Linda settled next to him and fell asleep for the rest of the morning. Later in the afternoon, Linda had to leave Matt in order to make an appointment with Baker. Baker had noticed her cheerful mood and started questioning her. Well whatever the commander said it must have worked, said Baker. It wasn't so much what he said. Linda started before she caught herself. Baker noticed this and raised an eyebrow. Did something happen last night? She inquired. Linda shifted around awkwardly in her seat and this was all the proof Baker needed. Do you still have thoughts of suicide? She asked. Not anymore, Linda replied. Matt gave me hope when I had none left. I think I should tell you that in light of your recent improvement I'm considering changing my recommendation, said Baker. But the result of your improvement is an inappropriate relationship with the commander. I'm willing to look the other way on this, I can come up with some kind of excuse to explain your change. I don't know how to thank you, said Linda. Just don't get caught, said Baker. At the base commander's office, however, Matt was brought in for a briefing. You're in luck, Spartan, said the commander. Hycom has a mission for you. I'm told you have to have your gear packed and get you up to Cairo Station within the hour. What about Spartan 058? Matt asked. She's been put back on active duty according to that doctor she's been seeing and she's got the green light on this one. But the other three Spartans are staying on Earth. Thank you, sir, Matt said as he left and returned to the barracks. Linda was tossing her clothes into a duffel and heading for the door. I just heard, she said. Our armor was taken up already. Head to the Pelican, I'll meet you there, said Matt as he packed his own things. Location Cairo Station, Docking Pad 2 UNSC Prowler Marstons, October 13, 2552, 1800 hours. Matt and Linda had disembarked the Pelican and were immediately ushered to a tram car and set across the station to one of the docking pads, and boarded a waiting prowler. Sorry about the lack of a briefing, a Navy officer explained as he led the two Spartans through the corridors, but our mission is time-sensitive. Both Spartans felt a jolt as the ship disengaged from the station and moved off. Here we are, said the officer as he arrived outside the quarters. He opened the door and the room was empty save for a pair of beds and a table at the back with a terminal and holopad. Both Spartans went in and set their gear down. Sorry, but you two will have to share, said the officer. Space here is limited. It's fine, Matt replied. Your briefing is tomorrow at 0800, he said as he left and shut the door. Matt looked over at Linda who had a grin on her face. In one motion he pinned her to one of the beds and kissed her. Linda broke free of his grasp and pulled his shirt off. Hang on, said Matt as he stood up and walked over to the door, locking it. When he turned back he saw Linda finishing removing her pants and she just pulled her own shirt off when Matt pinned her to the bed once again. They eventually worked the rest of their clothes off and got right to business. Matt pinned Linda beneath him and she arched against him as he thrust down. After an hour of pleasure they held each other in bed, both too exhausted to go again. Suddenly, they heard someone clear their throat. John and Linda looked over at the blue glow from the hollow tank as Crystal appeared. Am I interrupting something? She asked. Linda and Matt shot glances at each other before scrambling off the bed and trying to find their clothes. Linda pressed a small bundle of clothes against her body while Matt was able to put on his underwear. Have you heard of privacy? Matt snapped. Besides, what are you doing here? Well I guess they didn't cover that either, said Crystal. I've been assigned to you for the mission. And I can see you two found a creative way to pass the time. 
This is none of your business, Matt barked. Commander, relax, said Crystal. I couldn't care less about what you two do. You're not going to tell anyone, Linda asked. Crystal cracked a smile, your secret is safe with me, she replied as she disappeared off the pad. That was too close, said Matt as he breathed a sigh of relief. I think we should tone it down a bit, said Linda, at least for the remainder of the mission. Agreed, said Matt, we should probably get some sleep. Linda put her undergarments back on and settled into the other bed while Matt got back on the one they used earlier. He rolled over and tried to fall asleep, but there was too much adrenaline in his system from before. He felt a rustle from next to him and Matt turned over to see Linda sitting on the side of the bed. Do you mind? She asked. Not at all, Matt replied. Linda climbed into bed next to him and they fell asleep in each other's company. Location UNSC Prowler Marstons, in slip space. October 16, 2552, 0938 hours. Matt and Linda had done a pretty good job of covering up their relationship from the rest of the crew and true to what Linda said. They didn't do anything else over the past few days. Aside from sleep each night in the same bed, Matt was in the armory of the tiny craft fitting the various sections of his Mjolnir armor onto his body. Linda had already finished hers and was inspecting a sniper rifle. Crystal was inserted into Matt's armor and was running diagnostics. The briefing the captain had given them a day earlier played over in his mind. Earth received an automated distress call from the UNSC Dawn Under Heaven, a Halcyon-class cruiser that was presumed lost at the Battle of Reach. The captain's logs were included, in it, he reported a malfunction with the ship AI, it had gone rampant and scrambled the computer access, therefore, preventing them from enacting Article 1 of the Coal Protocol, fully. He still made a blind jump and apparently ended up here, now with recent Covenant activity in this sector then we can assume the Covenant heard the signal too. We need to get aboard first and make sure the NAV data is gone. This mission was all too familiar for Matt. It was nearly identical to the one he performed with Linda, John, and James at the Reach Orbital Docks. It didn't worry him that much, nor for Linda. They would be in and out before the Covenant could even trace the distress signal. Commander, report to the airlock, the captain signaled over the comm. He nodded to Linda and she left first followed by himself after he collected an MA-5B and extra ammo. They settled into the airlock and strapped onto packs, then waited. There was a jolt as the prowler exited slipspace followed by the illumination being dimmed, a sign they went to silent running. We see her, the captain said over the comm. We'll do a quick pass then take up station keeping and watch for Covenant. Matt depressurized the airlock and opened the outer door. Linda reached over and swiped the traditional Tuffinger smile gesture over Matt's faceplate and he did the same. It was the closest thing they would get oh a kiss in the Mjolnir armor. You ready? He asked. Linda flashed her status light green and jumped out of the prowler. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 89 Split Decision Authors note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 89 Split Decision Location Sector K91, Asteroid Belt October 16, 2552, 0945 hours Matt and Linda fired their packs on a guided trajectory toward the dawn under heaven. The cruiser was drifting lifeless among the asteroids, its hull showing some signs of combat with the Covenant. The part that troubled Matt the most was the ship was a spitting duplicate of the Pillar of Autumn. Commander, Linda said, I've had a look with the scope, all of the escape pods are still in place and there are no signs of power. Matt looked at the cruiser and noticed the lack of running lights on the hull. We'll need to find another way in. Well, Commander, I've got good news for you, said Crystal. I've found a hull breach that has penetrated several decks into the ship so getting inside should be the easy part. What's the hard part? Matt asked. The pressure doors on a Halcyon-class cruiser are solid titanium A, said Crystal, it'll probably take all the explosives you have just to punch through. Matt had anticipated the need for explosives to blow through a couple of doors that they couldn't force open, but he didn't expect to blow through a pressure door. We'll just have to make do, said Matt as he hit the tpack and glided toward the breach, followed closely by Linda. When they got inside, the two Spartans ditched their tpacks and proceeded on foot through the corridor. They walked for several meters before running into the pressure door and immediately set to work. They set all their grenades down by the bottom and sprayed them with C-12 foaming explosive, followed by their debt packs. 
Matt and Linda retreated to the hull breach and set them off. There was a flash, but no shockwave and no sound, due to it being in a vacuum on both ends. When they returned to the breach they found a fairly small-sized hole in the bottom, but thankfully it was just wide enough to squeeze through. I'm not detecting any oxygen on the other side, said Crystal. That means life support is down across most of the ship. Matt squeezed under first followed by Linda. He helped her through as she tried to go in with her rifle in one hand. As they traversed the ship's dark corridors, Matt got deja vu, not because the corridors were identical to the autumns but because he remembered when he came through them last. With Linda and John. I won't let it happen again, Matt thought. I'd rather die than let Linda die again. Location Sector K-91, UNSC Dawn Under Heaven. October 16, 2552, 1000 hours. Matt and Linda reached the bridge, they had found several bodies of crew members as they scrambled for emergency ventilator packs, or trying to shut themselves inside rooms and create pressurized safe areas. This told Matt that it wasn't a hull breach that killed the crew but most likely the ship's rampant AI when they tried to destroy it. Matt walked over to the AI hollow tank and inserted crystal into the ship. Just like home, she remarked. The ship's AI was deleted, but not before it deactivated life support to all decks. It's safe to assume there are no survivors. I'm reactivating it in all non-breached sections. Just delete the NAV data, said Matt as there was a hiss, indicating fresh oxygen was being pumped in. The main computer is a mess, said Crystal, it's going to take some time. Can we speed this up? Linda asked. I'd rather not be here when the Covenant shows up. This ship took a direct hit from an energy projector, Crystal explained. It nearly gutted the ship and not to mention cutting a shaft through the computer core. The damage is too extensive and with no explosives to blow the debris out of the way. I get the point, said Linda. Look on the bright side, said Crystal. If the Covenant hasn't found the ship yet, then what are the odds? I think I spoke too soon. Matt and Linda looked out the viewport to see a Covenant cruiser emerge from slip space, it began launching numerous waves of seraphs, spirits and a type of dropship Matt wasn't familiar with. Crystal, what are those? He asked. Crystal brought up a radar silhouette on the main plotting board and rotated the view. According to my database on Covenant craft, they're nicknamed phantoms. This class of dropship has only been seen in a handful of engagements. They're approaching the airlocks. What do we have for armaments? Matt asked. An inventory appeared on the screen along with a munitions map of the ship. Max slugs and Shiva warheads have been depleted. There are three archer pods still full, but the targeting software has been deleted. The 50mm guns are down to 32% ammunition. I'll take them, said Matt. Fire. Commander, if we just start shooting then the Covenant cruiser will blow us to bits, Crystal pointed out. They're here because they got the distress call and know about the data, said Matt, they won't risk firing. Crystal nodded and a few seconds later the autocannons opened up on the dropships. It wasn't long before the seraphs began pounding the guns. Borders Crystal cried. One level up. I'll go, said Linda as she darted out of the bridge before Matt could object. Commander, I need you to assume manual control of one of our firing fields, I can't delete the data and fire every gun at the same time. Matt nodded and went over to the fire control station. Crystal brought up the targeting packet. Two joysticks popped up and external camera feeds were displayed on the screens. Matt sat down and began targeting the individual boarding craft as they came into his firing arc. The dropships attempted to get to the shuttle bays along the belly of the ship, but that's where the majority of the autocannons lay. Crystal was easily able to dispatch them. The ones Matt had trouble with were the Seraph fighters and their shields, they were able to make strafing runs against the guns and make it out of Matt's barrage intact. Commander, I've got elites and grunts moving in, veteran ones, Linda said over the comm. Fall back and find a choke point, Matt ordered. There was a crack over the comm followed by Linda's red acknowledgement light, and then a scream. Linda Matt screamed as he jumped out of the weapon station and ran for the corridor. Commander, what are you doing? Crystal cried Commander. Linda had just left the bridge and went over to one of the nearby access hatches, went inside, and scaled the closest ladder. She arrived one deck up and emerged into the main hall. There was an explosion from around the corner and Linda's HUD picked up several contacts coming at her. She ducked into a nearby hatch and leaned her head out in time to see a pair of black armored grunts and a single black armored elite step into the corridor. Commander, I've got elites and grunts moving in, veteran ones, Linda said into the comm. Fall back and find a choke point, Matt replied. Linda knew if she moved then the Covenant would spot her, 
so she did the only thing she could think of. Linda ran out into the corridor and fired on the elite, blowing his head out over the bulkhead. Surprisingly the grunts returned fire instead of running, and Linda found out why. At the end of the corridor were more elites and a few jackal snipers, and they opened fire. Linda took several direct hits from the jackals which drained her shields to a quarter charge, the audible alarm blared in her ears. Linda flashed her red status light and tried to make a beeline for the access hatch, but the elites hit her with their more powerful plasma rifles and her shields collapsed. One bolt struck her thigh and she cried out in pain as she collapsed into the access hatch, breaking it off its hinges and crashing into the small corridor. She ignored the pain in her leg and limped as fast as she could to the ladder, but her leg gave out and she stumbled down the ladder and to the deck below, landing in front of Matt. He helped her up and brought her back to the bridge. I've sealed the doors to the bridge, Crystal said, but they've already started burning through. Matt set her down against the wall and examined her. The leg the armor section of her upper thigh had been melted away and her burnt, blackened flesh stuck out. It doesn't look bad, Matt said. Linda didn't respond. Matt quickly removed her helmet and found her eyes shut, and a nasty gash on her forehead. Blood trickled from the wound and down the side of her face. She's just unconscious, Crystal said. It must have been the fall. Suddenly, the distant sound of the autocannons firing silenced, they had run out of ammo. We need to leave, now, Matt said to Crystal. But I haven't deleted the data, said Crystal. How long? At least twenty minutes. No good, we leave now, said Matt as he scooped Linda up into his arms. Prep one of the escape pods and set the self-destruct. Commander, I can't make critical mass in the reactor, said Crystal. We can't destroy the ship. Forget it then, Matt shot back. Just get the pod ready. Crystal complied and entered the necessary commands, then Matt put her back in his armor. He carried Linda out of the bridge in time to see the nearby pressure door turn red and succumb to the Covenant plasma barrage. Matt turned the other way and ran for the escape pod. His shields began to take hits from plasma pistols and needlers. He rounded the corner and made it to the escape pod, tossed Linda in, and turned back to see the elites round the corner. Matt unslung his MA-5B and opened fire on them. He punched through the shields of two of them, but the third got the upper hand and collapsed Matt's shields. Three needler shards embedded themselves in Matt's upper right arm and detonated. The sudden pain caused Matt's arm to go into a spasm and he lost his grip on the MA-5B. He ran for the escape hatch only to be struck in the back with a plasma pistol, twice. He ignored the pain and dove into the pod, slammed his fist into the release button, and held on as the pod rocketed away from the cruiser. They were a good distance clear and he could see the Covenant cruiser hovering over the dawn under heaven. Commander, I assume it's you in the pod. The captain's voice sounded over the comm. It's us, sir, Matt replied. We were overrun before the NAV database could be destroyed. Spartan 058 and myself are injured. Understood, Commander, we're going to plan B, you might want to hold on. Matt watched as five small suns erupted between the Covenant ship and the fallen cruiser. The pod was rocked about by the shockwave and when it finally settled, he looked out the viewport and saw nothing but red flaming debris. They were rescued a half hour later and Matt immediately brought Linda to the infirmary. He placed her on one of the beds and the med tech came over. Matt sat on the opposite one, his back and arm throbbing in pain. He finally looked over at his arm and saw most of the upper portion of his armor twisted and he could see the mangled tissue beneath. He tried to rotate his waist, but that only set more pain through his back. Commander, that's serious, one of the med techs pointed out. You better let us treat it. I'm fine, said Matt as he crossed the room and removed one of the medkits. She needs your help. Her injuries aren't as serious, the tech pointed out. Treat her first, Matt said as he left the infirmary, returned to his room, and started stripping the armor off. He braved the pain to take a look at his back. The skin was red and blistering from the heat, but it didn't look like the plasma got him. He slapped a burn bandage on the ones on his back and he turned his attention to his right arm. He carefully peeled off the shoulder plate and got a good look at the wound. A gash ran half the length of his bicep but didn't do a lot of internal damage. He filled it with biofoam, stitched it together, covered it with a bandage, and injected some nanites into his neck. He flexed the arm and a lance of pain shot up through his muscle, not as intense as before, he could live with it. Crystal appeared on the holopad and looked over Matt as he began removing the rest of his armor. It's probably fried, Crystal said pointing to the armor's power plant. Half of the bulky back section had been melted by the twin plasma bolts, the guts of the armor were showing, melted, and twisted wires. 
What was left of the shield generator was adhered to the reactor casing. It was safe to say that he would need a new Mark V. Yeah, you're probably right, Matt said. After stripping down he changed into a set of fatigues and collapsed on the bed. Crystal winked off the pad and Matt tried to get some sleep, but he had gotten used to falling asleep with Linda next to him. The warmth of her body against his. Matt realized that he jeopardized the mission for Linda back on the cruiser. His love for her was slowly consuming him. Linda awoke a few hours after they jumped to slip space, she was in her armor's undersuit and a bandage covered her left thigh. Her leg throbbed with pain as she snuck out of the infirmary and went back to their room. Matt was asleep on the bed when Linda entered, she noticed his damaged Mjolnir armor in one corner. He risked the mission for you, Crystal said as she materialized on the table, he was injured trying to get you into an escape pod. Is he okay? Linda asked. He's fine, Crystal replied. Just a couple of burns on his back and a laceration on his arm. You should still be in the infirmary. I'll live, Linda replied. I'm going to leave the two of you alone, Crystal said as she disappeared. Linda went over to the bed and sat down on it. She couldn't see his injuries through his shirt but judging from the state his armor was in, Linda assumed he wasn't better off. She reached out and gently stroked the side of his face, but she nearly jumped out of her skin when Matt grabbed her hand and looked at her. Both had less than stellar looks on their faces, after realizing what Matt had done to save her, she was starting to wonder if this relationship was worth it. Matt pulled her towards him and they both held each other close through the rest of the night. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 90 Husband and Wife Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 90 Husband and Wife Location Soul System, Planet Earth, Cairo Station October 18, 2552, 1,700 hours. Matt was in the infirmary, his arm immobilized by the muscle regenerator slowly sending its needles into Matt's arm to repair the damage the needlers had done. Linda was with him, having just returned from the burn center, her leg patched up nicely. When the machine was finished he looked down on his arm, only a pale scar was visible. The muscle was still a bit sore. Matt looked over at Linda, neither of them had talked since the mission. Commander, said one of the doctors as he came in, I've got your test results in. The muscle has healed nicely, but be sure to avoid anything strenuous for the next week. We don't want the bio stitches coming loose. Matt nodded and looked over at Linda. She was leaning against the wall, her arms crossed against her chest. Oh, and Lord had wanted to speak with you, Commander, the doctor added. He left the two Spartans alone in the room. Look, I'm glad you're okay, Linda said in a distant voice. Matt got a lump in his throat, unsure of what to say. I'll see you later, he finally said as he left the infirmary and rode one of the trams to the office complex. A pair of marines stood guard outside the office of Lordhood and Matt was forced to submit to a DNA sampling before being allowed to enter. The office was a fairly medium-sized one, at one end was a large window overlooking Earth. In front of it was a large oak desk, standing next to his chair was Lordhood, reading a file folder, and another one was tucked underneath it. Sir, reporting as ordered, Matt said as he snapped off a salute. At ease, Commander, Hood replied. Good job on the mission. Sir, with all due respect, we weren't able to achieve the objective, said Matt. I don't see how the mission was a good job. It's a figure of speech, Commander, Hood replied. You got your wounded Spartan off the ship. Not to mention entice those Covenant uglies to bring their ship closer to the cruiser so the Hornets could do their job. Thank you, sir, said Matt. Don't thank me yet, Spartan, said Hood as he turned his attention to the file folders. The doctors found something in your test results. Elevated hormone levels. He tossed the folder he was reading on the desk. Hormones that indicate you've had sexual intercourse fairly recently. His voice was beginning to boom as he tossed the second folder on the desk. You and Spartan 058. It doesn't take a genius to put two and two together. So how long has this been going on? Six days, sir, Matt replied. That concurs with the tests, said Hood. Commander, this relationship has to stop. Sir, I do not agree, Matt said. Lord Hood didn't lash back at him for disobeying a superior officer. Explain why not, he ordered. Sir, I love her. This isn't some game we're playing for fun, Matt explained. 
I know the UNSC allows married couples to stay together in some cases. All I ask is the same thing for us. Commander, I sympathize with you, said Hood, but you and Spartan 058 aren't married. I can't grant a special dispensation. What if we were to be, sir? Matt asked. Lord Hood sat down at his desk, removed his hat and ran a hand across his bald head. You really want her, Commander? Yes, sir, Matt said. This is certainly one of the strangest decisions I've ever had to make, said Hood. But if the two of you are going to stay together when you're getting hitched, I'll start the paperwork for a marriage license, and if you want I'll perform the ceremony. Sir, why are you being so lenient, let alone helping me? Matt asked. Because I owe the Spartans my life twice over and despite what some people think about you, I believe that you're human beings, like the rest of us. This whole situation just proves that. Now, Commander, you still need to tell her about this decision, not to mention get a couple of witnesses. When can we do this, sir? Matt asked. Tonight, if you can get everything in order, Hood replied. You're dismissed. You have a lot of work to do. Matt saluted Lord Hood and walked out of the office with a smile on his face. Say what? Jack said as Matt told him of his intentions. Jack was on board the station for the award ceremony in two days to commemorate Matt, the Master Chief, and Sergeant Johnson for their actions at Reach, Halo and in Operation First Strike. I'm asking for your daughter's hand in marriage, Matt said, and to help me with the preparations. I don't know anything about getting married. I never thought I'd help two Spartans get married, and one of them is my daughter, Jack said. You bet I'll be there. Just leave this to me, Matt. He sighed. Claire's not going to like this when she hears about this. She would want to be here. But I'm sure if she was here right now she'd agree with me that if there was anyone we would trust with our daughter, it's you. Matt inwardly breathed a sigh of relief. Jack was reacting very differently from how Matt thought he would. Matt expected Jack to threaten to castrate him for touching his daughter. Thank you, Jack. No problem but. Matt, do you even think she wants this? Jack asked. You haven't proposed yet and you're already making plans for the two of you to get hitched and she doesn't even know. I'm going to ask her now, said Matt. Could you just get everything going? Sure thing, Jack replied. I have a feeling she'll say yes. Matt didn't waste another second as he found out which room Linda had been assigned and went there at lightning speed. She was sitting on the bed cross-legged, meditating. Matt went over and shook her out of her trance. What's wrong? She asked. Lord had found out about us, Matt explained. He said we would have to end it. Linda was heartbroken. The only man she ever loved was being told he couldn't love her back, but Matt soon filled her with hope. Lord had managed to find a way for us to stay together. Matt said as he took both of Linda's hands in his, Marry me, Linda. Linda's jaw nearly dropped. Her insides twisted around. They had started this relationship a little under a week ago, and now Matt was proposing marriage. Matt noticed the look on her face and he let go of her hands. I understand, he said and prepared to leave. Yes, Linda muttered. Matt looked back at her. Linda's eyes were slowly tearing up. She leaped off the bed and into Matt's arms. Yes, I'll marry you, she said. Linda stood in her dress uniform a few hours later as the pelican she'd been expecting arrived. It was cycled through the airlock and landed on the platform in front of Linda. Okay, so what's the big emergency? Asked Baker as she emerged from the back of the pelican, and what's with the dress uniform? It's Matt, Linda said. He asked me to marry him. He did, what? Said Baker before the weight of what Linda had just told her started to set in. She hugged her right there on the spot. Congratulations, she said. When is the wedding? Right now, Linda replied. What? Baker said. No wonder she's in her dress uniform. That's why I asked you here, Linda explained. We need two witnesses and you're the second. After all, you did for me this seems like the best way to repay you. Linda, you don't have to repay me, Baker said. I was just doing my job, I'll still be your witness if you want. Thank you, doctor, Linda said. Allison, Baker corrected. Okay then, Allison, Linda said. Even though Cairo Station had a chapel, neither Spartan was religious so they elected to use one of the observation rooms instead. It was a roughly circular room with a large window overlooking Earth and the other ODPs, as well as a few ships of the home fleet. Matt stood anxiously in his dress uniform waiting for his fiancée of only a few hours to arrive. Relax, Matt, said Jack, also in his dress uniform. I doubt a Spartan can get cold feet. Matt looked around the room, aside from Jack, the only other person in the room was Lord Hood who was practicing his words. 
Matt was starting to get worried that Linda wouldn't show, but his heart did a backflip when Linda entered, accompanied by Baker. Well then, let's get this party started, said Jack. If you'll please, said Lord Hood as he stood in front of the window. Matt took Linda's hand and they stood in front of Hood, Jack next to Matt and Baker next to Linda. It has been the tradition in the Navy for a command-level officer to join two sailors in the bonds of matrimony, Hood started, and now we repeat this time-honored tradition as we come together to join this man and this woman in the bond of marriage. Does anyone have any objections as to why this union cannot be possible? No one spoke up. Very well then, Hood continued as Matt and Linda faced each other. Commander, do you take this woman to have and to care for so long as you both live? I do, Matt said. Petty officer, Hood said to Linda, do you take this man to have and to care for so long as you both live? I do, Linda said. Matt dug into his pocket and removed the two silver rings Jack had gotten for him. Let these rings be the symbol of your bond, Hood said as Matt slid one ring onto Linda's finger and Linda did the same for Matt's finger. By the power vested in me by the United Nations Space Command, I hereby pronounce you husband and wife, Hood declared. You may kiss the bride. Yes, sir, Matt replied happily as he snaked an arm around Linda's waist, pulled her close and kissed her. Baker, Jack, and Hood clapped. So where's the honeymoon at? Jack asked as he gave Matt a pat on the back. We were thinking somewhere close to home, Matt replied, even though they had no plans. Well here's to many happy years, Jack said as he lit a cigar and began smoking it. One more thing, what is it? Take care of my daughter or I will hurt you Spartan or not and trust me you won't like it. Matt snapped a salute. I will, he replied in a determined voice. Good to hear. Claire and I would very much appreciate it. Thank you again for letting me marry your daughter. You're welcome. Claire and I trust you more than anyone with her. Just remember what I said, Jack said as he returned Matt's salute. Matt walked over to Linda who had just finished talking to Baker and was standing by the window. It's too bad John, Fred, and Will couldn't be here, said Linda. I tried to get a hold of Fred and Will and Sungnam, but apparently they're involved in some classified project, said Matt. I tried to get John to come, but command has him doing some mission for them. I was also going to ask Maria to come, but the reserve activated her for something. This is still the best day of my life, Linda said. You want to make it even better? Matt asked. Linda looked at him with a smile on her face. My room or yours? She asked. Linda and Matt eventually ended up in her room. Both of them paused a moment to remove their dress uniforms but they didn't even get that done as Matt grabbed Linda in a kiss. Matt scooped Linda into his arms and laid his wife down on the bed. They got around to removing their underwear and they began their familiar dance. Linda had never been so happy in her life, she and the men she loved could remain together. Exhausted, she lay next to her husband, her hair was damp with sweat from their strenuous lovemaking. Where do we go from here? Matt asked. Now that we're married. Linda hadn't thought of that. What would happen if the Covenant recovered from their heavy losses at Reach and Operation First Strike and decided to finish off Earth? They would be sent off to fight, possibly separated. Let's not think about that, said Linda, but I do have an intermediate destination in mind. And where's that Matt asked in a teasing voice? Right here, Linda said as she kissed him. Linda moved on top of Matt and pressed her body against his. At this rate, we're never going to get any sleep, Matt said. Who said we would be sleeping tonight? Linda said as she covered her mouth over Matt's, preventing further protests, he wasn't planning to anyway. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 91 Separation Anxiety Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 91 Separation Anxiety Location Soul System, Cairo Station, Hood's Office, October 19, 2552, 0700 hours. Newlyweds Matt and Linda stood in Hood's office dressed in matching fatigues. Both of them only got a couple of hours of sleep after being otherwise preoccupied throughout the night. Lord Hood had called them both to his office first thing but didn't give an explanation as to why. At ease, Hood said to the two Spartans as he walked into his office, running late. He had one of those looks on his face like he was about to deliver some bad news. Commander, Linda's being reassigned by ONI to Songnam. You've been transferred here. Can I ask why sir? Matt asked. 
Oh and I knows the two of you are married, and apparently, there are certain safeguards in the Spartan program that I wasn't aware of. He passed a paper to Matt who picked it up and read it with Linda. ONI Directive 270 dated February 28, 25, pertaining to NAFSPEC WEP program codenamed Spartanii. The Spartan children have undergone significant mental training to suppress any emotions they might have in order to increase their combat effectiveness but one emotion takes. Priority above all others, love of the romantic variety. Since they were taken from a young age, the children have only a vague understanding of what love is but we cannot allow a single male or female Spartan to become attracted to a member of the opposite sex. In combat situations, we predict that a Spartan pair in love serving together in the same combat theater will risk the mission to save the other if their life should be in danger. Steps have been taken to ensure this doesn't happen. Primary measure A platinum pellet will be inserted into the Spartan's thyroids that contain human growth hormone catalyst. A simple modification will release a drug to suppress certain hormones preventing their sex drive from functioning. Although this has been proven certain in tests with chimpanzees we do expect a significant number of failures in those that survive. In that eventuality, a contingency was developed. Secondary measure if a Spartan becomes attracted to another Spartan of the opposite sex and this Spartan returns the attraction both must be separated immediately and not allowed to serve together in combat situations or otherwise. No interaction is to be allowed, correspondence included. A prolonged period of separation and possible therapy measurements would be taken until both Spartans have been absolved of these feelings. Only then could they be allowed to serve in combat situations. Matt threw the paper down in a fit of rage. Anger boiled inside him, against O and I and their damn regulations. Linda was equally as mad. Admiral, you have to do something, Linda asked, they can't get away with this. Believe me I'm disgusted by this as much as you, said Hood. You two are human beings and should be treated as such, not like programmable soldiers without feelings. I'm going to fight this but for now you two have to accept this. Sir, can't you overrule them? Matt asked. Not when it comes to O and I, Hood replied. NAFSPEC WEP is out of my jurisdiction, but I intend to launch an appeal ASAP. Sir, Matt and I. Are we still married? Linda asked. Your marriage is perfectly legal and ONI doesn't have authority to invalidate it, answered Hood. So yes, you're still married to your husband. Linda let out a brief sigh of relief. You ship out tomorrow at 0800, Hood said to Linda, and the award ceremony is also being held the same day, Commander. I suggest the two of you make the most of the time you have left. I don't know how long you'll be separated. I promise I'll get that order repealed. That's all I ask, sir, Matt replied. Matt and Linda had been assigned a larger room on Cairo Station, figuring they would be serving together on the station. It had a small living area and a private bedroom. Matt and Linda sat in the living area thinking about the decision. What if you don't get on that pelican tomorrow? Matt said. What's the worst they could do? That wouldn't work, Linda said. I can't just accept this, Matt said. Matt, I know this is going to sound a bit selfish, but I think we have to do this. Matt looked up at her, wondering why his wife would be in favor of their being separated. Matt, that report was right about conflicting feelings in a mission. What happened with the cruiser is proof. She stood up, sat on Matt's legs and wrapped her arms around his neck. Earth's at stake now, this is the future of our species at stake. Two married Spartans don't make the slightest difference in choosing not to save humanity. Deep down Matt knew she was right. Let's just make the most of the time we have, Linda said as she kissed him. She stood up and Matt followed suit, pulling her to him. Linda wrenched free and moved toward the bedroom. Come and get me, lover boy, Linda said as she removed her shirt. Location Soul System, Cairo Station, Matt and Linda's Quarters, October 20, 2552, 0600 hours. Linda sat on the side of the bed putting her bra back on and zipping up her pants. Matt still lay in bed, the sheets pulled up to his waist. It was still two hours before Linda had to leave. Stay, Matt said. You know I can't, Linda replied as she reached for her shirt, but Matt grabbed her arm and pulled her on top of him. We still have time, Matt said as Linda felt her bra taken off. She didn't protest as he slid her pants down followed by her underwear. Linda arched against his bare body as Matt began his thrusts. She moaned slightly as her stamina was drained. She broke away and lay next to him. Who would have thought that the shy redhead I knew would eventually be my wife, Matt said. I could say the same about you, Linda replied. A month ago I didn't think something like this would be possible. Now we're married.
Linda glanced at the clock then got up and gathered her clothes. She dressed and then returned to the bed, kissing Matt goodbye. Let's promise we'll see each other again, she said. You know I will, Matt said. Don't make a girl a promise if you know you can't keep it, said Linda. Matt pulled her close and cupped her face in his hands. I promise, Red. I will see you again. You better do the same. Linda pushed herself close to Matt until their foreheads were touching. I promise I'll see you again. Linda kissed him one more time before leaving for the hangar bay. She waited for ten minutes before her transport was called. Once on board the Pelican, she managed to convince the pilot to make a slight detour. Location Soul System, Planet Earth, Vandenberg Base, Baker's Office, October 20th, 2552, 0830 hours. Linda walked into Baker's office to find her packing things into a box. You're leaving? Linda asked. I was only here on temporary assignment, Baker said. ONI reprimanded me for not telling them about you and the commander. I've also been demoted to junior grade lieutenant for my actions. I'm sorry I got you into this, Linda said. Don't, Baker replied. ONI has no right to keep you two apart. She walked over to Linda and hugged her. Watch yourself out there. You too, Linda replied. Location Soul System, Planet Earth, Songnam Military Installation. October 20, 2552, 0900 hours. Linda arrived at the base and was surprised to not see Fred or will meet her at the landing pads. She was ushered into one of the sublevels of the base and entered a dark cavernous room. At one end a floodlight came on and displayed a suit of Mjolnir armor, but it was different from an MKV. Allow me to introduce you to the MK6, Fred said as he came up behind Linda. He was wearing one of the new sets of armor, as was Will when he emerged from the shadows. So this is the secret project you were assigned to, Linda said, testing this out. You should try it, said another familiar voice from behind Linda. She spun around to see Maria, without the armor on. They conned me into it, Maria joked. Come on, let's get you fitted, Fred said as he and Will went over to the new armor. Linda and Maria followed but Maria held Linda back a moment. Is that what I think it is on your finger? Maria asked. Oh, this, Linda said as she held up her hand and showed Maria the ring. He proposed. Maria almost yelled, assuming it was an engagement ring. Oh he did, Linda replied, but we're married already. It was a private ceremony at Cairo Station. Maria almost screamed but settled for a congratulations instead. Tell me all about it, Maria said as they went over to join Fred and Will. Location Soul System, Cairo Station, Armory, October 20, 2552, 1243 hours. Like the Master Chief over here, your plating was about to fail. There's viscosity throughout the gel layer, said the gunnery sergeant as he inspected was was left of Matt's MKV. He moved over to a table where the remains of several key components were scattered. He picked each of them up and showed them to Matt. Optics, totally fried. And let's not even talk about the power supply, the gunny said as Matt reached for his helmet. Do you know how expensive this gear is, son? Matt snapped the helmet for his new suit of Mjolnir MK6 armor on and said, like the Master Chief just said, tell that to the Covenant. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome.